Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for, for those of you who are here for the Iowa caucus, it's time to leave right now. We're not used to having this many people attend, and we welcome you. Uh, uh, first, some announcements. Item number three, uh, 60 Lockwood Road has been postponed. Elm Place, items number five and six have been withdrawn. Item number eight on rezoning has been postponed. And also item number nine. Uh, so we're opening with the public hearing and a couple of comments on the public hearing. We always welcome comments from the public and we certainly do so tonight. But I promised to be home by three in the morning, I want you to know. So what we, what we suggest is number one, uh, that if, do not repeat what somebody already said before you. And number two, uh, we limit the speaking to three minutes. My companion and fellow associate here has a very good watch and he will sell time when the three minutes are up. Is that okay with everybody? Now, uh, could I have a show of hands on who would like to speak tonight? Okay, thank you. Okay. The item before us tonight is neighbor to neighbor, applicant by consent of parish of Christ Church, record property owners, it's a preliminary site plan. And a comment on preliminary. We deal with preliminary plans and we deal with final plans. Final plans are legally sound and operative. Preliminary is our way of learning more about an application. So sometimes uh, we uh, we ask if we approve a preliminary, it has no legal standing. You just have to move to final. So this is a preliminary plan. And in no sense would this be legally operative tonight. What we hear is we've read uh, quite a bit of stuff and hear the public's comments, <clears throat> and then we will move to the next step in w making whatever changes we think are necessary. Am I clear on the difference between preliminary and final? Okay. One final comment as we get underway. By last count, <clears throat> we have received over 110 letters regarding this application. Some in support and some raised concerns over a number of issues drainage, neighborhood character, noise, traffic, and look and size of the proposed building. We've seen your letters and we wanna thank you for writing us and taking the time. And we have gone through them very thoroughly. Okay? Okay, now let's get started. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, my name is Brian Smith. I'm an attorney with Robinson and Cole. Uh, I am here, Ted O'Han, Ted, okay. Ted, o Ted can that work now? All right, uh, Ted O'Hanlon, who was here on December 8th, uh, has a family obligation and cannot be here tonight, so I am the lucky winner and I'm here. So, but I am very proud to represent neighbor to neighbor. Uh, we are here to respond to a number of uh, various issues that were raised at the December 8th, 2015 hearing and raised thereafter by both uh, the commission and various other parties. As the commission is well aware, Neighbor to Neighbor has made a series of changes to the site plan since December 8th. And these are designed to address the concerns of the commission, the staff, and of the adjacent neighbors. We have prepared a summary of the major changes. You have a detailed letter January, dated January 19th that you already have, but the summary is just a one-page document. 
that we're going to use as sort of a base so that you can follow along our presentation tonight. Thank you. Yeah, Ann Campbell is handing one to each of you, and she will also hand it to counsel for the, uh, the parties that are here. And what you're, we plan you're going to go through this. Yes, yes, we're going to go through this. And mm -hmm. to do that, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have three of our professional consultants who are going to quickly go through the changes and address concerns that the commission may have on any of the changes that, that we are discussing, uh, and also to uh, highlight you know, what the changes are. Uh, the, the consultants who you'll be hearing from tonight is Eric Rains, who you heard from last time, Peter, uh, Peter Finkbeiner, and Michael O'Rourke. Uh, and then finally, after we have had a chance to give you that presentation, uh, the uh, Reverend Lemler, of, the rector of Christ Church, will also be speaking concerning the application. And then we will conclude and uh, take questions or respond as appropriate if there's concerns raised by anyone else. So. Uh, with that, what I would like to do first is call, ask for Eric Rains to come and make the presentation because what he will address is uh, the concerns about screening, landscaping, and and address those issues. Eric? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for the record, Eric Rains, uh, landscape architect for the project. A last name R A I N S. I have along with me the drawings that were presented last time that have been revised to reflect the changes that I'll walk you through tonight for reference. Um, but I think it probably best effective to um, just walk through the, the exhibits themselves. Um, this is a plan, a rendered, a, a color rendered plan of of, of the site that um, that we had last time. It's been revised to respond to some of the comments that we had heard, <coughs> and, um, and and I don't have the list in order, so I might take it out of order of the of what you have, but um, but primarily we the the three big things that we uh, responded to, thank you, uh, were the lo is the um, the location of the building, uh, the idea that the dumpsters would um, would be problematic in their prior location. And then uh, finally, um, with the with the uh, snow loading or snow man management of the of the site, uh, how do we deal with that? Excuse me, can you hear? Well, no, no, we can't see. you better hold this closer. That's okay. I know. Uh, hold the microphone closer. Oh, hold it close. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, sorry. So in response to the location of the building, what we did was look at, um, at the fixed points on either side of the building, one of those being the carriage house. And we used the retaining wall that we'd proposed um, originally as the other fixed point and tried to look for space between those two points that would give us um, um, the opportunity to slide the building farther to the north. What we found was just to the south of the carriage house was a green strip that, uh, that existed before you, before you um, encountered the first edge of parking. And that's, that, that edge of parking has, has been moved closer to the carriage house by about five feet. Then we took the space between the opposite side of that parking, the, the, the south edge of that parking area, and the space between there and the face of the building, and we compressed that. So we picked up another uh, about five feet. So that gave us the ability to move the building 10 feet forward and still maintain the circulation that we need within this new parking area. On the opposite side, moving from south to north, we kept the, um, the, the retaining wall that I just mentioned. And rather than move the dry aisle a full 10 feet, we, we then looked at um, how to maybe create an area between the top of that retaining wall and the edge of our new driveway for snow storage, should there be any. And then we looked at the, on the opposite side of that parking area, the space between there and the building, and saw that there was an, about another five feet. So we were able to compress the parking, starting at the parking, moving it north by a total of about 10 feet, which gave us the ability to move the building. The dimensions that we added to the plan view reflect, uh, reflect that dimension. Can I ask you a question? The, um, the, how many trees are being removed 
uh, to accomplish this plan. And of the, of the trees that we're looking at, how many of them are existing trees? The trees, the, the, the quantity. How many are being cut down to, to accomplish this plan? There are four. Four. And that number does not change based on the original location of the building versus this location. Okay. The, the, on the plan, the trees that are symbolized in the larger green circles here and through here are all existing trees. The smaller green circles, which are in here and through here, are all proposed. Is there a row of trees on the um, south property line that is being maintained? I'm, I'm sorry, yes, that, that's right across here, right on the property edge. Those are white pines and they're being maintained. And they're in good shape? Yes, they are. There, there are the way, there's a zone, as the nature of those trees are, there's a zone below the existing branches that is a natural occurrence with that breed of tree. And it's that zone that we're addressing with our planting plan. And at the last hearing, the, the, to, to give better screening to the, to the parking area, the, the issue of a fence was raised. And I know that you've made a decision, I mean, at least you've, you've opined and, and you're going with landscaping. Do you believe that that is better uh, to create the separation between this new use and the existing uh, residences? I Sorry. <coughs> I thought I was. Roll over the mic. Do you want to repeat that? Oh, yeah. On the, on the matter of the fence on the south property line, uh, it was raised the last hearing whether that would be a good idea, bad idea. You've responded in writing that uh, you think the landscaping is a better idea, and I'd just like to get your thoughts about that. The, the fence <coughs> would be most beneficial if you were just on the other side of the fence. In my opinion, the, ve the vegetation that we're proposing um, at the initial planting and then, and then moving forward would provide a better visual separation between the two properties. What would be the approximate height of the, the, the sort of new planting uh, going in that area at planting? At planting, the mixture of, of, of trees and shrubs that we have uh, consists of evergreen trees that are 8 to 10 feet and then shrubs that are um, 30 to 36 inch feet, or 30, 36 inch, inch, 30 to 36 inches. We did a, f we had a, f have a photo simulation where we um, took that area, um, uh, maybe I should start with the one we looked at, I believe, at the last hearing, which is, um, which represents the area that you're mentioning. This is looking from the Tom Higgins property back toward Putnam Park. And you could see these, um, these trunks here, which are the existing trees that are being maintained. And that's the zone below the foliage, the canopy right. of the trees that we've identified. So this exhibit hasn't changed. So we were then able to meet um, representative from Putnam Park and take photographs from their property looking back toward um, the proposed neighbor to neighbor building. So again, the same tree trunks that you saw before. And then we imposed in between there the, uh, the proposed plant material. With that plant material, we assumed maybe a two or three year growth. So, so there's, it's, not, it, it's not full grown and it's not brand new. So that w that photo there, a photo simulation, is representing what year? Three years out. About two, 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 two or three years. years out. Yeah. So we then took the proposed building and put it behind, so that we combined the proposed building with proposed planting on top of existing trees. We drew this white line to represent uh, finished grade at the building, and then we drew this line across the top, which is the the peak of the cupola that's on top of the building. So what are the heights in year three of the new plants and new trees? The, the, the heights of the this plant material? This simulation you just said is in three years. So what would be the height that they're going in at eight to 10 feet? What does that represent? Is that 12 to 15 or 16 to 18? Probably 12-ish. I mean, plant material when it's new um, has to adapt to the new space and you, you can't you can't really clock it and know exactly how big it's going to be. It'll, it has to 
it's an it's a living thing, so it has to it has to um, establish itself. So if this is uh, going in at eight to ten, I would think it's safe to say it's more like twelve or thirteen. And that's and that's what this represents twelve yes. feet. Yes. One. So so with that. Before you remove that, there's one last question. <clears throat> In, in the matter of sound, would a fence be more of a sound barrier or is the landscaping going to be more of a sound barrier? Try. The, uh, we've addressed sound um, in another, in the next uh, point that I'll raise, uh, we, to, to, but I, I think they would probably both accomplish about the same. Um, sound travels, as you know, in all directions. The fence, if it, if it were to occur, <coughs> is a six foot fence. Um, this material is larger. Uh, two things about sound is one: one is that if you if a, if if you don't see the source, it, it appears quieter, and I think this would help with that theory. Um, and then below, beyond that, again, if the fence it's like it's like a wind barrier. If you a wind barrier is most effective when you're right behind it. So if there were a fence and you happen to be immediately behind it, then perhaps that would help with some sound, but again, sound comes from all directions. What about, how, what percentage of this is deciduous versus <coughs> not? What would the winter scape be like? The, um... Because that was a concern you raised yesterday. Hmm. The plant material that's in, that's in that area Because one of the things that was in your proposal was that you not do the under canopy planting if you did a fence. And what we were wondering as we went through the material, would that mean that winter and summer there would be good screening, to accomplish good screening both winter and summer, so that the deciduous issue doesn't affect the neighbors? The there are, it's a mixture of evergreen and deciduous material that's in here. Okay. Keeping in mind also that when it is, when the, when the deciduous material is without leaves, you still have the structure of the plant that, yeah. you know, that but provides some separation. So it's hard to project or predict yeah. how much that's going to be. In some instances, like here, for example, the proposed plant material is, if you divided it into rows, there's one, two, there's about four different rows of plant material. So you would be looking through the structure of four different, four different rows. Okay. So it's hard to say. It's a different condition here. Mm -hmm. um, but if the, the evergreen material that's, that's on the plant list that's proposed is material that's intended to grow taller than a shrub. Um, it is, it's, a white, um, it's a white spruce, I mean white cedar, sorry which is a native plant that's intended to be used in areas where you're anticipating it more naturalizing, which is what this is. How closely do, um, are the uh, evergreens planted? They are, they're, uh, they, they vary. These two over here, for example, are closer. They're probably about eight feet apart. Then you go to the next one, it's more like 10. And then over to here is more like 12 or 15. So it varies. The, the objective behind the, not only the plant palette, but the location of the material is that it appear sort of as a natural occurrence. So we didn't want to space anything similar to the way the, the, um, the white pines are. We didn't want to have anything with that regimented of a layout. Right. Mr. Raines, does that include the existing evergreens? Are those that spacing or is that all new plant material? New plant material. So um, if, if I can move on to that. Um, <clears throat> another modification to the plan is the, uh, we, we, with, once we compress the, the, uh, the area between the carriage house and the retaining wall, is that we were able to relocate the dumpsters so that they would be between the existing carriage house and the proposed building. Previously, they were in this vicinity. Mm -hmm. So by having them there, we, we take advantage of a couple of things. One is that it gets it farther away from the location where they were, but it also nestles it under the existing trees that are there. So it, um, it helps it blend in um, to a great extent, um, even though we've put it you know, sort of in our, in our front door. And then the third thing I mentioned, which is the, one of the questions that was raised is about snow management. 
Um, this zone here, just south of the proposed parking edge, is a grass paver strip that would that would be, um, it, should there be the need to store anything, it could happen along there. Grass pavers will allow, as the snow melts, it would, it would allow it to, um, to percolate uh, back into the ground. So with, excuse me, with this plan, we are, the, the, we took the corner the, the, the proposed building has two porches on, on either side. So from the southernmost corner, we're currently 81.9 feet from the property line. Parking, which is the, the, far, the closest point of parking to the property line is 45 feet. And then from the, from the opposite side, which is more of the middle of the building, we took a dimension over to Putnam Hill, the first building, which is 185 feet. And then to the second building, it's 295 feet. What is that building on Putnam Hill? You have no measurements? This one? The superintendent's building for, for Putnam Hill. It's a residence then? It's a residence, yes. Sorry. Thank you. We'll talk louder too. Thank you. So with that, um, another, some other information that was added to this drawing is that the, um, we've shown the air conditioning units on the, um, on the edge of the building here. We've added a dimension and a decibel reading from that dimension. And then um, similarly for, um, I'm sorry, but that, so yes, yeah, so we added that dimension. Could you just identify that number for, for the record? At 60 feet away, uh, the decibel level is anticipated to be 43.9 feet. I mean, 43.9 decibels. And you did not approximate the decibel rating at the property line? I did not, because at the property line, uh, the decibel level can be as, it drops, it drops as you move away. So we, we used a dimension that was available in the literature of the, of the, of the equipment. Can you, um, an emergency generator during its uh, cycling has to meet the 55 during the day? Yes. According to this noise regulation, a generator when it's running an emergency situation is exempt from the noise regulation, but during the cycling runtime, it's subject to the 55 decibels. And that's the way it's been through this commission for every project that I've been on. Um, the, good evening. My name is Ann Campbell. I'm a, a land use analyst with Robinson and Cole um, and a certified planner. Uh, what Mr. Fox is asking about is how does the noise ordinance for the town um, address uh, both the running of an emergency generator and also what he's referring to as the cycling, which means that um, each week you need to prime that system in order to make sure that it is still operating properly. Section 6 uh, large B-8, which talks about special exemptions from the town's noise, noise ordinance, which, by the way, um, in a residential zone, which is where uh, the neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor Christchurch property is located, uh, which is an R20 zone, and also uh, the neighboring Putnam Park and Putnam Hill and one Millbank properties are also residentially zoned. The uh, daytime uh, noise emission level, as measured at the property line, is 55 decibels. During the evening or nighttime hours, which is specifically defined in that noise ordinance, is 45 decibels. Uh, under special exemptions in the town code, it says in subparagraph A, sound created by emergency activities as authorized by the proper authorities 
or emergency vehicles, sounds giving warning of emergencies, or sounds customarily signaling particular times of day. Noise generated by necessary equipment in emergency activities that is used during an emergency includes the reasonable testing of such equipment during non-emergencies. All noise generated by necessary emergency equipment during non-emergency testing to ensure proper operation during an emergency must be tested between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. weekdays, Monday through Friday only. So it is understood that you do need to test these things, that they are, uh, the testing must occur during the week between the hours of um, 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. and that that, that uh, sound level is also exempt from the town's noise ordinance. That's not the way the commission has rendered on other applications. I, uh, and we have a, and a professional disagreement. <laughs> well, I'm just saying at Greenwich Country Day, part of our final site plan approval was to measure the level of the generator during cycling at the property line. Uh, this um, this noise ordinance was um, amended on um, see, February 3rd, 2012, so almost four years ago. I, I'm sorry, I don't recall when uh, Grange Country Day School uh, went through its approval, um, and I just ask you to consider, and maybe you could, um, you know, refresh yourself on the town noise ordinance um, when you're dealing with this particular uh, item as you consider the application. Uh, thank you. Ms. Campbell? What's what's the reason for the generator? Um, it's an emergency generator that's 30 kilowatts, which I know um, Mr. Macri would be familiar with being an architect. Um, it is specifically um, for, uh, in case of a power outage, to run the refrigeration units so we don't lose the uh, produce and also the, um, the perishable meats that are kept in the refrigeration units. But it's not it. powering the life safety or emergency lights or anything. Inside. I would imagine that it would also power the emergency um, safety systems if they're not on battery packs, uh, and that's something that we can uh, certainly um, elaborate on at time of final site plan or as part of the construction documents that are reviewed by staff. What's the fuel source? Uh, natural gas, I believe. There is natural gas in the street. To my understanding, actually, if it's a, going to be part of the um, life safety issues in the building, it should be a diesel because natural gas is, is not considered a reliable source of fuel. Uh, you can check on that, please, too. We certainly will. Thank you. Um, just quickly, just so you're aware of them, we, um, we generated uh, a, a um, few other drawings that you might be interested in. Uh, this one is the west elevation, so this is looking from the uh, say, from the uh, Tom Higgins house itself back toward the building. You'll see the larger plant material is the um, is the existing material, and again the evergreens that are on the property line. We imposed the um, the Putnam Park building, which is a two-story uh, building here, so that you can see the relationship of 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 particularly um, this building. To, um, to our proposed building. It's on back, sorry. Mr. Raines? Yes. Can everybody hear me okay? All right, okay. Mr. Raines, could you go back to the proposed landscaping a second? Yes. To the west I believe it yes to the west of the f the one that you just put up that's that's good to the west of the front proposed parking there are several trees in here yes I, I visited the site the, the the last time and I didn't go walk this today could you tell me about those trees and whether it would have been possible to extend 
that front proposed parking to the west so that there's less parking required to the rear of the building? Yes. There are, <clears throat> there are two types of trees along that edge. One is, um, is a, a, a smaller evergreen. It's a holly. Right. Um, it exists behind a fence that comes off the corner of the existing carriage house and extends south. The fence extends south today. Okay. Behind that fence on this end of it are the hollies that I mentioned. The larger circles that are here are the existing much larger trees that are on the property. 28 to 32 inch caliber? Of They're big, yeah. yes, yes. Okay. Um, and actually we had to, we're, we're already at a, at a proximity to one of them that relocating the dumpsters where we've put them, it actually straddles one of them. So we couldn't, we can't really go any farther that direction without with, losing those without, trees. Without without impacting those trees. Okay, and they are what kind of evergreens? There are two types. One is an ever, uh, one's an evergreen, and the other is a, is a, um, a cypress, which is a, which is not an evergreen. Um, and the evergreen is a um, it's a type of cedar. Okay, age approximately. Old. Sixty eighty. <laughs> I would imagine. Okay. okay. <clears throat> What's next? Um, that's all for me. Thank you. <clears throat> Before you leave, I have yes. a question. Um, uh, the large evergreens that are along the border at the back, um, yes. am I correct that they're going to continue to lose lower branches? Isn't that the normal? They, they could possibly. Um, my, my suspicion is that, that at, at the age that they are, and I'm not an arborist, so I, I can't speak exactly, but my, my hunch is that because of, their, of the age that they are, they're not growing at the rate that they were. So, so the, um, I suspect that the thinning of the lower branches has tapered to the point where, where it would barely be noticeable. This is a pine, right? It is a white pine. So I have one on the border of my property, and I would say annually a major branch falls off naturally. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's now a very tall, uh, very beautiful at the top, but not very beautiful. <laughs> that's what happens to these trees. No, well, that's exactly what, what concerns me. And the, so that that's a very healthy tree, but um, it's my impression after 10 years that there's kind of a method to it. It drops a big branch, and there seem to be largely lower branches. And so you end up with a tree where the foliage is very high. That That is the growth <coughs> pattern of these right. trees. And right. um, I... Again, I'm not an arborist, but from uh, from being there and taking the photographs that we've taken, yep. um, I didn't notice lower branches that look to be declining. No, no, um, it's not. They, but they break off. Right. I mean, can, I don't think it's in a, a situation of lack of health. It's right. just the pattern of... They're susceptible to several things, um, and just as any tree is, it, particularly in the winter months, if one, the lower branches tend to be the longer branches. Yep. Um, exactly. Those oftentimes, if there's a snow, a rain turns to snow, turns to ice, and builds up on the branches, and then the, just the right wind comes, um, then not only the tr the branch, but the whole tree could be susceptible. Right. They're brittle. So you can't protect, you right. can't predict it, and so you know. from the from the point of view of the neighbors on the south, wouldn't a wouldn't a fence be a more assured um, method of blocking a great deal of what they would be looking at otherwise? If you're less than six feet tall, yes. Well, they're below. They're down. Aren't they down a few feet? So yes. They're From the finished floor of our building, they are. Um, so they're looking up at an angle. <clears throat> Pardon me. The first thing they're, they would be seeing is parking um, and the movement of vehicles. Um, I think that I think what the the what neighbor to neighbor has ha, has said is that if the fence is preferable, they'll they'll That's do the fence. Right. Um, so well, I, I guess we could hear from the from the neighbors. Yes. That. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Chairman Heller, members of the commission, the our next. Uh, person who will be speaking will be Peter Finkbeiner, who's going to address the drainage issues that I know have been raised. So we're going to have those addressed. So Peter, it's all yours. If anybody is really hating standing, there are four seats up here in the first row. No? Just saying. <laughs> Thank you. 
Great. Very good. I'll try to describe it to you. Good evening. Uh, Pete Finkbeiner. I'm a drainage engineer with Soundview. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, F-I-N-K-B-E-I-N-E-R, Finkbeiner. The, uh, the drainage here is actually fairly simple to explain, and there's a lot of people have been talking about uh, drainage that has uh, confused the issue. So uh, let me start with the, uh, the big picture. Uh, this is a map of uh, both church properties. So Tombs Higgins House is here, and the Tombs Higgins House is uh, outlined in pink, and our project is, is right in this corner. Uh, and then there's the church property, and beyond the church is a lot of parking in the synagogue. So there are three different watersheds here, which is, which is where the confusion lies. So what's referred to as the west half of the Tombs Higgins property uh, uh, drains to the southwest corner. So somewhere in the front yard, there's a ridge that starts, and the drainage goes east, the drainage goes west. And this comes down between the two buildings off-site. But basically, you have east flowing and west flowing, and there's a collection point at the southwest corner, and it's a real problem, and it has nothing at all to do with this project. So all talk of storm manholes and the pictures of the catch basins, that's all down here in the southwest corner, which has nothing to do with the project. We aren't adding a drop of water to it. We're a completely different water watershed area. Um, and then there's there's basically our half of the the, the eastern half of the Tombs Higgins uh, drains to this uh, southeast corner, and I will uh, return to that for for more comment. Uh, and then there's the church property, and the church property uh, tends to drain uh, southeasterly, and it's it's piped off the property where it hits. Uh, Putnam Hill down here. So this piped system taking care of all of this uh, has no flooding problems. All the flooding problems are over here. What our site has, uh, Scott Marucci asked me to study it much more carefully, so we, we did additional field work and I uh, in inspected the off-site structures and understood the drainage. Uh, basically there are two retention ponds out there. There's a berm that was built a long time ago. And water I'm good. Hang on. Hang on. Uh, these are pictures that have been circulating for a month now. Um, there is a water accumulation in our southeast corner where our project is going. Uh, some people call these floodwaters. I call them two retention ponds because that's how they function. Now, a while back, the, the, the church built this berm, which is this L-shaped piece of grass in an attempt to hold back some of the water. And it's very inefficient and works very poorly and there's actually much more water that accumulates below the berm than above the berm. One interesting point says the water above the berm is the same elevation as the water below the berm, which leads me to suspect that the uh, berm is pretty permeable, and it just balances out. Generally, it stays on the property with no overflow. With the analysis that Scott Marucci put me through, and, and we did the uh, topography on the adjoining land with, our, again, their cooperation, uh, we modeled this and found out that there's, there's, there's basically a serious overflow under existing conditions for the five-year storm and the 10-year storm. Now, those are awfully hard storms to meet the standards of. That's how Scott set them up. So this isn't even a five-year storm because it's not overtopping the berm. Another interesting point out here is that the, the top of the berm is exactly the same elevation as the overflow into the condominiums. So the fact that the berm is showing here means that the water is still within the property and not overflowing. Does it overflow? I, I presume it has rarely. Uh, certainly Hurricane Irene six years ago, I would have expected there to be some overflow through both condominiums. Um, 
and that nobody was there to see it because it would have been in the height of the storm. Um, let's talk about that overflow path. Um, Mr. Mr. Fox, last month you asked me, uh, asked me a question about the overflow. Um, and I uh, answered you poorly. So I'm going to try to make up for that now that I know much more about this. So this is the, uh, the Tombs Higgins property with a proposal with um, the Putnam Park here and Putnam Hill here. And this is the southeast corner where all the water accumulates. And this blue here is the berm that was built. And we're going we're gonna to sit on top of that. So the, the, the upper berm floods, the lower berm floods, and then it flows over the very corner of Putnam Park and it hits the sidewalk there and gets diverted into the asphalt parking lot and immediately flows into a storm drain right there. So when that overflow occurs, there's no damage. I'm not sure anybody's actually seen it. I'm not sure it's ever actually occurred, but it's, it's a nasty storm they make me design for and in the, that storm under existing conditions, it overflows. Uh, overflow on the on the ten year storm existing the overflow is three cfs three cfs is uh, quite a hunk of water flowing by every second another proposal that goes to zero so we are putting in a massive storm storage system that takes care of uh, this proposal and the water that flows down to this corner of the tombs Higgins property so Scott Marucci and I are are pretty much on the same page. He's still asking for additional details, uh, new information, uh, but I can iron that out. And um, he's um, I'm already agreed that we're, I, I believe, ready for uh, preliminary approval. Could you? So the drainage is all set, basically. But if you had permission from the neighbor, wouldn't a better solution be to pipe that overflow directly to that catch basin so it doesn't have to run over the property? No, I know there's there, there's no suitable structure to pipe to uh, that that basin I referred to in the asphalt very close by um, is is not a large storm catch basin for draining a lot of surface water. So it is it is basically a footing other? drain system that we should not be putting a lot of overland flow into directly. Uh, Mr. Finkbeiner, that's the one that's actually in the driveway. That's a uh, uh, yes, round, yes. round top. Uh, yes, the the grate. All if, if there's ever an overflow, it goes into that grate. It's it's a very deep ma uh, a catch basin. Uh, it does take a little bit of asphalt, very small. Uh, it's very deep. It's very small bore pipe. It, it's got to be a gravity footing drain. Uh, I was there, when I was there today. It actually had running water in it, so it's actually yeah a little, a little bit down in the bottom. But the pipe's only. I'm guessing a six inch pipe, eight inch pipe at best. So it, it's, it's not a full drainage system pipe, I would say to you. No, I wasn't suggesting that. I'm just suggesting because as you can see, there's a lot of interest in the drainage on this property and adding a 10 foot piece of pipe so there's no evidence of overflow might help eliminate some of the anxiety over the, your drainage plan. Well, I, I understand your point, but there's no evidence of overflow and we're going to make it a lot better. So the, uh, I, 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 the, the promise is the, uh, the floodwaters are going to go away. <coughs> the floodwaters that accumulate in those two retention ponds aren't going to be there next time. That, 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 that's the simple result of the drainage engineering that Scott Marucci has asked me to do. You're referring to the two retention ponds in the southeast corner, not the yes, southeast sir. and southwest. The southwest is Nothing to do with the it. southwest. Okay, so there's two ponds. Uh, uh, yes, sir. They're, they're stacked on top of each other. There's a berm. The berm holds back the upper pond. <coughs> and the water gets below the pond, and there's a huge pond below the berm. <coughs> So it, 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 it's, it's double, it's piggybacked. The, the, the berm is less effective than it was supposed to be. The, 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 the berm actually harms it because it takes up volume that if you remove the berm, there's more volume to store water and the water level goes down. Why don't you tell us what you're gonna do? 
Maybe that, that, well, okay. we're, we're, we're going to leave that whole lower area exactly the same. You're not removing we're plant the berms? It. Pardon? You're leaving the berms? We're leaving the berms, except we're ending up, we're building on top of most of the upper berm. So we're taking away storage, which Scott Marucci makes me build into the storage system we have up above. But I'm, 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 we're, we're leaving the topography the same in, in, in that low area. We're adding a, a lot of vegetation to it. It would be interesting if, if you would, can you map or can you draw the line then? Because it gets a little confusing between the berm and now the new retaining wall going in to, to uh, support the uh, parking. And how does that interact with that berm? Well, they overlap uh, significantly. So, so the blue is the berm. And the, uh, the, the wall begins up here and it goes a slight diagonal and then wraps around so that the, uh, a portion of the upper berm will remain. Most of the lower ponding will remain. And the prediction is that both will be relatively dry, not, not flooded like we're seeing under existing conditions. I'm just sort of curious, what keeps it on the property? What keeps uh, it on the property? <laughs> Let me, let, me, let me give you a more of an overview. Um, drainage law in Connecticut says the downslope people have to accept the drainage from the upslope people and safely pass it through their property. This is the first time in Greenwich I've ever seen, truthfully, the first time in my career I've ever seen where a dam has been created and the condominium project when it was built prohibited the church from draining onto it two different places, the southwest corner and the southeast corner. Now, historically, that, that's the historical pattern, so I have to live with it, and we have to intercept all the drainage and not, not let it run off. I mean, I'm allowed what currently overflows, but we aren't going to reach those levels. See, but Mr. when rain... Mr. Finkbeiner, either... <clears throat> okay, you thank you. When, when rain falls on this piece of property, it's the condominium's responsibility by drainage law in Connecticut to let that water pass out to the Atlantic Ocean. They can't create a dam, but they did. And the church went along with it. And so now the existing situation is there's basically no overflow in the southeast corner. So we're going to mimic that. We're going to make it better. We're going to take the existing conditions and make them better for drainage. Mr. Pinkbender, can you describe what specifically it is you are going to do by way in a, without it being a 15 minute narrative, what exactly is going to be constructed uh, the way you do in a, a summary, drainage summary? Yes. The, the drainage structure that's being employed here for storage yes. is a stone bed under the uh, uh, driveway. Okay. So um, um, much of the new drainage manual is, is pushing towards the green solutions yep. and very much in favor of porous asphalt, and this whole thing is porous asphalt. Right. So for all of the new asphalt down, yes. it's, it's uh, open asphalt that lets rain through and it enters a stone bed underneath, which is a minimum of 30 inches deep, I'm up to. And that's storage, very similar to a Coltec system. Yes, yes, but then what happens when it fills up? I mean, doesn't it over Well, then, then, then we are beyond the storms that, that require analysis here. No, I mean over So time. for the 10-year storm, I, I, have zero, I have zero overflow. And, and Mr. Fox asked me last month where the overflow was, and I, I should answer that better. Yes. <laughs> Um, all of the existing water comes to the corner of the property, overflows Putnam Park onto Putnam Hill and goes into a hole in the ground and disappears. If, if this uh, parking lot system ever fills up and overflows, it will overflow at the corner of the retaining wall and flow into the upper retention area and flow into the retention area and follow the same path after that, overflowing. But Should never happen. But that, that's the path of the overflow. Uh, you, you always have to, have to ask what happens in case of failure. 
mean, if, if disaster comes, that's the path of the overflow. It, it comes off this corner of the property and, and follows uh, the way it always has. You'll create a way. And historically, there should be a drainage path there yeah. for all of the water that comes off the church. So, so at that corner, you'll create a weir? To yes, I, I, I claim a weir that's 15 feet long. Okay. It, it's in the uh, uh, drainage analysis. Uh, Mr. Finkbeiner, the, the lower retention pond um, at the property line, what, what holds that water back now? Yeah, well, it, it, it's, okay. a, it, it's a dam. The, the, the condominium project was built higher than the grade of that meadow, uh, uh, two feet. So at the property so line, there's, a there's depression another, there's on, a, on the church's land. So at the property line, there's, a, you, uh, there's something a little bit higher, and that's where yes. it's pulling. Yes, uh, a foot and a half, two feet higher. Um, with all the landscaping that's being proposed in the construction area, is that still going to remain that way? Uh, yeah, yes. We're, we're going to leave the grades where they are. We're going to put in more vegetation. Okay. Okay. Here's, here, here, here's a good picture. I, 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 I presume you've seen it before. This is on the condominium land looking across the two retention ponds. So you have upper and lower retention pond right here. And the, the, the water is on the church land, but the, the interesting point is uh, there's no water at all on the condominium land. So nobody's harmed by any of that, uh, any of that flood water they fear rising, because it all safely leaks off at the corner, goes down a drain, and it's gone. Uh, no, no, nobody's had their patios flooded. And excuse me, when you're talking about the condominium land, you're referring to land. Putnam Hill, for the record. Uh, Putnam, uh, that's Putnam Park right there. Putnam Park. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I, I referred to it poorly. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, one, one more question. Uh, at the beginning of the presentation. Excuse, Excuse me. me. We we can we can only have one speaker. Ex we can only have one speaker at a time. So the chairman will will call everybody up in due course. At the beginning of the presentation, you said that we had a, there was a ridge down the center of the property, the uh, under asphalt uh, uh, structures. That's going to take up all of the. All of the drainage for the whole site into that corner. The way it I'm, 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 I'm sorry. Um, I, I believe you misunderstood. A ridge down the middle of the property is a drainage divide. Yes. So, uh, flow goes east and flow goes west. Right. I uh, do believe that. Okay. And you're collect, collecting up the west flow. East. East flow. Excuse me. There you go. And uh, so everything on the the east side of that ridge that goes down the center is being collected in the stru new structures under the. Well, I'm I'm still having that discussion with Scott Marucci. Uh, all of the area uh, topography maps show that um, uh, probably a quarter of the front yard uh, drains onto the cemetery. And I made that assumption in my last analysis, and he's questioning me further for more evidence that what I'm presenting to him um, uh, actually actually happens. Okay. His questions also they relate to the fact that there's a wall there. Yes, the, the wall, and, and the response is the wall is so low, it's already in the sw uh, swale into the cemetery. Once it hits the wall, it, it, it's too far gone to switch routes. The, the, the wall he's questioning is below the divide for this runoff going on to the cemetery. It, 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 it's right near the carriage house is, is, is where it occurs. Uh, I'll show you a topo map if, if you oh, no, want to see it directly. It. I've got one in front of me. I, and, okay. But it seems to me that a certain a, amount of the, land, of the drainage, which you would normally assume would go to the cemetery, is that not blocked by this wall? No, it's an open, uh, open stone wall. There's nothing solid about it. There's nothing waterproof about it at all. Well, Mr. Murray, it's just a big old stone wall. Okay. I, he wants me to provide further evidence to convince him that I did it properly. Okay. And, and if I didn't, there are adjustments to be made. I mean, worst case scenario, I have to add six more inches of stone to the uh, storage. Mr. Finkbeiner, when I asked you before which condominium you were referring to, you said Putnam Park, but I think you mean Putnam Hill. Am I wrong there? Putnam Hill is down here. Putnam yeah. Park is where our drainage goes through. But then it, it per that green Onto line Putnam right Hill. there. Okay. Under, yes, okay. it ends up on Putnam Hill okay. after okay. doing a corner so, of Putnam Park. And so the, the catch basin right that you were talking about, those footing drains and what have you, those are on the Putnam Hill property, right? Yes, in the asphalt. Thank you. Thank you. Just for the record. Yes. We'll cover that. 
Okay. Mr. Fickbeiner, are you? I'll, I'll be happy to repeat. We're taking a 10-year storm of, of significant flow and, and reducing it to zero in terms of drainage. So uh, the... Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Simply put. <clears throat> Thank you, Peter. Uh, next, I would like to uh, offer for your consideration, Mr. O'Rourke is going to talk about parking and and those issues that have been okay. raised since on December 8th and since then. So, Michael. So, raised, what, what issues? I'm sorry? Traffic. Oh, traffic. 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 Can't hear the back. Okay, we'll get them to. All right. Take the microphone in hand, would you? Certainly. Maybe Don could turn the volume up. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. My name is Michael O'Rourke, O apostrophe, capital R, O U R K E. I'm with Adler Consulting. We're traffic and transportation engineers. Um, at the December hearing, there were some questions raised by the Commission, members of the Commission and staff. Uh, to answer those questions, Adler Consulting prepared and submitted a supplemental traffic and parking study which was reviewed by staff and your traffic consultants. They produced a memorandum which raised uh, a couple of questions that still had to be answered. And they also told us that we had answered most of the questions that they had been raised, that had been raised. The two items that remained uh, based on their review was the, uh, the site distance for the existing driveway. And as the traffic and town traffic consultant pointed out, they, the driveway, the available site distance from that driveway, which is not being modified at all, meets the requirements of the, let me, if I may, the Connecticut Department of Transportation Highway Design Guide for Route 1, which is, of course, a, a state road. The other issue that was raised by the traffic consultant regarded, uh, considered, considered the trucks leaving the loading dock area. Uh, they were under the impression that the, the trucks leaving that site would actually run over a curb. Actually, as Mr. Raines has pointed out before, there is a five foot wide snow shelf at the back end of the parking area. And that's the area that would be used on occasion by the, uh, a truck leaving the loading dock area. The truck and the overhang would not uh, have an impact with the, the curb. It would just simply run over that open area that is Mr. Raines previously described. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I would uh, now like to uh, ask that uh, Reverend Lemler, the rector of uh, Christ Church, I uh, can come in and uh, give us his thoughts on on the use here. Thank you very much. That's L E M L E R. Mr. Chair and uh, fellow commissioners, it's a privilege to be here before you this evening, and uh, I am the Reverend Jim Lemler, the rector of Christ Church here in Greenwich, and I stand to affirm uh, both the work and the mission of neighbor to neighbor in our town and the importance of the building of this particular facility in this particular place at this particular time on property owned by Christ Church. In December, you had a chance to hear from my colleague, the Reverend Jennifer Owen, who also affirmed support for this project, and especially for the long-standing relationship between neighbor to neighbor and Christ Church, the alignment of mission and the necessity, the sheer necessity of new and adequate facility space for this work. All of those things remain true, and I believe the support and case for this building continue to flourish with an ever greater intensity. 
The name neighbor to neighbor is appropriate for this organization, and I believe at least, for the dynamics of this building and its construction because, and I'm not going to talk as if I could about drainage or other such things or landscaping, although I love trees, um, but I want to talk about what it is to be a neighbor because I believe from my perspective the question is about neighbors. It is about the hundreds of neighbors who support, sustain, and volunteer at Neighbor to Neighbor. They clearly understand the essential nature of this offering for citizens who are at risk in terms of the necessities of life, of food, of clothing, and that finally, after 40 years, there will be a facility commensurate with that need a facility accessible to clients and volunteers alike and possessing the space which is necessary for this mission that benefits the whole community. It is also about the thousands of neighbors who are part of the houses of worship of this community and know that neighbor to neighbor and its offerings of service and respect and support are at the very heart of what it is to be an authentic and generous town and community knowing that this work is an expression of practical faith and a spirit of compassion. And we have uh, sent a letter from the uh, Greenwich <laughs> Clergy Fellowship to that effect. Is it about us, the neighbors who pray and learn and serve at Christ Church as well? We are offering this location intentionally because our mission so clearly aligns with Neighbor to Neighbor's mission and because we have both the responsibility and the blessing to be stewards of property in central Greenwich where this facility must be sited to serve at its best. We are also neighbors who take the stewardship of our beautiful, useful, historic facilities and properties very seriously, investing vast human and financial resources in their care. After careful deliberation, we are convinced that this is the best and most appropriate placement for the building and is in concert with the historic nature of the Christ Church properties. There have been outbuildings on the Tomes Higgins property in the past, and this placement guards the historic ambiance of the post road frontage and facade in its historic character. It is also very importantly, also about adjacent neighbors, those neighboring organizations which offer important services analogous to neighbor to neighbor in our neighborhood, uh, Temple Shalom, and you will have a chance to hear from Rabbi Mitch Hurwitz at a point, the YWCA, the Junior League, which is doing a major food in gathering and sign of support for neighbor to neighbor this coming weekend, and also importantly, it is about the neighbors who live in the residences abutting the Christ Church property. They have been listened to and hopefully feel respected. And as you can see this evening, their concerns have been directly addressed by neighbor to neighbor in its planning process. The project does not adversely impact the quality of living. Rather, it improves somewhat dramatically plantings, drainage, and other property elements. It is not a commercial building. Rather, it retains residential character and is for people, not commerce nor profit. Finally, it is about the neighbors, indeed the hundreds of families and individuals who utilize neighbor to neighbors food and clothing resources, not as an add-on, but as a necessity of their living. The town of Greenwich in its official forms knows and affirms the programs and essential nature of neighbor to neighbor at its Christ Church location and realizes that it is indeed an utterly essential part of the fabric of what it is to be a town that seeks to meet the needs of all, all its neighbors. I am concerned that these neighbors, the human beings who depend on neighbor to neighbor and deserve a proper, respectful, and beautiful facility have not had adequate voice in this conversation. So that's why I mention them here now. And they are, in my mind and my heart, 
the very center of the reason for pursuing this project. They are neighbors and fellow citizens as well. Now, all of the neighbors I have mentioned and many other neighbors in this community will actually benefit from this facility and project. Neighbor to neighbor does its work on behalf of every person in this room, all of us. And all of us depend on its work to create a neighborly, caring, generous, and complete community and town. My hope, can I say it in a public space, my prayer, <laughs> is that all of us as neighbors can unite in support for this mission and ultimately for the building, location, and construction that will allow this organization and its work to thrive for the benefit of us all. Thank you very much for your consideration. Heller, members of the commission, that concludes our presentation tonight. I would simply add, however, that Reverend Lemler's words uh, go very much to one major point that has been raised before, which is the plan of conservation and development. I think what he stated very eloquently gives you a number of the reasons why w this proposal meets all the criteria of the plan of conservation and development, notwithstanding comments made by a couple of people that we somehow do not do so. We do. And I think that uh, we have presented the information relevant to the concerns raised by the commission. We are ready to answer questions. Uh, uh, our architect, Mr. Granoff, is also here, as well as members of the board of Neighbor to Neighbor and Nancy Coffin, the executive director, who can answer operational questions. Uh, so we are have concluded someone, for now. And somebody, we will someone ought to sum up the changes that have been made from the original application for the benefit of the public. You'd like me to do that now? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, so. Does everybody understand what we're just going to do? There was an original application which we reviewed in December. Correct. Yeah. And based on the Commission's review and comments from the public, we suggested a bunch of changes, some of which were reported on today. And I'm asking the gentleman to sum it up, okay? Thank you. Uh, to, to sum up, we, what the, the changes that were made uh, include uh, and are not limited to the following. One, we moved the location of the building 10 feet further away from uh, Putnam Park and Putnam Hill. So it was 81 feet away at one point from the property. It's now 91 feet. Uh, we changed the location of the dumpsters that had been on the other side closer to the, the our neighbors and we have now removed those and located them into the middle of the property so that you will not have the only trucks that would come at a very odd hour of uh, interfering with the neighbors uh, peace and enjoyment the other thing we have in, in, in looked at and further studied the drainage we increased the uh, the uh, depth of Sorry the to interrupt. Watch out in the back. There's a, I think someone hit the, hit a switch. I just didn't want to have anyone get, <laughs> have their head get hit unexpectedly. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry to interrupt. I apologize. No, no, that's, that's fine. Uh, uh, we also, uh, there was a change and, and further improvements to the drainage to address uh, the issues of, uh, and, and, uh, for overflow and, and, and to address them by the pervious service at the depth of the gravel, for example, went to 30 inches. And as uh, uh, our engineer, Mr. Finkbeiner, stated, if, if there was additional need for uh, you know, looking at the cemetery wall, uh, we would address it by adding a, an additional six inches in depth of the stone that is, is the pervious surfaces, the low impact development best practices. Uh, the, the other things that we ha have done is we, we further studied the parking situation and, and it, right now there is a proposal for 19 parking spaces. Uh, zoning, if you were to allow under zoning, uh, that would require for the size of building 20 parking spaces. 
we don't believe that's necessary, but we have room to add another space if the commission saw fit to require that for the property. Uh, so th those are the, uh, the, the, the major points that we uh, reviewed tonight. I'm trying to think if there's something else that I missed. We, oh, we, we addressed the noise question, and we addressed the landscaping and planting plan, and, and we are retaining and enhancing that, and I have showed you, and we hope that you agree, that the, the planting plan is, is appropriate to adequately screen our neighbors. Now, there's been a question about the fence, as opposed to the, the uh, planting plan, if that, is the, if that is the desire of the neighbors or the commission, uh, neighbor to neighbor is agreeable that we would put the fence in instead of the, the, the planting if, if that's what people think would be better. So that, that, is, that is on the table, so to speak, that we, we're perfectly willing to, to do the fence in, in lieu of the, the planting plan. So uh, I think that, uh, and you know, we, we can certainly address other issues if people have them. We, we have all our consultants here, including some that you did not hear tonight because we, we didn't want to go through every okay. issue. Um, so we, we're ready to listen and answer further questions as they may arise. We had one, one question uh, from December that uh, hasn't yet been answered, and that is the future use of the neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor present space in the basement. Um, I mean, that the, the church will have taken back from neighbor to neighbor? Yes, you mean the what it's in, so that we can understand whether there is a, a parking um, demand for that space. That was a question that we raised in December. Um, well, I think the owner of it will now address <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not sure I've been called the owner before. That's a very nice thought. Um, the, uh, all of the pr properties of Christ Church are used for the mission of Christ Church, and we don't perceive uh, any expansion of that from groups that are using it now. And we have um, had indication, as we've done some uh, parking studies and traffic studies and all of that sort of thing, too, that there will not be increased uh, traffic. And we have adequate parking, as far as I know, according to the uh, statutes of this town. Thank you. But do you know what, I mean, is, are you saying that it's going to be limited to um, members of the church using it for church functions? Because at the moment, it's neighbor to neighbor, um, and there is a parking demand from it. So that is our concern. We don't foresee, and we have had this part of the conversation, we don't no. foresee any greater impact in terms of uh, parking necessity. And whether we put an existing youth ministry down there or some kids that play instruments that are already playing instruments, none of whom, to my knowledge, drive, um, uh, that will not have, a, have an impact. So it's a church function, and if our, if, if your, if you were, if the, um, if the moving to final was I, well, I, I think that what I would best say, if an attorney were advising me, is that it's going to be, of course, a church function that okay. is existing at present, and however, we're called to a number of uh, you know, we're much more like that flowing water than like the stone wall, uh, Mrs. Raymer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, and there, the uh, uh, other one question. More, one more question. Uh, yes. Was we were given um, a list of what happens at Tom's Higgins on the weekend, uh, but not during the week. And I, I'm not sure we had asked for the weekdays, but um, I think for completeness of any traffic concerns, we we would like to know what. You're talking about in terms of traffic. It's just a list. You had given us a list of what happens, um, what the schedule is, and I, I yeah. Uh, when we were here um, in December that there was uh, a perception that the busiest day on the church property was Saturdays, and so that was the, um, the information that was requested. Yep. Um, we, we can certainly, um, as you know, part of our final site plan, provide Great. you the whole Great. schedule for the week. Perfect. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, folks. Mr. Uh, Allen, I've got one quick question <coughs> before we move on. Uh, for uh, did you want to? Mr. Raines or Mr. Finkbeiner, um, in the materials that were given to us, I didn't see a section through the retaining wall. Um, it's five feet with a uh, 
a uh, guardrail on top if that can be provided because um, I'd like to understand how that five foot wall and how that uh, guardrail on top works in uh, relationship to the properties and the adjacent properties. Uh, uh, Pete Finkbeiner, Soundview. Um, I'm not a structural engineer, but I do know that wall will be uh, a five feet tall maximum in accordance with town requirements and it will require uh, to be engineered and an engineered design submitted to building department when the time comes. Be a very standard uh, retaining wall with uh, weep holes and um, we, we do see a need for pulling the cars back from diving over it so we've, we've called for a timber uh, guide rail. Uh, we imagine it to be relatively uh, a thin uh, steel posts with a, a timber guide rails are usually um, uh, four by ten inches if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And it's 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 anchored, but uh, five feet is the maximum height. Okay. Uh, what's the the um, outside face of the wall going to be made of? Is it? Uh, assume the actually the retaining wall will be concrete, but are you going to face it with anything? Um, I'm, and I'm then what would have be? To turn to more aesthetic members of the team. Thank you. The face, of the fa Eric Rains again. Um, the face of the proposed wall is is proposed to be a stone veneer. Stone veneer, um, with the guardrail on top yes. from the low side. How high do you think it'll be? It'll we be represent it actually in, in, in our in our section. I just grabbed that one because it was on on top, but it, it it's represented here as a single element, both the wall and the um, and the element on top. Um, if the, the the typical guardrail is probably a minimum of of 36 inches or 30 36 inches, um, so it would so it would be that dimension on top of the of the wall. So the, the I'm sorry. The retaining wall goes to just at grade or, or slightly above yes, on yes. the new side, and then. Yes. The guardrails on top of that. Yes. And the advantage of, of building it the way Peter described versus the solid element that's here, there's there'll be a void zone between the bottom of the wood member he mentioned and the top of the wall. So from the low side, we've got a five foot wall plus the three foot. Three, two and a half to three feet, yeah. So yeah. seven and a half to, to eight feet. Okay. Yeah. That's what I'm looking for. Thank yes. you. Okay. Yes, thank okay, you. Okay, folks. Here's what we're going to do now. We'll call somebody up. And as I said in the beginning, uh, w welcome any comments, but please do not repeat the same questions or subject that we've already covered. Anybody can speak, and three minutes is the limit. And my companion has a very good wa watch, and he'll say, time's up. Okay? Now, who would like to go? Please raise your hand. Yes, sir. Good evening. James Doherty representing Putnam Hill Apartments, D-O-U-G-H-E-R-T-Y. I did submit a letter to the commission that um, I hope you've read and you hope you have. I'll spare you going through the details if you have done that. Um, I would like just to say we do have quite a few residents of Putnam Hill and Putnam Park here tonight, possibly to spare having them all come up and speak. If I can just ask all the neighbors at Putnam Hill and Putnam Park who are here in opposition, if you could just please stand up for a moment. Thank you. And to address the Reverend's <coughs> comments, I, I don't think anyone here is opposed to neighbor to neighbor. We applaud neighbor to neighbor. We recognize their value to the community. That being said, Christ Church and neighbor to neighbor are not above the law. They need to comply with the town POCD. They need to comply with the town regulations. What they're proposing isn't your standard nonprofit headquarters that's been approved by the commission in residential zones around town. This is much more akin to a commercial operation. Other than money trans, uh, transpiring between neighbor to neighbor and its clients, it's the same as a market or a clothing store. It has numerous deliveries of clothing and food goods. It has customers who come, walk through displayed items, select what they want, and leave with it. The only difference is there's no money passing. This has to be treated as more of a commercial operation. 
under 694 of the town regulations, it appears that they're submitting their, reg their application as if they're a church, which has minimal um, side and rear yard requirements. This would only qualify as a philanthropic or charitable institution under 694, and that requires 100 foot setbacks on all yards and all streets. This is far under that. We do recognize that they have made minor adjustments to their plan. They've moved some things five or 10 feet. I'm five or 10 feet away from all of you. And tell me, does a 6,800 square foot building going to look any different being that farther away from you than it is now? <clears throat> the applicants have said that they do comply with POCD. We submit that they do not. This is a drastic change to the neighborhood. This is a federally recognized historical district. It's been recognized for its landscape and its buildings. In the R20 zone, you're allowed one main structure, which is the Tomes Higgins House. This is an accessory structure. You're not allowed two primary buildings. This must comply with accessory structure height and size requirements as well. I'll now turn it over to Melissa Klauberg, who's here representing Putnam Park. Thank you. Yeah, that was good. Right now. Perfect. Uh, good evening, Melissa Klauberg, Ivy Barnum and O'Meara. I'm representing um, Putnam Park, as you know. Why don't you raise it a little? Uh, sorry, it's uh, K-L-A-U-B-E-R-G. Okay. I would like to take a few minutes to add to what Jim has said, and we'll try not to be repetitive, since the interests and concerns of both Putnam Park and Putnam Hill are very similar, if not identical. In addition to the goals of the plan of conservation and development Jim has discussed, the regula regulations provide that the, the commission must also consider the preservation and enhancement of property values. One does not have to be an appraiser or a real estate broker to see the damage which would be done by the erection of a 6,695 square foot building for commercial use in the backyard of a well-established residential community. There are 72 Putnam Park homes facing what is now the backyard of the Tomes Higgins property, including the beautiful green space with the church in the distance. That open space is proposed to be replaced with a fence, perhaps a parking lot, and a very large food and clothing distribution center. As requested by Ms. Raymer in the last hearing, we have taken photos to demonstrate the hardship this development will cause on the neighboring properties of Putnam Hill and Putnam Park. I submit these photos to indicate the damaging effect this development would have on these homes. We'll, we'll, we'll pass that around for Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. The first fo photo is um, of the backyards of the 72 Putnam Park units. You will see the sidewalk running along the back of the units with Putnam Park units on the left. All the units have patios complete with, sorry, complete with planters and outside grills, and those patios basically run up to the sidewalk. The sidewalk is approximately 12 feet from the shared boundary, and the shared boundary is indicated by a wire fence. To help acclimate you, the photo is taken from the spot where the Putnam Park and Putnam Hill properties meet. The wire fence and brush that is parallel to the sidewalk is the northerly boundary of the Putnam Park property, and the line of brush and trees along the right side of the photo is the boundary between the Putnam Hill property and the Tomes Higgins property. That's the first page. The proposed structure is to go in the snow-covered space in the corner. Notice along the right side of the photo is a new fence. It is a bright spot on the photo, a beige-yellow shade. Keep that in mind when you turn to the next page. The next photo is the edge of the Putnam Hill property. You can see the posts of the wire fence marking the boundary just on the other side of the snowbanks. And there is that yellow beige fence. This is the superintendent's cottage for Putnam Hill and will be just a few feet away from the proposed driveway leading to the proposed building and the parking lot in the back of the distribution center building. The next photo is from the Putnam Hill property looking toward where the proposed structure is to be. The wire fence marks the boundary and you can see the berm which is on the Thomas Higgins property where it is evident there are footprints. I just want to let you know it's three minutes. Do you really want me to stop? I, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, can I finish? Okay. I, I, I think that for counsel, uh, for the opposition, 
it seems appropriate that they should be able to I fully agree. articulate. I agree. Uh, I just agree. Yeah. I agree. Can I slow down then? <laughs> yeah, you can slow down. <laughs> Whew. Okay. Okay. The, uh, so the next photo is from the Putnam Hill property, looking toward where the proposed structure is to be. The wire fence marks the boundary, and you can see the berm, which is on the Tomes Higgins property, where it is evident there are footprints. The berm is between the fence post and the skinny tree on the left side of that photo. The last photo is of me standing approximately on that berm where the edge of the proposed parking lot is on the Tomes Higgins pro property. The photo is taken from the patio of the Putnam Park units and you can see the wire fence which marks the boundary in the foreground. This is to give you an idea of how close that parking lot will be from someone standing on the patio of a Putnam Park unit. Remembering the parking lot also has a loading dock for the delivery of items by trucks, trucks which require a large turning radius. The applicant mentioned that they need a turning radius for an SU-30 truck. I didn't know what an SU-30 truck was, so I did what any tech-savvy person would do. I googled it, and this is what I found. So this is a type of truck that, which will be delivering goods and picking up items on a raised parking lot that is that close to the boundary, a stone's throw from the backyard grills of the 72 homes of Putnam Park. So these 72 homes will have trucks complete with headlights, backup beepers, de delivery ramps right in their backyard. Also consider the noise, not just of these deliveries, but of the mechanical servicing such a large commercial structure, the air handlers, heating units, generator, the coming and going of staff, and the public dropping off clothing and other donated goods. There is no fence or attractive, um, no fence big enough or planting big enough or attractive enough to turn this application into a plan that preserves and enhances property values or fulfills the goals of the plan of conservation and development or saves what is the essence of Greenwich. Okay, the commission is also to consider overall site design, and although the applicant, as their architect was, had stated, has tried to be sensitive to the location and appearance of the Tomes Higgins house by placing this distribution center as far away as possible from that house, that means this large distribution center will be as close as possible to the two adjacent neighborhoods. As mentioned by Ms. Alban at the first hearing on this application, although the applicant has been sensitive to the Christchurch campus, they have not been sensitive to the people around the campus, and this supposed revised application continues along the same theme. No sensitivity to the neighbors. They're not feeling very neighborly. Some of the other standards the commission is to consider include whether the proposed development will obstruct significant views, whether it will preserve or enhance important open space, and whether it is compatible with surrounding users. The submitted photos clearly show this project <laughs> fails to fulfill all these vital standards. The last standard I would like to mention that the Commission must consider is whether the proposed development will not materially adversely affect adjacent areas located within the closest proximity to the proposed use. Clearly, the drainage problems, the noise, the loss of green space, the bulk of this building will materially adversely affect the adjacent areas of Putnam Park and Putnam Hill. We assert that this application not only shows no sensitivity to the neighborhood, but also shows no respect for the plan of conservation and development and fails to comply with the standards set forth in the regulations. Okay. Okay. In addition, if the commission fails to find out that those standards are met, that all those standards are met, and that the goals of the plan of conservation and development are supported, that the proposed development will not obstruct significant views and will preserve open space and is compatible with the surrounding areas, then the standards of an accessory structure, <laughs> as Jim stated, in a residential zone must be met. The regulation provide that an accessory building or use is any building or use which is subordinate and customarily incidental to the pr principal building or use on the same lot. Thank you. So an accessory structure must, not, must be subordinate to the main building. In this zone, an accessory structure is not to be more than 800 square feet. It is to appear subordinate. This structure is more than eight times the size permitted in the zone. It appears similar in size to the Tomes Higgins House, which would be the primary structure. It is not, does not appear subordinate. 
The regulations further provide that the accessory building shall not exceed a height of 25 feet. This building is proposed to be 33 feet in height, eight feet taller than permitted. Even in a commercial zone, an accessory structure must not exceed 25 feet. Please also note that, um, let's get back. in addition to this fact that this distribution center building is to be elevated to accommodate the water table it sits on, that will also make the building appear even taller and further loom over the neighboring homes. We also ask, and I think you have, that you consider the increased traffic since the space currently used by neighbor to neighbor will be moved out of the church basements. That space will presumably be used, be put to new use by the church, adding to the traffic in and out of the property. Obviously, flooding is a huge problem in the area. We have, we have hired SC Minor to review what is proposed and we'll be getting an evalu evaluation from them. Um, and since there already exists a drainage and flooding problem in these neighborhoods, we ask that the, any proposed drainage plan not only accommodate the increase in flooding that this building will cause, but also take this opportunity to correct the existing problem. Okay, we ask that you keep that matter open until we have our uh, report from SC Minor. Okay, so in conclusion, um, Sorry, sorry. Okay, in conclusion, we ask that the commission keep in mind that the rules are to apply to everyone. People buy their homes relying on the fact that the regulations will be followed and consistently applied and enforced. This is a residential zone. No one purchased a unit in anticipation of a grocery store being located in their backyard. We feel as though we are trying to defend LeBron James coming in for a slam dunk. Yet, we should have a voice. After all, they're one of the largest real estate taxpayers in town. We ask that the commission take a step back and be cognizant of the standards set up by the plan of conservation and development. Enforce the rules intended to prohibit an application such as this which will materially adversely affect the neighborhood and follow the regulations which were passed to keep Greenwich green. Are you a lawyer? Good evening. I am a lawyer, but I'm not here in a capacity as a lawyer. Um, my name is Alessandra Messinea Long. I am the president of the Junior League of Greenwich. The Junior League has been a longtime supporter of Neighbor to Neighbor. As a service organization dedicated to promoting volunteerism, we fully appreciate the many challenges nonprofit organizations face and recognize the great need in this community for the services that Neighbor pr provides. However, I speak as their neighbor tonight. The Junior League offices are directly across the street from neighbor to neighbor and has housed neighbor to neighbor for 40 years. We are probably closer to neighbor's front door than Putnam Park and certainly Putnam Hill will be in the proposed building. However, I can see the clients coming and going Monday through Saturday in the mornings, along with the donors and the neighbor to neighbor van. I want to assure you that it all appears orderly and not congested in any way. They want to get in and out and they are not noisy and it's not chaotic. It is a well-organized, well-maintained operation. I have no reason to think, and the Junior League has no reason to think, that this would not continue continue to be as such with a new building. Uh, they continue to be a good neighbor to us, and I have no reason to believe that they will operate in any different way moving forward. They're very courteous, and we enjoy having them as a neighbor. Um, we've been happy to be neighbors with this organization, and we wish them all the best in their much um, needed new headquarters. Thank you. Excuse me, miss. Okay. Hello. Um, I'm Charlotte Walker. I'm president of the Putnam Park Association. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, present our position. In the interest of time and out of... Bit, would you? Raise the mic a little bit. Yes, absolutely. In the interest of time, I would like to read my remarks. And I'm, I've actually just nixed... Um, more than 50% of what I was going to say because it was repetitive. Um, so what I would really like to do here is to focus on incremental issues that are still concerning to us. One of them certainly is drainage. And I would like to point the 
commission to um, studies that were done in the 1996 to 1998 time frame. And this was uh, related to the Tomes Higgins property for additional parking, um, parking spaces and a water detention system. Uh, S.E. Minor was the surveyor at that time. And this was when the berm that we see on all these pictures was actually created. Now this was about 20 years ago and I believe that there probably has been incremental um, storms and, and greater effect from uh, all, all sorts of uh, um, climate change, and I'd like to see an update to, to that plan. Um, I also want to bring up the uh, operations of neighbor to neighbor, and first and foremost, our 200 families, uh, a very large proportion of them support neighbor to neighbor as volunteers and certainly as donors. Uh, we are very much behind the mission of neighbor to neighbor and what they do in Greenwich. Um, I want to make sure that we are uh, understood that our concerns are with the actual building and the operations that will occur around the building. So to that end, I thought it was very important to point up some things that are public information available in Neighbor to Neighbor Annual Reports, in uh, public reports to Greenwich Times, as well as comments made by Executive Director Nancy Coughlin. Um, I think it's important to state that during the 2008 to 2010 recession, uh, demand for Neighbor to Neighbor services jumped 50%. And that was reported in uh, the Greenwich Times, Neighbor to Neighbor has an appetite for service, August 9th, 2014. According to Neighbor to Neighbor annual reports, 660 families received food assistance from them in fiscal 2015 versus 321 in fiscal 2001. That's a 5% compounded annual growth rate. In the same time frame, 325,000 meals were donated versus 47,000. That was a 14% compounded annual growth rate. In addition, in just one year, this last year, there was an increase of 4% in the number of clients served in the clothing room. That was 2015 versus 2014. Now, I'm, I'm bringing these up because um, Nancy Coughlin, has, uh, the executive director of Neighbor to Neighbor, has told us, and I think has presented to this commission, that the building is twice the service capacity of what Neighbor to Neighbor currently has at Christ Church. Uh, and um, that Neighbor to Neighbor does not plan to grow. So with the numbers that I just presented to you, this doesn't seem plausible. The historic and most recent growth trajectories, as noted, um, tell a very different story. So what this, these growth rates mean, if I just take historic um, and project to the future, is that the organization will outsize the capacity of the proposed building for the families that it serves in a very, very short period of time relative to the lease in under 20 years. And most importantly, the more commercial aspect of the operation, which is the donation of meals which requires refrigeration and waste disposal, will outgrow the proposed capacity within six years. So with this information, um, I am extraordinarily surprised that a feasibility study has not been conducted or requested. Um, is this the right location? Is this the right place? Is this the right structure for such an ambitious and great organization to be when they will actually be outliving um, uh, and outgrowing the, um, you know, the lease arrangement they have with Christ Church. I'm going to just go on a bit more longer, and I'm, I'm sorry for that, but this gets to the point of transparency, which um, uh, we have not had here with respect to the lease arrangement between Christ Church and neighbor to neighbor. And it's of critical importance because of the numbers that I just cited. Uh, I'm not sure that all parties concerned are really looking at this particular situation in the light that it should be looked at. 
We have asked for and been refused access to the lease agreement between neighbor to neighbor and Christchurch. And per this public information that I've just given you, uh, this is really pretty critical um, to this project for neighbors and for the town of Greenwich. For every dollar spent, at least I have been told this by many civil engineers that I know, on constructing a building, the same dollars will be spent in the next 20 years renovating, repairing, and updating the building. Who is responsible for the maintenance? And how will it be funded? What happens if and when the lessee abandons the lease or moves out? Then what? Uh, what restrictions, if any, are being placed on the operations for this building and this lease? Uh, should this project move forward in any way or shape, the terms of this lease, in my mind, as it relates to use, restrictions, and maintenance should be made public, and similar restrictions should be mandated by the commission. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Janet Strobel, and I'm a resident. You can, you can of, go down with the mic. Go down with the mic. <laughs> Okay. I'm a resident of Putnam Hill and also a board member at Putnam Hill for the past four years. And all of the things that have been mentioned by our lawyers and also um, Putnam Park's lawyers we're in agreement with, um, <coughs> we wanted to make it absolutely clear we are very supportive of neighbor to neighbor and the things that they do for the community. As a retired Greenwich teacher, the whole time I was teaching in the system, I would organize clothing drives, food drives in our school and bring it to neighbor to neighbor. That is not the issue. We are supportive of neighbor to neighbor. We are not supportive of the size of the building that they are requesting to build. Um, and I'm trying to, to get away from some of the things that were said. Um, we have a much different population than Putnam Park has. Our population is a little bit older Many of us are now single people, so there is a big concern when we moved here. It was a secure, very secure, safe place for us to be living. Now, with this projected proposal and a building this size, we do feel that it's going to uh, affect the security of our residents, and that we are very, very concerned with. I know you've received many, many letters from our residents. You will be receiving many more. Um, we also have many in our population who are not computer um, comfortable and, uh, and ne neither writing by hand letters. So they have asked, our residents have asked if we would start a petition, which we have. And because we just found out that we were going to be here this night, the petition will be coming from our community. And our community is very supportive of not having this proposal the way it is. Um, I am also part of the board. One of my responsibilities is landscaping. And I haven't really had a chance to see the new um, perspective of landscaping. And I'm, I made an appointment with our landscape architect. We're in the process of, of renewing our land. Um, and I, I want to, to really check out their um, landscaping. Um, I didn't hear any mention of what the pro uh, project was going to be doing on the eastern side of the uh, of the um, building. I, when I asked Eric, they were small bushes. Now I'm hearing the road could be raised, that we're 4.2 feet from uh, the, the property line. And our superintendent, our newly hired superintendent, will be affected uh, by certainly the traffic and, and discomfort of having such a project. So I, again, ask you to consider our feelings and, and those of our residents um, in dealing with this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Wendy Blumenthal. I am currently co-chair of the United Way Needs Assessment Report that will be coming out in April. Um, and from 1981 to 2001, I was director of community health planning for the Department of Health here in Town Hall. I was also interim, co-interim executive director for Neighbor to Neighbor at the last half of 2012 as they searched for Nancy Coughlin. 
I just want to share with you some preliminary findings so that we can talk more about the clients who use neighbor to neighbor. Of the 62,256 people who live in our community, 17% of them can be termed Alice, which is a United Way term that describes them as asset limited, income constrained, and employed which means that they are working poor who earn above the federal poverty level but fall short of the basic cost of living threshold for our communities. 5% of Greenwich residents live below the federal poverty level. 15% of Greenwich students qualify for free or reduced lunch. And that's doubled in 10 years. To take those, those statistics and put them in a human perspective, the negative effects of poverty on children. Poor nutrition causes health problems, including low birth weight babies, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, inability to concentrate in school. Low income children have less access to enriching early experiences, such as high quality preschool books, and a rich language environment at home. Poverty is the leading cause of food insecurity, but the two are not synonymous. Not every poor person is food insecure, and food insecurity can affect people living above the poverty level. Two more things. Food insecurity is associated with anger and aggression in children, and also in teenagers. And in terms of the achievement gap in our community, studies show food insecure children learn at a slower rate, have lower math scores, are more likely to repeat a grade, have higher special education participation rates, are more likely to drop out of school, and have a future of lower lifetime earnings. So as Reverend Lemler said, it is the mission of Neighbor to Neighbor to help our community neighbors. And for 40 years, Neighbor to Neighbor has done that in the strangest set of rooms and areas you could ever imagine if you've been there. And it is time for the clients, as well as the staff, to have a house that is dignified and appropriate for what they do. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jody Brakell. I've been a resident of Greenwich since 1985 and worked in local human service nonprofits for 25 years before starting B&B &B Consulting Solutions for Nonprofits in 2009 with Wendy Blumenthal. Our most rewarding and challenging contract to date was the six months we spent in 2012 sharing the interim executive director duties at Neighbor to Neighbor while the board conducted a successful search for the new executive director, Nancy Coughlin. The familiar phrase, it takes a village, comes to mind when describing the culture of caring, compassion, and kindness we experienced at Neighbor. I was already familiar with the agency and its services through my paid and volunteer activities in town, and actually a recipient myself of grocery distribution for several months in the early 1980s when I first came to town with two small children and one small nonprofit salary. Fast forward 25 years and Wendy and I climbed down the precarious stone steps into the Christchurch basement on a human June morning and encountered the village firsthand. Smiling volunteers in green aprons were gathered around a work table sorting, sizing, and folding clothing from the piles of donated items in huge laundry bins, greeting donors and accepting new donations that they came in, and most importantly, assisting clients in the clothing room to find just the right items among the many shelves and racks squeezed into a very warm, very hot space. Up front, the bilingual client coordinator was cheerfully greeting clients, checking them in and entering data on a dinosaur of a computer answering the phone and monitoring how many clients were in the cramped clothing space at one time. In a tiny stone-walled share office that was to be my home for the next six months, the administrative coordinator was scheduling the next week's volunteer staffing, coordinating upcoming food and clothing drive pickups, entering donor data into another dinosaur desktop, and making coffee for the volunteers. 
Across the Christchurch campus and down another set of basement steps, we enter the food pantry. Here, volunteers and one staff member were stacking shelves, bagging groceries, and assisting clients as they shopped the neatly organized shelves of canned goods, dry goods, fresh produce, bread, and large refrigerators of dairy and meat using the provided nutritional guidelines shopping lists. Additional volunteers were stationed in a cramped and stuffy back hallway, sorting and date checking what seemed like hundreds of crates of canned goods that had just arrived from a school food drive. What struck me most was that despite the cramped quarters, the heat of summer in under air conditioned spaces, the outdated equipment, the lack of adequate storage, and the skeleton staff, they made it work and they loved the work. They created an atmosphere of welcome, dignity, caring, and respect. This village is more than a dedicated board staff and cadre of volunteers, many of whom have been there for decades. It is Christ Church who has housed the growing program for 40 years in the best way they can to meet neighbors' growing needs. It is the Department of Social Services who refers and supports many of our clients. It's the Transportation Association of Greenwich who transport elderly clients to neighbor or delivers food to those who cannot shop for themselves because of the inaccessibility in the current facility. It is the countless schools, businesses, agencies, civic and scout groups, postal workers and faith communities who volunteer and hold food and clothing drives throughout the year. It is the community gardens and farmers markets and retailers who donate fresh produce or Thanksgiving turkeys. And it is our many neighbors, including often our own clients, who donate gently used clothing, small household items, school supplies, and food. Ma'am, can I give you one more minute? Mm -hmm. In the three years since we completed our contract service, Neighbor has moved forward under the leadership of a highly engaged board with a, ti with a tireless Nancy Clawson at the helm in thoughtful strategic planning for the future, while also making major improvements in ongoing service delivery, improved operation, enhanced communications, and robust fund development efforts. After 40 years, Neighbor's poised to build a beautiful space to house both the food and clothing programs in one custom designed, accessible, and appropriate space to better serve our community and our neighbors. Each of us in this village can help in some way, volunteering, donating goods, with financial support and advocacy, or just being a good neighbor. The original good neighbor, Mr. Rogers, said it well. All of us, at some time or other, need help. Whether we're giving or receiving help, each one of us has something valuable to bring to this world. That's one of the things that connects us as neighbors. In our own way, each one of us is a giver and a receiver. Thank you. <laughs> Jody Brakel. I'll only be three minutes. Okay. Good evening, my name is Sarah Small, and I live in Building 5 of Putnam Hill. Um, while I don't think there's a person in this room who would argue with the fact that neighbor to neighbor needs uh, an improved facility for the purpose that it exists, but the attempt to characterize the residents of Putnam Hill and Putnam Park as anything other than anything as any less charitable than they are is unkind and I think uncharitable to us and that it confuses the issue. The issue is not that they, do, that they don't need, we're not arguing with them, okay, they need a bigger facility, that's fine, but the issue is where they want to place the facility and the direct um, effects it will have on our homes and our lifestyles. I live in the back of, I live in building five and my apartment faces the back of the church and the back of the synagogue. I can tell you on the issue of noise that I am awoken weekly, every week, at least once a week, by the garbage trucks that come and collect the garbage from the synagogue and from the church. I can hear the beeping, I can hear the trucks operating. I can hear all the activities going on in the church and the synagogue all year round. I see everything that goes on when it's winter, and the summer I don't see it, but I hear it. The statement made by that gentleman, Mr. Raines, wherever he is, that when he said to you that if you don't see, see where the noise is coming from, you hear it less, is simply a sales pitch. I can tell you from personal experience, that's not the truth. I hear everything. 
I, I can tell you when they're playing the bagpipes in the church. I can tell you what's going on because I can hear it. Thank you. Rabbi Mitch, and I don't know if people know, but I have a last name, Hurvitz, so uh, H-U-R-V as in Victor, I-T-Z. Um, I, I, I think it's so important to, to know people are here with uh, good hearts, with good good intentions, and uh, that's something was very important. I guess the piece that I would say is uh, Rabbi Temple Shalom and a neighbor, uh, the mission of a religious organization is to take care of those in need physically and spiritually. Feeding the hungry is the most fundamental tenet of a religious organization. I know no grocery store in town where a poor person can walk in and receive free food. I don't know a restaurant where it can happen. We have an obligation as a community to support neighbor to neighbor in its mission, religious mission, to feed the hungry. It's not a commercial mission. And we do hear noise. There's physical noise. But there's noise that we don't necessarily hear, but we have to. It's the cries of those children who are hungry. It's the mother who's crying out because they can't feed their child. The father who groans in agony because he can't take care of his family. Neighbor to neighbor takes care of that. It lowers that noise that troubles our community. So I do understand people with good intentions can disagree on this issue, but I do not think it's a commercial institution. It is a fundamentally religious organization. The church is doing an amazing mitzvah. I'm sure that'll be in your bulletin, Jim. An amazing mitzvah to support neighbor to neighbor. We feel uh, incredibly rewarded as a congregation to uh, support neighbor to neighbor and appreciate how much effort they're doing to try to make it conform as best as it can be as a neighbor in our community. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the commission. I'm Chris von Keiseling. Uh, I'm on the RTM. Uh, I want to get back to the ideas of zoning and management of land use. Uh, all, the nest, all these things about neighbor to neighbor you're going to hear over and again. I don't think anybody probably in this whole room disagrees with its mission or with the, the, the good it does. But we do deal in things in this town of planning. We deal with uh, primacy. We deal with uh, what's grandfathered or not, who came first, you know, and how things develop. I would point out to you that in this community, as well as most New England communities, the first operation of governance was through the church. It was the church that founded and created these colonies. It was the church that governed these colonies. Colonies, You couldn't be in a town meeting and act in it unless you were a member of the church. It was the church ran the governance of the community. And as we grew up, that church also took care of all the public welfare in the community. For 250 years in this area, it's been the religious institutions that have provided this kind of support we're talking about tonight. The government has only started taking over this more and more in this last 20th century. So the tradition of a church like Christ Church that's been here since 1740 or some 250 years, as well as other institutions of town have been this giving and supply. That's what the purchase, people think the purpose of a church is to congregate and worship, that's true. But it's also to be an area where its members practice <clears throat> the tenets of charity that are taught in their religions. And uh, we go through things like, uh, uh, and the care for all. Historically, public welfare has been an institution of the churches. And <clears throat> it's to heal the sick, as you take the Beatitudes, heal the sick, shelter the homeless, and in this case, feed the hungry and clothe the naked. It's very clear. And that goes across many religions, not just the one that we're talking about right now. Still today, a major portion of public welfare service is still done through the churches and uh, it's supplied by those institutions and the not-for-profits which these institutions generally have created and started. Uh, the vast majority of Putnam Park are there, uh, can't see this institution from their property. 
Putnam Park and Putnam Hill are looking out the back of their building. That's really the backside of a large con uh, structure of apartment dwellings, uh, both the duplexes and the others, if you look at that. I'm not saying that they shouldn't have use and enjoyment of their property, but I'm just trying to bring some proportion to bear here. Uh, the concerns expressed by the neighbors of drainage, noise and light trespass, refuse removal, driveways and parking are all satisfied under our pretty standard and, and secure uh, regulations uh, which apply just the same to a McMansion as they would to an office building or even apartment complexes. Uh, they can be sure of that. But remember, uh, the majority of the, pr the subject property that we're talking about of Christ Church, both parcels, is lawn and a graveyard. I can't think of a quieter use than a graveyard. <laughs> That's the majority of it. So when we talk about the other question is, okay, this, will the success of neighbor to neighbor kill its very venture? Will it be creating a de demand, uh, you know, keep growing, growing, as this lady was saying. It kind of reminds me of people that predicted that Grants would have 90, 100,000 people in it by this time. And we've had 60,000 for 50 years, give or take a few thousand. So these projections we have to be careful of when we look at them. Uh, neighbor to neighbor does not cause the demand. The demand is there. It's driven by our society. It's been out there. They've been servicing this demand all along and trying to keep up with it. What this project will do is allow them to take care of that same demand more efficiently with better quality with the same, amount, same clientele that they have now. Uh, I would ask you to approve this application uh, for Christ, so that Christ Church and Neighbor to Neighbor can continue a service to our town, which has been provided for approximately, in one form or another, for three centuries. I would say there's some grandfathering here that one should look at when we talk about historical. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Alexis Volgaris, and I rise this evening to support the proposed Neighbor to Neighbor project. I'm a seven-year uh, volunteer of Neighbor to Neighbor. My teenage son is the youth chair for the Greenwich Boy Scout Scouting for Food program taking place next month, benefiting the food pantry at Neighbor. Professionally, I'm sorry, what? Oh. Oh. Professionally, I'm a licensed clinical social worker with over 25 years of experience. I'm the current chair of the RTM's Health and Human Services Committee, which always meets upstairs, and I could never figure out on the same day at this meeting is, I could never figure out why all these boards would always come in on the same day. Now I know what, what you're doing downstairs when I'm upstairs. Um, and I also sit on the Community Development Block Grant Committee uh, with Nancy Raymer, which distributes HUD funds to local not-for-profits, and Neighbor to Neighbor has been a beneficiary of that money. Neighbor to Neighbor is an incredibly valuable resource for the community, and I don't think that's in dispute. Its current location is one reason it's so successful. There are many ways to look at the post road, but as a social worker, I tend to look at it as the corridor of care. Starting slightly west of the top of the avenue, you have the Greenwich United Way headquarters, and as you make your way further east, you have community care centers servicing low-income children, you have neighbor to neighbor, you have the YWCA, which has a domestic violence program, you have Kids in Crisis, the emergency children's shelter, you have River House providing adult daycare, and finally GEMS with its headquarters in Riverside. There are lots of valuable services for families in need on the post road, and it's important to keep these services clustered together. They're easily accessible by clients using public transportation, and it allows staff members for those organizations to easily interface and share information with one another. It's not unusual to see a first-time client at Neighbor to Neighbor arrive with his or her social worker to help a client get acclimated. Location and convenience are the keys to a successful social service program. It goes without saying that Greenwich real estate is impossibly expensive and out of financial reach for many not-for-profits. Neighbor to Neighbor has been incredibly lucky to have a wonderful partnership with Christ Church where it's been allowed to thrive and grow and serve the community at below market rate. And I literally mean below because we are in the basement at that point. <laughs> As an example of another not-for-profit looking for a new home, for many years, GEMS, our emergency uh, medical service, the ambulance service, has been trying to find a centrally located property to purchase and turn into its operational headquarters. Uh, they currently rent their headquarters on the post road. It has been impossible. That is why they stay where they are. 
I appreciate that some neighbors are concerned with additional traffic or noise associated with the proposed new facility, but I think those fears are slightly unfounded. We don't have large semi-tractor trailers delivering food, and many of the clients use the bus um, to access the program because they don't own their own cars. I would also point out that the post road is a busy, loud road. You know, today there was a fatal accident on 95. It was jail. It was just jammed up. You have trucks. You have ambulances. You have fire trucks. You have cars blowing horns, zipping up and down all day long. It's no longer a bucolic, windy road. And finally, in all my years at Neighbor to Neighbor, the times I have found it the most difficult to access the facility in terms of noise, cars, and general traffic disruption have been for events, usually high-profile funerals or memorial services taking place at either the temple or the church, and those disruptions to the immediate neighbors will continue in perpetuity since memorial services are a central function of churches and temples. I urge you all to support this plan. You are not only approving the plans for a physical building, you are allowing the fine work of, valuable of a valuable community-based not-for-profit to grow and support the neediest members of our town. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Alan Barry. I'm the commissioner for the Department of Social Services for the town. And our department uh, serves uh, the most needy clients uh, in town. Uh, basically, what we're providing are services that really the top service really is food. Uh, it remains as one of the top ranked stated needs of clients that are seeking services from us. The others are housing and health care. Uh, neighbor to Neighbor has been serving the community for over 40 years, also on the uh, Christchurch property and has established a home base from which Greenwich residents have met their food and clothing needs. In 1984, our department reached out and asked neighbor to neighbor to expand into food distribution. And since then, we've worked very closely with them. We have now enrolled over 500 families uh, that are going to neighbor to neighbor on a, on a daily basis. We've witnessed firsthand neighbor to neighbor's growth, their challenges, and their effectiveness in serving the community, not just in direct services, but also in the visibility of food insecurity as a significant issue. One of Neighbor and Neighbor's greatest challenges is its physical plant. If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the space is antiquated, it's inadequate, it's not handicap accessible, and it does not meet the standards that we would expect from a program serving the Greenwich community. The new building is designed specifically to meet the needs of the clients and blends into the existing environment. It removes the physical obstacles encountered by both clients and donors. It will be ADA compliant and have adequate storage and electricity. I understand the trepidation of the neighbors concerning the proposed change, but neighbor and neighbors listened to the concerns they raised and proposed to provide landscaping screening to preserve their privacy a stormwater management plan and drainage system designed to alleviate water issues on the property, and will move activities that generate noise concerns away from the building to the south. They're making every effort to design the project to have the least impact on their neighbors. Neighbor to Neighbor has been an integral part of serving the community at its existing site on the Christchurch property, and will continue providing services of the highest quality. The new building will match the pride that we take in having Neighbor to Neighbor as one of our premier community service providers. Neighbor to Neighbor has admirably served Greenwich for over 40 years, and I see no reason why that would change with a new building. Thank you. Uh, my name is Xiao Mei Qian. I live in Pandan Park. Actually, I'm my building is right, my room unit is right facing the upcoming proposed building. <coughs> yeah. um, I live right, I um, live in the building which is facing the proposed new building. Um, I truly believe neighbor to neighbor does help, uh, help a lot of the people in need here, but the main issue is really the location. Um, it should not, um, it's, when it's trying to help a lot of other people, it should not impact 
unnecessarily sacrifice the life of other people. Um, <coughs> um, this, uh, <coughs> I think this particular area is really hi highly popular, uh, high, uh, highly densely populated. There are several hundred families, and there are 200 in Putnam Park, uh, several hundred in Putnam Hill. It's not a, a, a small area where it's only 10, 20 uh, families. This is really several hundred families who live there. <coughs> um, and so therefore, I really uh, disagree with the notion that whoever doesn't agree with the new proposed building are selfish and um, don't want to help others. I mean, we all want to help others, but it should not really unnecessarily impact the life of um, uh, whoever, is already <coughs> whoever lives in that area. And, uh, and it's personally for me, if I hear noise in the morning, late night, I don't care, but there are a lot of people who are middle-aged, senior people in particular live in Putnam Park, Putnam Hill. I think they will, they will have a, a harder time, much harder time. If they wake up at night, they will not be able to, uh, to go to sleep. I mean, this, this is really, I feel it's really um, impact the life of a lot of people around here. Um, so I think my last question is, uh, for whoever says this doesn't really matter to the lives who live, uh, for the people who live there, what if you live right there? If you live, if you live in the building which is facing the upcoming area, and what would you think? Are you going to continue to stay there? What if you cannot have a proper same life as you used to be, do you have to force to sell your home and move away? I mean, many people cannot afford to do that. That's, that's, uh, that's my point. Thank you. Unless you have something additional to add now. If you have something additional to add, please come up. Otherwise. I'm Beverly Jomo. I'm a, a member of the mission committee of the First Presbyterian Church. Uh, we've worked with neighbor to neighbor for many, many years, and we are acutely aware of the deficiencies of the current situation. I know firsthand how, how inadequate and cramped the basement quarters have become as the client base has grown. Donors and volunteers both must navigate down a precarious and potentially dangerous staircase with huge bundles of clothing just to enter this cramped, dungeon-like space, adding more bags to the, of clothing to the existing mounds. These volunteers perform small miracles in sorting gigantic piles of clothing and getting them organized for the clients. There's never enough space, and the process repeats each and every day. The food pantry has similarly inadequate space, particularly as it relates to fresh food. There's one refrigerator freezer and room for one or two small boxes of fruits and vegetables. Beginning this very sun Saturday, our church volunteers, under the supervision of a, the local owner of Green and Tonic, uh, are ex excited to begin making healthy, fresh soups for neighbor to neighbor in the food pantry. The limited capacity of the one freezer is going to be a real concern in this project. We'll need to resupply frequently during the week. There's been an express need for more than more and better space for neighbor to neighbor for several years. Over the past five years, I've seen this vision grow from a dream to a hope, to committees and architects and specific plans and many presentations and approval. Our church is proud to have played an early role in this process. We were blessed to receive a substantial bequest from a deceased member, which was earmarked for mission work. After thoughtful review, our mission committee elected to spread the funds over four local charities and working with Partners in Health, the two projects in Haiti. It gave us enormous pleasure to be able to pledge $100,000 to neighbor to neighbor for this new building. And I'm told that this initial gift made them feel this project was really possible. I know that neighbor to neighbor has made revisions and adjustments to their plans since their last meeting with you. While I cannot speak for the entire membership of our church, I can express my hope and that of the mission committee that you will approve those revised plans. This is a vital Greenwich organization, and this move is long overdue and so necessary. The availability of the site on Christchurch property with adequate parking and bus service 
is an invaluable gift. There will be easy access to the new facility and a well thought out utilization plan for the increased indoor space. The grounds and the buffering and screening plantings will be tasteful, effective, and well maintained. Both clients and donors will be pleased with the new layout and the volunteers will be thrilled to finally have enough space to work effectively. Real storage space will finally be available and replace those ugly outdoor pods. Those of us who value the essential work of this organization feel that there is now enough community momentum to get this project fully funded and completed. I ask for your help in moving it forward. Thank you very much. How do you do, Jane Southard, S-O-U-T-H-A-R-D. I'm a resident at Putnam Park. One issue that has not been brought up, um, at the very least, I insist that a clause be put onto this proposal that there be no subleasing of cell towers as part of their plan. As neighbors, we will have no control over the cell predators coming to them and offering them leases and subleases for many thousands of dollars for a serious, for, in exchange for a serious impact on our health and well-being. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Hollister Sturgis, a resident of Putnam Park. And I think it's been very clear that uh, um, the town is most supportive of the mission of neighbor to neighbor. Uh, we need it. We want to be a caring community. And it's been made very clear that the current facility is inadequate. Um, what I do not understand, however, is uh, as Re uh, Reverend Lemner said, we want neighbor to neighbor to flourish to grow, to expand, to meet these needs, and we've heard how great the needs are, I would think that you'd want a location where there'd be potential for growth. I would think that, I just don't understand why they chose that site other than its availability. But it's not really appropriate, it's not in character in any way with the, um, the character of the neighborhood, loading docks, new generators, dumpsters, this is, uh, this is a very different kind of activity than what the residents are, are uh, expect. And to say that, you know, uh, as, I'm a, I'm li as a resident, to look out and suddenly my beautiful lawn is turned into a parking lot uh, and the view is obstructed, this is, does have a negative impact. So I would think, um, for all the eloquent words about the urgency of neighbor to neighbor, that another site could be procured. I think it's ripe for a campaign. I think the town of Greenwich would very much support something like that and an area where commercial activity can thrive and be in harmony with its neighbors would be far more appropriate. So I hate to see uh, this worthy endeavor at the expense of the residents in the area. I hate to see the green space sacrificed. Uh, I think the MacArthur Foundation talks about a uh, striving for a just, verdant, and peaceful society. Well, this is just, but I'm not sure it's increasing what's verdant and peaceful. Thank you. Uh, hi, Nancy Coughlin. I'm the executive director of Neighbor to Neighbor. I just want to address a couple of points that were made um, that are that need to be clarification. Um, the first is the SU30 turning radius. Um, that my understanding is that that's what's required under the town code for emergency vehicles. We do not have trucks that large. Um, as to the growth of the organization, we talked about this on December 8th. So very very quickly. Um, the, we are not proposing any changes to the way we qualify the clients who come to us. So the number of, of people seeking service is determined by the economy and by the number of people in need, not by the size of the building. In 2005, the church gave us additional space to expand our food pantry. We doubled our size then. We did not double our clients. Our clients, um, and we've been very transparent about this from the beginning, 
We had a big jump of cl in clients uh, during the recession. Since then, we've had between one and two percent a year. This past year, we had a four percent growth. That's um, you know what we're seeing in terms of the need. Um, the reason we need to be in town, again, very briefly, we need to be centrally located. We need to be on the bus route. What I want to point out is that we did look at a number of locations over a number of years. This is the location we chose for the re reasons that we have stated. Um, the lease, we have um, provided information about all of the relevant points, the term, the fact that um, the operation of the building will be limited to our current mission. Um, the neighbors have all of the information that is relevant. So that brings me to my last point, which is that I want all of the neighbors who are in the room to know that it was painful for us to um, have the impression left that we have not been sensitive. At every step of this process, from the minute Christchurch um, passed a resolution dedicating the property, we immediately reached out to the neighbors. We've really tried very hard to be transparent and inclusive. Um, so I just want everybody to know, everyone in the room to know, we really have taken it to heart and we've tried really hard. Um, and that's it. A question? The maximum truck size, if not 30, is what? Uh, our, we, our, the biggest truck we have now is um, 24 feet. 24 feet. Is that a commercial vehicle? That's the Connecticut oh, Food Bank truck that comes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. I, I'm, I'm sorry. This is Charlotte Walker again. I just want to, to clarify uh, respectfully to a comment that Nancy uh, Coughlin just made with respect to reaching out to the neighbors. I think it's very important to put this on the record, and I have email correspondence for everybody uh, if you'd like to see. The uh, actual first time that Christchurch and Neighbor to Neighbor reached out to Putnam Park, and I believe the same time at Putnam Hill, was on September 28, 2015, um, just before the October 7th public meeting uh, request for neighbors to come and view the plans for this building project. And that was about a week before the actual plans were filed. So uh, between, uh, actually, it was uh, October 23rd, 2014, that we, Putnam Park, reached out to Christ Church requiring uh, some information on the project. We were told at that time that Christ Church would be reaching out to us when they were ready. Well, they were ready about a year later when they were ready to file for the application. So um, it is, is just factually incorrect to state that the neighbors have been involved um, while this project has been in planning stages. It just isn't just outright not correct. Would, uh, and I'll pass around these emails. <coughs> we'll take those. Just leave them here. Thank you. Hello, my name is Megan Tabor. I'm a very proud resident of Putnam Park, and I will be very, very brief. I just want to go on the record of saying that I take great umbrage at hearing presenters tell us whose patios have not flooded, whose um, properties have not had water damage. Uh, this gentleman who said, well, you know, the back of your buildings really don't need the views that perhaps the front of the buildings do. And of course, I'm paraphrasing, but he just said this, so you know what I'm talking about. I, I'm really on record um, saying that, that um, there's quite a bit of hubris, and uh, I just want to go on record for saying that. Thank you. My name is Mark James. I'm a uh, member of Christ Church, and I am a resident of Putnam Park. And I just had one question that I wanted to bring up, which was, I believe, Ms. Raymer, last time that you were here um, in December, you asked if they would show several other locations of possibly where the building could go. And I didn't see that. So I was just wondering if that had been 
brought up or discussed with you already, or if they decided that 10 feet was enough. That's it. Thanks. Hello, I'm Casey Cherishore, and I'm a resident of Putnam Park. I've also had the pleasure of volunteering at Neighbor to Neighbor, and I have a lot of friends sitting on both sides of this room tonight. But what I'd mostly like to clarify is that how bucolic and beautiful it is in uh, Putnam Park, and that is the primary reason why I moved there. Previously, I lived in town, and I was woken up by the garbage trucks at 5, 5 a.m. every morning. I suffered from sleep deprivation, and that didn't work out very well for my students, because I'm a teacher. I bought my first home in Putnam Park and have loved it there. All I hear are the birds. And it's really been a beautiful thing. So I am your neighbor. <laughs> and this will significantly uh, change my lifestyle and where I've invested my money for my future. Thank you. What do you say, people? I hope you have something to add. Michelle DeFeo, I'm a resident of Putnam Park. And, What's your name again? Uh, Michelle DeFeo, um, D-E-F-E-O, and I'm a resident of Putnam Park, and I actually own the unit that is directly opposite the site of this proposed project. Um, and I take offense to any intimation that any objections or opposition by Putnam Park or Putnam Hill residents to this project is lacking in compassion. Is it's it's very it's very offensive, and none of us are against the mission of neighbor to neighbor. I think that's been said over and over again. Um, I just wanted to point out that Whole Foods supermarket, the proposed building for neighbor to neighbor is 6,500 plus square feet. Whole Foods supermarket is 2,600 square feet. Last September. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission ex um, approved the expansion to 3,800 square feet to allow it to expand into the variety store. Bal Balducci Supermarket in Riverside is 5,100 square feet. That's well over 1,000 square feet, less than the proposed project by neighbor to neighbor. Another reference on the scale of this project is the new Chase Bank across from the library. That's 5,240 square feet. At least a thousand, at least thirteen hundred square feet less than the neighbor to neighbor project, um, and we all drive by that. I think we all see that Chase Bank at least daily and um, kind of appreciate its magnitude <laughs> on the landscape. It's, it's quite large. Um, one of the sorry. Um, It sounds the traffic study I had gone over the traffic study that was presented by Adler Consulting. I know I said this was one point, but I can't help myself. <laughs> uh, the traffic study that was presented by Adler Consulting at the last meeting um, pretty much concedes that there really was no need for additional parking except for the volunteers and donors not having to walk a few extra feet to the building. Whether the, cons whether the structure is considered a community center or other use, only 25 to 20 parking spaces are necessary. 43 parking spaces were documented, so they already have more or less double the necessary spaces. And they want to create an additional 19 spaces for an excess of 60 spaces. If neighbor to neighbor has no plan to increase its client base, as noted in Adler's report, why do we need this additional parking? Um, there is also um, a proposal to increase the distance from the, of the building from our property line to 90 feet from 80 feet. But there's been no proposition to increase the distance of the retaining wall or the parking area, which I just pretty much demonstrated isn't necessary in the first place. Um, and that's, I mean, the other thing that Charlotte already brought up, I mean, this is um, a pretty drastic exception to be sought um, as far as zoning is concerned. And I really think that they've, um, put in issue the necessity and that the lease should be subject to um, public record and public scrutiny and review by the neighbors of Putnam Park and Putnam Hill. And that, I promise, is my last comment. Thank you. Have a
Hello, my name is Karn Crooks, C-R-O-O-K-S. Uh, I've been a resident of Greenwich since 1977 and a member of Christ Church for almost as long. I'd first like to thank all the members of the PNC Commission here for your hard work and volunteerism because that's what makes Greenwich great. And I thank you for staying here so long, waiting, <laughs> listening to us all. My background is in corporate law and American history after the date of my late husband, Bill Crooks, who was chairman of the Greenwich Historical Society for many years. I've tried to continue his work in Greenwich history by doing the research writings beginning on various topics relating to turn of the century, including the architecture of Day Old and Twachman's 25 houses in Greenwich, which I think you live in one, Mr. Levy, and early activities of the GRTA and William Rockefeller, who lived first in the site of the Whole Foods area, uh, the recent World War I exhibit, and the early history and architecture of the YMCA. I'm not an expert in all of them, but I probably am an expert than most people in uh, the town on these things. Um, as a citizen of Greenwich, I would like to address two points that have been brought up, particularly at the December 8th meeting and today. First, the use of the new facility. When Christ Church proposed lease of the new facility to neighbor to neighbor first came up almost two years ago, I was on the Ch Christ Church Finance Commission. And like in my old days of being a young corporate law associate, I went about doing due diligence on the proposed deal. I took a tour of the old facility where it is now, inspected the new site, talked to the heads of all the possible parts of the church, including the sexton, actually many of whom I've not been um, <coughs> talked to and sees, uh, that might be affected, and read the documents, asked for the financial statements, read the traffic study, was the only person I know who read the traffic study, and picked up an error in it, which Nancy then got changed, which was correct. And as well as I attended six out of the seven churches information sessions held for members of the congregation during the month of May and the special meeting to approve the concept and another information meeting this fall. I've been very pleasantly surprised by neighbor to neighbor's courteousness, honesty, and openness. Frank, a little better than Christ Church on some of these matters. <laughs> And this is not easy to say, but it's all of our church. Not everybody in Christ Church feels the same way about everything that's been said here, but we can't all be here. And there, there are a lot of different things that feel, people feel strongly about. But um, good people and good goals like neighbor to neighbor can still up, end up with not so good results. What started as an exchange of used clothing and non-perishable packaged food goods between private members of the community has obviously morphed into something much larger. It actively solicits used blankets, sheets, and towels, and during my visit to the office, they talked to soliciting diapers and other toiletries from a place like CVS. I don't know what percentage of the food is donated, but I do know that they've tried to widen and very uh, commendably the variety of healthy foods by offering frozen foods, food, fresh foods, and now we hear about fresh soup. Um, and I believe they also get some of their food from the Fairfield Food Pantry. And I suspect that um, a number of the th three commercial refrigeration <laughs> units which are part of the plant facility would be new. In short, a small food and clothing exchange seems to have morphed into a combination department store, CVS, Bed Bath & Beyond, and Roadside Mini Mart. <laughs> Further, one information meeting and David and neighbor directors' good intentions overflowed as they described offering possible vocational or social services to their clients, though they quickly drew back from that when challenged. Now, this is not to say that these goods and services are not charitable in nature or do not promote the town's interests, as been spoken about, in private good and services. Rather, it's to illustrate the broad scope of Neighbor to Neighbor's published mission, which we were told about in a recent annual meeting at Christ Church this past Sunday, that they are, their mission is to provide assistance to um, uh, those who need it, basically. Um, let's be a little bit more specific. Um, to provide basic living essentials to low-income people. This is a great mission. But it can change all the time, and who can forecast where it's going to go? The problem is we don't have a feasibility study that says what are your needs now, the scope, all these things, what is it? We don't have anything, I think, by the outside professional consultant. I don't see how you can make the, the decisions you need to do about restrictions on the activities there if you don't have more facts. Now, without these restrictions, you need a really good relationship between two neighbors. But when members of the congregation raised questions about Putnam Park and Hill's reaction to the proposed facility during the information sessions, they were told that it would not be a problem. Most recently, 
we were given an example of this sort of wishful thinking or cross signals in the past parish, the past um, annual meeting where it said that neighbor to neighbor and Christ Church have made every effort to design the project to the least have the least impact on the neighbors and has at every step of the process kept the neighbors informed of the progress on the subject. I really don't believe that this is true. And as a member of Christ Church, I feel very badly about it. I read the transcript from last time and obviously stuff is here is that so what what are you going to what can we do when this happens the further thing is that that there's some higher ups that feel that uh, Putnam is uh, just older people who are going to complain I'm nothing to do but complain <laughs> well this could be true but the point is many of here you know that one of our most courageous self-effacing hard-working and generous elderly residents who lives in this exact area on Millbank, right beside Putnam Park, walking all around town behind her walker with her crippled foot, is Georgie Ashforth. And her family has been extremely generous to the town as she. She's not the lowest income level there, but she still needs that location as an elderly person who shouldn't be driving and who, who, who needs to be close to um, the, what we have in town. This, we have a lot of elderly people in these two neighborhoods. They need assistance, just like an attention by the town and where they can live, just like the people who come to neighbor to neighbor. Further, the people in Putnam and Pill and Putnam Park may be exactly the people who are going to hire the clients of neighbor to neighbor. We are all part of one web. If we hurt one part, we're going to do another. And. Um, <laughs> But somehow we've got to make this work, and I don't know how you're going to do it. The second question uh, issue goes to land, though, and I'll just be very brief, brief that there are a number of things about this building that could be made smaller, doesn't have to be, particularly the size um, and the um, architecture are um, not necessary. They increase the, the uh, more than it needs and is incompatible with our historic district, but I think the um, HDC is going to be addressing that later. Thank you. Will they? Thank you. On the record, please. Okay. Have I missed anybody? Chairman, Howard, members of the commission, I will have a, a brief response. Uh, there's been a number of issues raised, but I want to respond to a few points that were made. Uh, <laughs> one is, I, I was just parenthetically a little confused. It, it, Whole Foods, uh, I knew it as bread and circus before. I must have shrunk uh, because I think Whole Foods is a much larger facility than, than we, we have. Uh, anyway. Uh, uh, the other point, the other point that I would I would like to make though is uh, several. One is that on page 19 of our letter to you of January 19th, we very specifically state uh, exactly how we went about trying to uh, work with Putnam Park and Putnam Hill far before what was said. I'm going to read it into the record so that everyone has it because it was a, it's very important. Uh, planning for the proposed facility with Christ Church began over three years ago at an all congregation meeting held on June 1st, 2014. Christ Church voted to extend to neighbor to neighbor an invitation to remain on the church's campus and build a new facility on a portion of its Tomes Higgins house property. The following day, uh, neighbor to Neighbors Building Committee Chairperson Pamela Kelly telephoned the management companies at Putnam Park, Putnam Hill, and One Millbank. She spoke with Hayden O'Shea, Superintendent of One Millbank, and Sharon Montanero, Putnam Hill's management company representative. She left messages for Putnam Park's property managers, Mike Marucci and Ed Davis, informing them of this news and offering to address any questions they or their unit owners may have. On Tuesday, June 3rd, 2014, Greenwich Time published an article about Christ Church invitation to neighbor to neighbor. On Thursday, June 12th, 2014, Mrs. Kelly and Executive Director Nancy Coughlin met in person with Mr. O'Shea and the One Millbank Board member Florence Holton to discuss the project and answer their questions. Leadership 
of Putnam Park and Putnam Hill did not reply. On September 28, 2015, Christ Church and Neighbor to Neighbor concluded their lease negotiations. Neighbor to Neighbor immediately distributed with their board's permission a written invitation to all residents of Putnam Park, Putnam Hill, and One Bill Bank to an informational session on October 7, 2015 to learn more about the new facility, the anticipated local approvals process, and to address any questions the residents may have. Approximately 60 residents attended the informational meeting at Christ Church's chapel, at which remarks and presentations were made by Reverend James Lemler, Mr. Alan Jackson, President of the Neighbor to Neighbor Board of Directors, Mrs. Coffin, Eric Raines, the Project uh, Landscape Architect, and Ann Campbell of Robinson and Cole, who's here tonight. There was a healthy exchange of questions and comments at that meeting. Neighbor to Neighbor offered to make his representatives available for further meetings or telephone inquiries. On October 15, 2015, at the request of Mrs. Charlotte Walker, President of Putnam Park Association, Neighbor to Neighbor hosted a follow-up meeting with Mrs. Coughlin and, and Ms. Campbell for Neighbor to Neighbor and the leadership of the three communities. This meeting was held at Christ Church and lasted approximately 90 minutes. At the meeting, the leadership requested copies of the zoning location survey, the planting plan submitted with the applications. They were sent out by my firm, Robinson & Co., on October 21st, along with additional information on the minimum required and proposed building setbacks requested by Mrs. Walker. Now, the other thing that we would like to make very clear is that, that Putnam Park and Putnam Hill are very important neighbors to us, but this is a zoning process. You have zoning regulations. There is, this is, this property of Christ Church is something that is, needs to be uh, utilized in a way that is sensitive to the needs of neighbor to neighbor and to the adjacent neighbors. That's why we have the zoning that is in place in Greenwich. And what we are doing is being sensitive to the neighbors and complying with the requirements that you have. And the, so the questions that are really before you is are we complying with the regulations? And that's really, that's really the issue. The, do we, are we serving the needs of the community? I think no one is in dispute of that. Are we in compliance with the plan of conservation and development? We respectfully submit, as we said it in our October submittal to you, that we are in compliance with the plan of conservation and development. One of the points that Attorney Doherty made was that this is really an accessory structure and should be under those rules. I would submit a special exception. This works like other principal buildings on the site. That, that is what Greenwich does in these situations. It was a special exception use, and that's what we submit we're attempting to do. So that is why we are making that. As to the parking, uh, there, we actually that parking space is that uh, field is moved five feet further back from from the neighbors. There is uh, t there's only 12 feet from their property to their property line from their building. Another 20 feet to uh, to the pavement is 32 feet. It's 103 feet to the building from the nearest point of Putnam Park. Uh, we we uh, have done an extensive landscaping plan to shield, which is what you do, what any neighbors do all over Greenwich, is you, if you are building a new building that is an appropriate use, which we submit it is, then you need to address how you're going to correspond and, and be in concert with your neighbors, and screening is the best way to do that. We have offered either intense screening that will adequately address this or offense if that's what they prefer. What, I, what I'm hearing is they simply do not want the building in this location. I, I get the point, but that is something that we submit. This is an appropriate location for the building as long as we address the real and substantive issues such as drainage and such as uh, screening and protection adjacent to each other. I think that's what we as, and our consultants are attempting to do as uh, clearly and carefully as we possibly can. I think that the, 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 the use of the building, I mean, the use has been right next door for 40 years. We need to expand the use 
to a new building so that we can meet the current need of the, faci the facility. It's, it is outgrown. The current need is impossible to meet right now. And that's, that's why this building <coughs> is there. But the, 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 as I said before, the parking requirements, if you were to take this and just apply strict zoning and not the, uh, the, the uh, way we are coming in, would be for 20 spaces, not, not 19 that we've provided. So uh, we think that these points are all uh, important for the Commission to consider. Another point that was made by uh, 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 Attorney Kloberg was that they have a, they want to keep the hearing open because they want an engineering report from SE Minor. Now, we submitted the application oct middle of October. We had a hearing on December 8th. They, they, they've known about this a long time. We've had our engineers responding to numerous issues, we submit that at this point, we think you have adequate information to consider and send this to the next step, to the final plan. Their engineering report can certainly come in and be applicable to that when you, when you have a vote that is actually going to be, you know, yay or nay. And, and we can address those engineering concerns that if, if there are any, that they might raise between now and that time. There, so there's no need to keep this hearing open for that purpose. So we, we ask that you close this part of the proceeding on the preliminary. I think you've gotten a lot of information and then vote it through to the next stage and then we can address all those concerns that have been raised that the commission may still uh, want more information about. Have you, have you scheduled your meeting with the Zoning Board of Appeals yet on the yes, special it's, exception? It's, yes, it's uh, set for February 24th. Okay. Uh, and at, at that time, the matter of use nope. of this Right. That's be, correct. That special exception is going to go before them, yes. Right. Um, I have a, uh, a basic procedural uh, piece on that, which was raised by both councils in opposition. Uh, which is um, the section 694 issue they raised. And um, I think that it appears from 694 um, one B. B in parens, uh, sub one of that, um, that they are correct. Uh, and that it says, um, that um, a special permit has to be used, not a special exception. So it's a, it, the special exception provision covers churches. It does not cover philanthropic or charitable institutions. And it appears that this is a, that this is a special permit matter. So, um, the, I think that procedure, as articulated by the zoning enforcement officer, uh, is not applicable. That, uh, and also in our staff report, because this section clearly says to the contrary. So it's philanthropic or charitable institutions, not of a penal or correctional, excuse me, or <coughs> correctional nature, nor for the care of insane or feeble-minded patients provided that any building so permitted shall be located not less than 100 feet from any street or lot line. So, um, and, and there's a limitation on that. We can consider a lesser distance if there's no adverse impacts um, on the prop adjacent property owners. But, um, so clearly there's been a, a bit of a, they are before but, us for special permits. Yes, and but, so the, that's fine, but the special exception does not appear to apply because it's not a church um, activity. It's a, it's a charitable. charitable activity. So it's just us. I don't think <coughs> it goes to ZBA, but I do think there is a 100-foot distance to the lot line. Um, I, I, um, well, Mr. I Smith, yeah. along those lines, you did submit a Zoning Board of Appeals 
a request for special exception. Yes, but yes, we did. I understand that that was an amendment to the approval for the Tomes Higgins House. So perhaps to Mrs. Raymer's point, you could address what you think the use is of Tomes Higgins and why you're applying for an amendment to that approval, and also what you would define the use of neighbor to neighbor as. Well, the, so the the application before the uh, zoning board of appeals for the special exception use. It's if you if you look at 694 a five churches and educational institutions not operated for commercial profit. Yeah, there's that. That. Yes. that, but that isn't this function. This function is not a church function. The applicant is neighbor to neighbor with the approval of the church. And the application is by a not-for-profit, a charitable. I mean, that's it's that's it's, it's classification. It is not a church. Well, here we go. hold on. I mean, this does this doesn't create an insurmountable problem at all. I don't mean to be no, serious. No, no, I, I know, it's I, just a process question. Yeah, um, no, I think and, what the, 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 but the, and, the process and. is that we would go before the Zoning Board of Appeals, which we, which we are applying for, to say that this is a special exception use that they would allow. Now, they may say no, which in which case you are, we, we would come back but, to, but this, to, the, to this exactly hundred, what you're talking about. This 100-foot limitation, yes. I think you need to address. That's really the concern. If you wish to use an additional process, your special permit, I mean, that's... You know, you're not covered under church. That's what I'm trying to be clear about. This is not a church application. It is a charitable application. That's fine. We have, you've already filed a special permit. Right. But you have, according to this language, a 100-foot requirement to the property line. And I, I, I guess the, in the regulation read, unless the commission finds a lesser distance. Yes, but yeah. unless it requires that there be no adverse impact on the neighbors. I, That's the question. Right. Well, we, we, the other thing we applied for was for the ZPA to make the determination of the use so that I mean, if, they, if they say that this is correct, that we, we've applied under this before you. Yes. Yeah, we, well, we, and I'm not, not disputing that. But we have asked the ZBA to make a determination of the use. So I guess we would have to take that up with them. If they say something different, then we will come back to you. So that 100-foot limitation is, is in the reg. So yes, unless, unless the commission finds in consideration right. a particular use. So yes. are you arguing that, you're, that this is a primary use, that it's not accessory? Yes, primary, yes. Okay, and that's yeah. going to be your argument to ZBA? Yes, it's a, that it's a primary use, well, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm happy you pointed that out. Well, I didn't point it out. I take no credit. Well, you picked it up. Opposing. You deserve the credit anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's do this now, because I think, uh, I think everything is on the table now. And... Uh, for you folks now, our procedure is we have some other applications to review tonight, uh, which we will proceed to do. And then after that, uh, we'll make a decision on what to do with the preliminary application. We may not make a decision tonight, but we may decide whether or not they should proceed to final. But again, there's no final decision tonight. That's the important thing to tell you people. Okay? Mr. Chair, well, may I ask, is, is the applicant willing to give an extension because it is a must close this evening and if there's a question of use, it may you may decide in your discussion that you would like to have the applicant provide you more, with more information on this question about use to this commission as opposed to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Yes. And if you're willing to give an extension, we, we, could, we could address this at a future meeting. They've asked us to keep, leave it open. Somebody in the we may, we may, I, I guess I it's a it's a, a question of, of whether you want to keep the hearing open or not. I guess we I don't, and I don't know what the, about the open. until you decide. I mean, we so we you may keep it open. To give an extension yeah, if the would, obviously depending on what you're saying, we would make a decision. Right be, now. Okay, thank folks. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming. Let's take a uh, ten minute break. This is 15 Deer Park Meadow Road, final site plan and special permit.
Oh, okay. Color picture? I got two. You got two, give me one. <coughs> Peter Fear. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Tony DeAndrea, and I'm representing Tom Priori, who's the owner of 15 Deer Park Meadow Road. We were here before you on January 12th, as you recall, and at that time, while we discussed the merits of the application, I generally agreed that um, all the application materials relative to area, um, floor area, building height, and setbacks were all in compliance with the regulations. The issues that the uh, commission was concerned about at that time concerned um, the, the um, provision of a detailed landscape plan, which has been provided for the record to the staff, and in, I believe it's in your packet. I've given you a color copy of the of the latest plan presented, um, developed by Craig Studer, um, the landscape architect. The other issues you were concerned about were to show two, uh, four trees that are along the westerly boundary outside of a, of a stone wall. Um, those have been added to the development plans for your review. There was a question about utilities being shown. They were always on the original site plan, but to um, for the record, they are on the plan, they were on the plan, and they should um, be part of the discussion tonight. Um, at that time, you also asked for some additional information from DPW and the sewer. We've um, resolved all of the issues with DPW. I think you should have a memo to that effect. Um, the other issue that remains outstanding, I believe you'll hear testimony from other people, but I will suggest that we've been um, in um, a variety of conversations, emails, and meetings with the sewer department. And as of 3.31 this afternoon, I believe you have been provided with a copy of a email from Mr. Richard Feminello, who is the director of the wastewater division. He's the wastewater division manager. He's a professional engineer. Um, his concerns have been relative to maintenance of the sewer and the location of the sewer. In his latest email dated today at 3.31, um, he indicates in the email, as I have stated previously, the proposed sanitary sewer relocation as you have drawn and submitted for the proper easement is acceptable. He went on to suggest that he had considered other options. He understands um, why all of those other issues associated with that um, interest. He understands the issues why we're opposed to that, and I'll explain them to you in a few moments. So his concern remains that there be um, sufficient access for maintenance, repair, and or replacement in the future. And that's a key statement. And I'm going to show you a plan that's going to be mentioned later on, I'm sure, which is a suggested route of a sanitary sewer through the middle of this property. And as you know, we have indicated on the plans the appropriate way to develop this property with the sanitary sewer relocated to the western and southern boundaries of the property. And on the, on the board now, I've, I have indicated for you the proposed route of the sewer along the westerly side and along the southerly side. Pursuant to our discussions with the commission at the January hearing, we enlarged the easement width for the purpose of um, enabling us to move the sewer as far away from the trees that are located along the westerly boundary of the property, which um, some neighbors had expressed interest in. Did Those you, trees are fully located within the, um, the Priori property. They are not on the adjacent property. Did you uh, hear our comments from briefing yesterday? I've about heard some of them, yes. How wide is a typical sanitary easement? The sanitary sewer easement typically is 10 feet wide. We've made this 30 feet wide, and you want to know why. Well, the reason no, is... No, but what we requested is that 10-foot easement be moved to the 30-foot line as shown, and the balance of the 20 feet be a no-build zone. Fine. That's fine. But in reality, having a wider easement is good. Why? Because well, it gives you access for equipment should you need to be there. Except that... the Richard won't let you plant in an easement because it, it, of he's protecting it. Right. So okay. I think if you put it, the sewer in the 10-foot easement and Fine. have a 20-foot no build, you can then landscape it, and we don't have to have Mr. Felinella say that you can't plant. We have no objection to that. It's not, it's not something that we would um, argue about. However, 
the width of the easement with a restriction of 20 feet, that's fine. I don't care. It's, it makes no difference to us. No, but it's good for us because the, the stone wall that, that right. is, in the, is in the western part of it would be included in that no build thing. And so fine. it just cleans up, I think, a lot of stuff. Fine. We, we would have no problem making a 10 foot wide easement um, starting or holding the eastern 30 feet. That, that's no problem. The eastern and northern lines hold them. Yes, and make 10. That's fine. What you understand what happened, of course, is that in the event that you ever needed to get there, which I think is a very unlikely situation, um, you would have to be working within 10 feet. That's fine. We don't, we don't have any objection to that. So moving toward that goal, then, what we've been able to do is provide the area for the landscaping, which Mr. Studer has aptly done with a dense um, um, screening proposal for Norway spruces and, and arborvitaes interspersed so it, it accomplishes, the, accomplishes the objective of um, protecting the neighbors from the view of this home. The other issue I want to bring to the attention of the commission is that we're here having this discussion about the sewer simply because it, originally the sewer line ran diagonally across the lot. It was obviously installed when it didn't matter where the sewer line went. But the problems that have arisen because of the location of the sewer within the middle of a property have to be addressed. The red line indicates what has been suggested by others as a proposal that could be considered reasonable. It's not reasonable. And the reason it's not reasonable is, or is, should be obvious. We have to come diagonally across the property in the front of a, a proposed home. Along that route, we have um, required drainage structures. We have a driveway. We have utilities for electric, telephone, gas, water. Those would all have to be encumbered if we were, or affected if we were in any way, shape, or form having to get to that for some kind of access. And I don't think anybody on the commission would consider it reasonable or practical to encumber the property with a 10-foot wide easement across the middle of the property. In addition, the proposal would significantly jeopardize a tree at the corner of the, of, of the um, property on Deer Park Meadow Road, whereas our proposal comes down along the westerly side and southerly side without any impact on trees. So I'd like to just put that to, to rest and eliminate it from the discussion as in any way practical in this situation. Now. Mr. D'Andrea? Yes. In that email that you spoke about. Yes. Um, I believe there were two questions asked of you um, because uh, Mr. Feminella seemed to um, be very focused uh, on this as well as his last report to us on the difficulties of getting a particular kind of clean out truck. Right. So he basically seemed to be saying that it was impossible to get that truck um, up to the back of your property. And um, I will so respond. he wanted to know if you want, if your client wants to undertake the cost of doing the <coughs> annual maintenance. Right. I think that was the question. At, 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 um, at the late date that I received this, I was unable to contact my, my client. But I would have to think that um, he would be reasonably agreeable to such a condition because, in my opinion, there's very little chance that we're going to need to do any maintenance on this. But okay? Isn't there a, hasn't there been an ongoing problem in this private area with this sewer line? Not, not that I'm aware of, no. Yeah. And the only problem would be in the fact that this existing line is a clay tile pipe problem. running through the middle of the property. That's the problem. That's now, the problem. in response to access that Mr. Uh, Feminel, excuse me. I'm sorry. His memo to us back on January 29th mm -hmm. said, I quote, as this is a private sanitary sewer main that is maintained by the private neighborhood association and not the town. So how come this is being raised as an issue by him and his truck has to get in there if the maintenance of this is by the uh, Deer Park Association? I would say that Mr. Feminel is a very knowledgeable man but also very conservative. And, and there's access to this sewer from several directions. The only thing you would want to do here is inspect it and you have access from the street on the northwest corner of Deer Park Meadow and the lot. So you have that whole line is access accessible. 
Similarly, from the proposed manhole in Woodside Road, you would have access into that for inspection. In the event that you had to clean the pipe, which is unusual, but if you had to clean it, um, you would flush it from the, from the northwest corner. And then if you had to remove a blockage, you could come in from the Woodside Road. And just for the record, the way you clean a pipe. done by the private association? Yes, sir. Oh. Yes, and there's companies that do that. And if the pipe has to be cleaned, they use a, a jet. Um, pipe and what that is it has a basically an umbrella of, of nozzles at the end of the pipe the water is forced through and when you have to clear a blockage you don't push it forward you pull it out so you run the tube in you jet the, the, the material down and you pull it out so the water constantly flows out but that's the way it would be uh, done is there anybody so here from the association by the way there may be yeah. So, okay. Mr. D'Andrea, just to clarify this for us, yeah, you're saying Mr. Feminella is conservative. Um, By the fact that he wants to have a truck get to the middle manhole. But he says that it's because of the flatness of the line and that the pitch of the line will be even flatter right. once it's the longer. Difference, and the that, wait, 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 yep. let me finish. And that we, we have to do this to each other yes. all the time. Um, and. So he's saying it's going to be a, is it a particularly flat line? I don't know enough about sewers and we were trying to ask that yesterday. Mm -hmm. Is this pitch, where does it fall in the norm? <laughs> I don't know, Nick, do you know? What? I'm the engineer, I'll answer the question. I'm sorry, I asked the question yesterday and nobody, we didn't know. I'll answer know. the question. If you were to consider the options of the yellow line, which is the, what we're proposing, or the red line, the difference in length is 45 feet. It's not a significant number in the computation. If you were to take the, the slopes, you would figure 0.6% or 0.6%. They're the same. Okay, that's not what he says. If you were looking to do ideal situation, you would look to try to maintain a steeper slope, but we don't have that option. You don't have the option under the existing conditions, and we don't have the option in the What's proposed. What's a normal slope? The normal slope is designed by in, to respond to the volume, okay? So if you have a large volume, you What's could have a, a flatter slope. What's a normal slope for a line the normal slope, this volume? The normal slope that you would have would be trying to maintain a two feet per second um, velocity in the pipe, okay? And what would the slope be? I don't know, because it has to be, it relates to the volume and, and the um, and But the for this diameter. site, what would the normal slope be? The normal slope would be about 0.6 percent. Okay, so 0.6 feet per foot. I mean, the reason being, Mrs. Alvin, is because you can't change the beginning and end point. So it's it's not it doesn't matter what okay. ideally would be. I'm sorry, I asked the question wrong. I'm gonna for the volume generated at this site. Mm -hmm. If you were not on this property, what slope would you do? Normal plumbing codes re suggest a 2% slope, quarter inch per foot. It's unattainable at this location, so it's immaterial. Um, it is what it is. Okay, but Mr. Fluminella okay. said that standard practice would require the association in writing to approve this plan. The attorney from Mr. Priori disagrees with that. This is a private. Um, I, sewer I right now. That. I understand that, but Mr. Feminel is the guy who's going to give a permit, and he says that standard practice, he said the same thing in his uh, report to us of the 29th. So um, it seems that although he, I, I understand conceptually that he says what you're proposing is technically fine. Th that's but he's correct. He's also saying there are two problems. He thinks this thing, because of where it comes from and where it goes to, it's not just on this property, uh, is going to need flushing, and he doesn't think a truck can get back there. Um, but if you're saying on the record that your client will undertake all repairs and maintenance on your lot, um, that will probably have significant. Yes, Mrs. Raymer, that would have to be, you know, um, agreed to by my client. As I said at 331, I haven't had a chance to discuss yep. that. On the other hand, as Mr. Uh, Maitland pointed out, this is a private sewer. It's maintained by the private association, mm -hmm. and Mr. Feminel is not involved in it. It's not his responsibility. Well, so, so what we've done here is take a private sewer, 
without an easement of record mm -hmm. and moved it to a reasonable location within the client's property. And that's the appropriate way to handle this unusual or unique situation. And this is a good design, it's a good plan, and it addresses all of the potential problems. We have access. Now, just in response to the physicality of moving a truck onto the property, this is just a lawn. You're gonna drive across the lawn on a um, very modest slope for the, for the property and be able to get to the manhole. Mr. Feminola asked us to adjust the grading around the manhole so we'd have a staging area. More than happy to do that. To that he point. He's talking about he's going to have a staging area, but he won't have a staging area. But the town of Greenwich is not going to be in here cleaning this pipe if it ever needs to be cleaned. Is my understanding. Sorry. Oh. It's, well, it is now. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, again, I go back to the fact that the town of Greenwich is not going to be cleaning this pipe. Correct. It's going to be done by the association yes, or sir. by the property owner or somebody, but not the town of Greenwich. Right. On a 10-foot wide easement, you can certainly maneuver a truck. Yes, sir. I, I truly don't understand unless you've got no, the, driver who's a little wobbly. No, the idea is that the 10-foot the easement, if you had to do any digging, which comes under the... Um, repair, replace, or maintain, you would like to have more room. We just did it as convenience to make it wider so that we could show everybody there's just plenty of room to move the sewer and meander around trees if necessary. But the 10 foot is what's typically required by Mr. Feminella. Okay, I think we should keep the 10% because I think that- I agree it, with that. It supports the, 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 the walls and it supports the trees. Yes, sir. There's not a lot of air spading and all the other stuff with Correct. tree roots and it's, it's, a, it's more reasonable. Further, I mean, since this is, a, as you say, a unique situation, I assume that the association and the owner of this property are gonna have to come to some agreement. Yes, sir. On either, the property owner is gonna have to maintain it from catch or, or uh, manhole to manhole, or there'll be, I mean, there has to be some. If I were Mr. Priori, I don't want anybody on my you'd property. you probably say, I'll okay. take care of it. Right. And I, the association would probably say thank you very much. It right. saves us some. And the inspection, Mr. Maitland, can be done from off-site. They have every right to come in and inspect the pipe from the manholes on the on the common ground. You can come in from the from the east and and, right. and do the south line. You can come in from the north and do the west line. Right. If it turns out that it needs to be maintained and it's causing a problem, then the association and Mr. Priori can come to agreement. I don't think we have to encumber this any more. Um, than necessary. Mr. May, Mr. Um, Feminella recognizes that what we did is appropriate under the circumstances. There are always other ways to do it. The other ways are not appropriate because you would require a 10-foot easement across the front of a property. The reason we're here tonight is because of the easement through the middle of the, of the lot. I, I tend to agree because Thank you, I, sir. I think his final statement is proposed location as you have drawn and submitted is an acceptable proposed location. Right. With a proper easement. Well, yeah, that's it. I'm, yeah. I'm more to the location. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, so the line you've drawn is it's been accepted, if you will, uh, by Mr. Feminella. Yes, sir. And we had a meeting. I had a personal meeting with him last Friday at 11 o'clock. We were supposed to have had a representative of the, of the association okay. there. Unfortunately, <clears throat> he was unable to make and came earlier, so I don't the know what their discussion was. But in our case, we had, a, we had a meeting of the minds. Uh, well, there's simply the question. Mr. Feminella left outstanding at the end of his email today two questions it and he made the point that practice remains that the association has to approve before he will issue a permit so you know that's the next question is to ask. May, may i just co comment that one more time Normally, if we were taking a new sewer and connecting it to an existing sewer that was part of the common um, holdings of the roadway or the association, that would make sense because you would want to know that there was capacity in the line. What we're doing is taking the existing line and moving it. There is no recorded easement, and therefore we have a right to move it within our property. And therefore we don't need the association's approval. 
He says you do. And he's wrong. He's not the attorney involved, and there's no easement right now. So, uh, are you, so are you, are you representing? My opinion, he's wrong. So you're representing on the record that the property owner, if they can't work out a, a, situa a deal with the um, association, the property owner will take the responsibility for the maintenance of the pipe. Is that what you're representing? If I were the owner, I would say that was reasonable But as the owner's representation, we let the yes, sir. Talk to the Some, owner so he doesn't have to that yet. Come on well, up. Then, I know. Yeah. The, 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 as Mr. Maitland pointed out in, in closing on my part right now, and I'll have a chance to respond, but it, as Mr. Maitland pointed out, the association, unless they stand up and say otherwise, they are in, in, um, they are in part responsible for the maintenance of the roads and the sewers and the drains. I understand that. Therefore, this is no different. Let the association come on Yes, up. sir. Come on up. Uh, thank you. Rama Subramanian for the Deer Park Association, S-U-B-R-A-M-A-N-I-A-M. -A -A um, let me start with the, the positives. Um, the landscaping plan is uh, acceptable to the association. We think the, the choice of plants, the variety, uh, the heights uh, has shown, um, you know, consultation and, and uh, you know, we, we like the privacy that it's affording uh, the neighbors. Before I get to the sewer, uh, related to the landscaping plan, uh, there were a couple of trees that were missing from the landscaping plan. I believe that those have now been updated on your plan. Um, we are very keen to see those trees preserved, um, even though they are, uh, they, they, I think the neighbor would dispute that they're all ex on the, totally on the Priori property, but Can, which, can you identify those trees that are important to you? Yeah, just take it and go to the, okay. Oh, wow. It's, it's the um, one, two, three, the four trees on the western boundary and those three in the corner there. Those are all being shown to be preserved. Yeah, so we're very keen to ensure that they're preserved. The last part on the landscaping plan is the um, original Rockefeller wall. Yep. On the southern boundary, it is a part, it's a shared wall, so I don't think that's an issue. Um, it's not a shared wall on the western boundary and I can't remember the section number for special planning but there's something about look and feel and that's, historical. That's, that's the one, that's the reason that we've asked to have the uh, easement narrowed. Right. So that the, we'll keep this wall that will be preserved since there'll be no construction in that area. That I, I get the no construction part, I don't know whether that preserves it though in terms of can it just be taken down for example. Well, preserving would it, it, mean you know, not taken down. He but wants I, it mandated that it not be taken down. That's what he's asking. That's all. I think uh, we'll, we'll hear from Mr. DeAndre in a minute. It was my understanding that that wall in some places needs repairs. Now, I don't know, but, but uh, have you inspected the wall? Uh, yes, I, I do agree that some places that it needs. It needs repairs. Yeah, so it's, a dry, it's a dry wall, I think. To that or yeah. The, the trees are obviously crucial for the yes. neighbors. Well, that's why we yeah. want to. That's why we're trying to get the sewer located as far away from them as possible. Yeah. So, uh, moving on to the sewer, I think you know I sent an email which I copied the owner's representative on as well, just to be transparent. Uh, I think there are a couple of concerns. First of all, related to the trees, the the advice that we're getting from our arborist, the care of trees that does the association's trees, is that. Um, we think the linden is probably a goner, which is the which is a large tree on their property, but not one of those four on the boundary. Of the four on the boundary, the the, the northernmost tree drip line is about 36 feet in, uh, so we think that'll be quite heavily impacted. Uh, the other tree, uh, the other next tr three trees are probably more like a 26, 28 foot drip line. I understand that this is about 17 foot in. Um, similarly, for the trees on the southern boundary, again, the advice is that the drip line is about 24, 26 feet, and I think it's about 17 feet in as well. So one of the issues with the proposed routing is uh, the impact on trees. Now, I know people have commented about the other trees being cut down. The association hasn't because we appreciated that the footprint of the house required some very significant trees to come down as well, but we are very keen to protect the trees that are left. I think more importantly on the sewer, um, a couple of points. One is the current slope is about 0.75%, so it is 
pretty flat already, and we have engaged with Wooded and Curran, the sewer engineers on our side. Um, this proposal would reduce it to about 0.55%. That's what you have in your note, yeah. Yeah, which is... Is that what you're saying? It'll be flatted by, as, as Mr. DeAndrea said, it'll start and end at the same place. It goes diagonally across. Any alternative will be longer. Right. Right, and therefore less slope. Um, it will therefore require regular cleaning, we think, and jetting, uh, because it will be pretty flat. Now, my understanding, I'm not an expert, but I've been told by Woodard and Curran, when you jet or vacuum um, uh, a sewer line, you need to do two things. One is locate the truck near the manhole, and the other is you jet upstream and pull downstream, right? So the correct way to do the cleaning in the proposed setup would be jet uh, westward from Woodside and jet northwards from that corner, meaning you need to get a truck into that corner. Else, yeah. Um, we don't think you can jet from, the, from uh, Deer Park Meadow down, or you should not. It's not best practice. <coughs> um, so we can access Woodside. We can't access that corner. So between the impact on the trees and the lack of access on what's a relatively flat sewer, that, that's been the concern that the association has had. I understand what Mr. Feminella is saying about what we're proposing coming across, but what that does is all the manholes are now accessible to trucks and on Deer Park land. So, but the 10-foot easement provides truck access to that corner manhole, and <laughs> Yeah, but it it's, it's, they, it's completely... The gives them access to that manhole for service. Yeah, but, you know, you've got a house here, driveway. This is all going to be planted up by the landscape plan. You're not allowed to plant on the easement. That's what we talked about at the beginning. The easement is for the accessibility to that manhole. And it's not perfect, but it, you're allowed to drive a truck there. That's what Mr. Falmanella was pointing out. It's not, they can't plan in it. You've got a 10-foot clear path to drive to that manhole for service. Right, but you'd be driving a truck right across someone's property. But that's what the easement allows you to do. No, but they don't have an easement. The the, 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 they're offering an easement. They have. That that's part of the condition is there's an easement that we were talking about. Yeah. So our concern is access to that. Right. Uh, and who would, you know, make good, there'll be some obvious damage to the garden every time you do that, um, as well as the impact to trees, whereas the proposal is, you know, I understand it runs across the front, but it wouldn't require access to the property apart from repair and replacement. Cleaning would be done off the property because of where the manholes would be located. And, I, and last point is I disagree about the utilities because even with this proposal, it pops out on Woodside. The utilities run, as, as far as I know, along the, um, the west side of Woodside Road. So whichever way you do it, you're going to have to pop out somewhere, and that's where you cut across. It, they're not down the road as far as we know on this side of the road. So um, I think the utilities are shown over here. So it's whenever you pop out onto Woodside, you're going to have to go across those utilities. But you know, I, I understand I'm the easement. When you print an easement, that 10-foot strip, strip of land through the front yard can't be planted. And it has to be accessible. So you really can't put driveways over it, and you can't do other things because... That's what an easement allows you to do. But they're not going to need an easement. If it's yeah, they do. It goes across the property line. So you have to have an easement for maintenance and okay. digging up the line. Oh, you're saying if they have to do it. So, so regardless of the path, there is a 10-foot easement strip that is 5 foot on each side of the sewer line. And I think that the way I understand it, I'll let Mr. DeAndre explain it, but that easement would, whether it goes along the property line on the west and south side or diagonally across the front, there is a no build detailer. And I don't know how, if that was my property, that would be a 
tough thing to sell to me. Um, yeah, no, I understand. Um, I would need to come back and speak to the engineer. My understanding from speaking to the engineer and lawyer was it would be a very limited easement given that we don't need to access for any maintenance. It would re literally be a repair, replace, which would be, you know, the problem with that one is you do need to maintain it quite regularly and, and access that manhole. I kind of feel we're trapped here in the, yeah. in the middle of a, of a private... And the impact on trees, obviously. ...of, of a association. You're right. And of an owner. And I think until they, I, I think somehow, I don't want to be in the middle of that scrap. <laughs> I don't think we should be in the middle of that scrap. That, that's really outside of what we do. Well, I, th I think that, that that should come back to us when this is resolved. I, I think there's... And let me come back to just, you know, on the concerns, the, the concerns you raised, it's where do you come out based on some of the stuff we said back? And if I look at the attachment to the email that you sent in, the copy that you sent us, um, the guy who looked at the, the effect on the trees, what he said to you was that when they do the trenching that they use an air spade. And we can condition that. We can make them, we can say they have to use an air spade and protect those trees so that they don't cut the roots. And the roots should be the same, the spread of the roots should be the same as the canopy. So we can do that. Um, we can get you the access for the maintenance because that's been agreed to. What concerns would you have left? Is it possible that we can sort of do something Solomonic here? Because yeah, I, I think I think that 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 goes a long way if we can get you know more comfort on the trees given the loss to to date uh, and preserving them and doing the best to preserve them. Um, I think in relation to that manhole, it's not just access. I think we would want to um, get the owner to agree to clean that that to do when, when the association jets from there that they, they'll jet up because you know I think having an easement is great but we will there'll be damage and there'll be costs getting into the garden and what mr. DeAndrea told us is that he if he that he didn't know whether or not the owner would agree to that so we could we have to wait and see what his applicant, his I mean, client says. He can says. report back to us at the beginning of our next meeting. Yeah. So if if his if his client agrees to that, then I think we've set we can fix every outstanding issue and get to the Solomonic solution. Maybe kind of split the baby, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think from an association perspective, you know, look, we want we want the redevelopment to happen. Make no doubt about it. We've okay. got an empty plot of land. We're not trying to stop redevelopment. We think the landscaping plan is adequate. We want to protect those trees. We want to try and protect that wall. And we want to come up to, with a workable solution for a sewer line um, that allows appropriate maintenance um, and protects the trees, right? That's what we're trying to get. That's to. what you're trying to get. I so think, since I think that today we got a, the final memo from uh, uh, Mr. Feminella, and as Mr. DeAndrea said, he hasn't had a chance yet to discuss this with his, with his client. So. Uh, if Again, I think it, if, if those are your three concerns, and I gather that the last concern is that the owner would have to maintain the sewer on his property. Yeah. Is that what that was? Uh, no. Is that what was being only said? There's one neighbor as well that would like to speak, but um, from an association perspective, only yeah. the that's access it. from that one manhole in the corner. Yeah. That's the part that you're saying that you would want him and you could hammer that out. That's right. And then I think. Um, you know, obviously engaging with our arborists to make sure right. that trenching is done in as and in as sensitive a way as possible. My own experience is people, we tell people this stuff and everybody makes promises, but if you keep your eyes open during construction, it's always really helpful. Necessary. Right. Necessary would be the word, yes. Is but anybody, if that uh, settles everything, then all we need is for hmm. Mr. DeAndre to talk to his client and I guess to hear from the neighbor. Yeah. Record. On the record, sorry. Please come up. Uh, my name is Nicole Reese. Uh, I can speak on behalf of the owner that we would uh, agree to those conditions of having to maintain um, that manhole jet streaming when needed. Great. Oh. Okay. All right. 
And can you, do we know that she has legal standing? Yes. Yeah, what, I'm um, sorry ma'am, what's your legal standing relative to the owner? And do you have something in writing from the owner? I, mean, uh, I don't have something in writing from the owner. I can provide that to you. Um, and I am the owner's rep. I'm the, okay. the construction manager for the uh, building of the home. So we could. Well, Mr. DeAndre is the authorized agent. Is the so problem. we could if well, if they uh, submit something, we could just leave it no, open. But if this, since Mr. DeAndre is the is the authorized rep, she can tell him. She can just tell him, and he can repeat it and put it on the record, right, and then we're done. <laughs> okay, and word it really specifically so we know exactly what. Well, no, it's just that the owner will maintain it. But she's, she, but I, think what the, I think what the association is asking for, the expense of inspecting the pipe to be borne by the owner. No, the jetting. And if necessary, the jetting of the line from the, along the westerly side. And what you have to think about is just doing this on a regular basis. If you see a problem, you clean it. You don't have a problem. You don't need a, a I mean, truck. Um, I think the jetting has to be from that back corner in both directions. Mrs. Raymer, if, if there... If you're doing a regular maintenance inspection, you'll be able to um, uh, stop the problem before it occurs. So right. the idea is do a regular inspection, and if necessary, the owner of the property will be responsible for jetting the western side or the um, from north to south. That way he can provide his own access, if necessary, to the manhole. What's wrong with his being responsible along both no it's state. fine. Um, we'll do the inspection. The it, I will, on behalf of the owner, we can accept that condition that oh. he will do the yearly inspection and, if necessary, clean it as it um, yep. goes along. Do us a favor. Come back, talk to him again because you also mentioned yes. arborists. Yes, we also had an arborist. Originally, um, the arborist that was representing the association to, I, said I that the tree was a. Caitlin's comment is correct. Yes, sir. When you no, but I think we might have gotten. We got I, it. I think we got. Yeah, we're, we're in good shape. I think, I think we got over that hurdle, but. Right. Sorry, but I want, I'm still not sure of the association. The, the association is in charge of the infrastructure throughout the roads. On behalf of the owner right now, we've offered that we will inspect the sewer on a regular basis Year and, if necessary, clean it I, I at his to. expense because it's obviously to his benefit not to have people traipsing through his property. Mr. Sub okay. If I could ask Mr. Subramanian to come back up. Mr. Subramanian, the is is the jetting along the west side sufficient for the homeowners association or do you want what mr deandre said he'd do the whole thing yeah. he, he said he'd do said the that. whole thing he did. It. but it's he what he asked. he's telling the truth it's what he asked for no, yeah no I, to be to be honest i i asked for the west side because you jet We're upstream the west side yeah so you know that we we review and maintain the the rest of the sewer system we can jet um westward from woodside okay so you just want the west side of the property done yeah perfect okay anybody else have any comments good evening everybody i'm david darst rama subramanian has been the president of deer park for one year i was president of deer park for seven years okay and i've been there for 35 years now um the chief concern is the little children who live on the adjacent property and having this sewer. You're telling me the slope is very moderate. And you're going to have to get in there all the time with trucks and you got sewage laying there accumulating. And that just, I think, is a very distressing thing to, the, to my daughter and to her three small children who are near there with trucks and with sewage backing up. So there's just a, a health issue and a safety issue that comes into this. And that's why I just want to make sure that the yeah. sewage line is put in a place that's not going to need that. And right now it's Deer Parks. But I don't believe personally, based on 35 years of living there, that it's always going to be Deer Parks. Because the stuff is coming. You got three houses. You heard it the last time we discussed this. You got three houses feeding into a line that's designed for one house. And it's low slope, so you're going to have backups. So uh, I, I don't accept that everything's fine and everything's in a Donald Trump perfection, okay? Meaning it's because it says it is, it is. It isn't. So where is this thing going to be uh, that's going to keep it away from ruining the trees that 
people say, Arbor Vitae or not, that's not replacement of what came in. And you tell me you can clear cut these trees and then because we've clear cut these trees, we got to protect the other trees. Therefore, we can't take the sewer over there. So you've made, you've broken one aesthetic and moral rule, but because you have now we, to, to preserve that rule, we're going to have to keep the sewer uh, and not take it along the street. So I'm not sure I go along with the placement of the sewer. And I'm not sure I go along with the screening. It's, arborvitae is not, I've got, I've talked to foresters and arborists. It's, it's a cheap halfway, and I don't think it blocks the uh, load of sunlight that's going to be reflected off the back of this house to the, um, my daughter's property. So that's, that's my um, two cents worth on this. The lack of access to a relatively flat sloping sewer, and in the long term, it's going to be the town of Greenwich that's going to be coming in there. Someday we're going to address this original sin that is a clay pipe thing that stuff north of the Deer Park it's got to come through the old, small clay pipes that were put in there by the Rockefellers and then go south for the health of the Long Island Sound and of this city. In the longer term, it's not going to be Deer Park. It's a, it was brought up that it's, you don't get, want to get in the middle of the spat between DP and TP, Deer Park and Tom Priori, which makes sense. Well, I agree earlier. We, we said we didn't want to, but I think they worked it out. Sure. Let's so But I I I don't know that the you want this sewage thing to not be a safety hazard and also not be um, <laughs> affecting negatively the trees that are supposed to be put in to screen the property on both of those two property lines. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um I had one more question for Mr. D'Andrea. I'm sorry to make you stand Thank up. you all. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for your great service. David Darst, D A R S T. Thank you. Just, we're not going to ask you to do this or anything like that, but just to clarify, Mr. DeAndrea, mm -hmm. if it turned out that the sewer line had recurring problems, wouldn't eventually somebody put in a pump? In order to do that, you'd have to have a, a much bigger operation. You need a holding tank and then pumps and electrical and generators. And so there's not going to be a problem. Keep in mind, this is an eight inch diameter sewer. It's not going to clog. And with the protections now that we've offered and Mr. Um, Subramanian. So, so, thank you. I'm um, agreed to. We will take care of the west. The association will take care of the south. The trees that are being planted, as you can see from the landscape plan, are not arborvitae. There's Norway spruces, and they're interspersed with some arborvitae, some other trees that are too numerous to mention on the record right now. Um, and I think that we've addressed all the problems. Okay. I appreciate your cooperation. Any other comments from anybody? Can, can we close, people? I think so. Okay, we close. Thank you. Well, we got one closed. <laughs> yeah. What's, what do we have left? Uh, we have um, Millbrook. Millbrook Corporation. There's two on Millbrook. Both preliminary site plan and special permit. First one is to construct a, an addition to the main clubhouse, et cetera. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. For the record, Chip Haslam from Johnson, Haslam, and Hogeman for the applicants of Millbrook Club. Uh, with me tonight is Scott Kloster, who's the general manager of the club. Um, Steve McMahon, who's the architect from Jefferson Group Architects in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And Tony, who probably needs a few minutes of uh, rest before I'll call him to the fore. Uh, 
I sense from the briefing session the other day that you generally understand the nature and scope of the project, both on the west side and the east side. So I won't have Steve get up yet and run through all the architectural details or Tony and save those for questions, which I think is probably the, what you'd prefer at this point. Um, if that's not the case, we can proceed in that direction. Um, I thought what I'd do instead is address some of the comments that came up in the briefing yesterday and uh, particularly to start off with just the procedural aspect of why I put this in as two applications rather than just one. And then I'd go to the comments that you raised yesterday and some of the staff comments and department comments if that's acceptable to the commission. Um, the first point is why I put it in as two applications. And um, I didn't mean it to complicate things and make it messy. I actually was hoping to make it cleaner. Uh, there is a road that divides the two parts of the property that are used by the Millbrook Club and has been used by the club since 1923 uh, as a country club within a closed community. Um, it's believed, in fact, to be the first country club, which actually is a, a planned community around the club rather than having the club out in the country. And therefore, um, it's integrated into the community. The um, parcels, there's two parcels to the west, which are owned by the Millbrook Corporation, and a parcel to the east, which is owned by the Millbrook Corporation. As I said, they're separated by a road. And I think from the, in the past, you've indicated when you have a road separating, which is in different ownership, you see it as being two different properties. That was one reason. Another reason is, if you look at the history that staff kindly put together of the zoning on Millbrook Club, uh, we have traditionally gone and, and separated the two out, doing the east side and the west side. And I just meant to be consistent with my numbers so that when the staff was reviewing it and you were reviewing it, it would be consistent with what we've done in the past and it would be hopefully easier to understand. Um, the third reason is that because one side of the property is only four acres and the other is 60 plus acres, if we'd put the two together, it would have skewed the numbers when it came to FAR and coverage, et cetera. So I was trying to be conservative to give the commission a sense of what's, what's the impact of development on both sides of the road. And if I'd added the 60 acres in, it would have made the numbers minuscule on the, on the west side. So that was the reasoning. Now, that being the, the logic behind it, nonetheless, if the commission would prefer to have it heard as one application, it's defined by us, it would have been easier for me actually and probably save some more time if I hadn't done two applications and a two application fee. But uh, we can do it as one transcript, two applications. I can, when we go back for final, if you want, I can we make it one like application. We usually like to separate it. How do you people feel about that? One transcript. It, it's the, um, I mean, it's not a question of what we're doing uh, tonight so much as, uh, I think of the last um, golf club we had with a road through it is Innes Arden. And it's conceptually um, not so easy. And I think it was, I'm trying to remember if it was DPW that observed that they would like to see, or was it sewer, uh, that they wanted to see the whole, I'm trying to find it. Um, it must be sewer. Is this not in the uh, would like to see the whole drainage system. I guess it must have been DPW. Um, We're, we here. looked through the notes from uh, yeah. DPW and uh, Sewer in particular, and uh, Tony's indicated that these are not big issues. We can address them. We can show yep. the entire plan of what we've done on both sides of the property. We had to put in uh, considerable drainage when we did the patio, if you remember, about three or four years ago. And then we've also done work on the paddle side, the east side, with regard to the drainage over it, there, too. It, so we can show an inc uh, a plan which covers all the property uh, and it put it in both the, applications. I mean, there's not, he said uh, resubmit prior to final, so it's not going to impede our right. progress. But the first observation, 1A, was um, the computations must be submitted for the entire drainage area. Um, I, th I think. That's fine. Speaking with Tony earlier about the comments, we don't see any issues uh, that we can't address in actually any of the departmental comments. Uh, so I, I think we're, we're good with that. And we understand it is kind of difficult if you're looking at it as two separate applications or one. We will integrate the two where it's important to satisfy departments. Uh, Mr. Maitland, do you have a pile of questions? Um, uh, I have three sorry, questions. Sorry, one second. Got to change your tape? Not on. I had my machine off. Sorry. Uh, the cards got full. Doesn't have the office. That's good. I wonder why. Do you have a question? Hmm? Do you have a question? On this? Okay. No. Wow. Right. No, no. I have no question, Jeff. Sorry. Sorry. Probably doing both uh, of the shows. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm stepping. I don't. 
have any, I don't what? I don't have any opinion. Okay. I don't care. Okay. Anybody um, have any comments? I do, I do. Um, the uh, the um, eating arrangements. Yes. So um, I think in 2012, um, you made an application for outdoor dining. Did. Um, in one location. And that application uh, approval as a condition said there would be no indoor dining when there was outdoor dining. Do you recall that? I'm not sure it was that black line, but mm -hmm. I, I think we did indicate line. to you that, um, <laughs> was it? Yep. Um, so now you're uh, redoing the uh, indoor dining space, and it's going to have an outdoor dining terrace with, I didn't count the spaces, but um, that I just need to get all those pieces straightened out so that we understand what's going to happen in the warm months and what's going to happen because that outdoor dining application was 167 seats uh, in 2012. So we're, I think well, that was the number. So a big number. Um, so, um, you know, the seating in the new dining facility, I think we need to get down to how many chairs, what's going outside, what's the plan? for integrating these three locations. I'll, I may have Scott and Steve go into greater detail about it, but just preliminary to address that. <laughs> the, um, what we found is that people are looking for dining options at clubs, and the old formal dining rooms that were more popular in old times are not that popular anymore. Uh, we uh, did um, improve the patio several years ago. We didn't add that many seats. I can't recall exactly the top of my head how many we did add, but we, we it did not add that many. And we did indicate that in the summertime, we have outdoor dining, weather permitting, and do not serve dinner inside the clubhouse on those occasions, um, and uh, or lunch for that matter. Um, so that's a seasonal dining facility. And we found that it's been extremely successful. The members love our patio, and I think people who come to visit the club also find that it's one of the nicer aspects of Millbrook. We have had a patio to the rear of the, the existing dining room as well, and that'll be somewhat um, interrupted or disturbed by the addition to the main clubhouse. The membership itself will stay the same. Um, it is not increased over what was approved in 2012 or what we represented in 2012 was the membership. We have no uh, intention of trying to uh, increase the membership. The idea with Millbrook, as with most, most clubs, is to actually retain members and then replace members that leave so that you maintain a certain continuity. And to do that, you have to be responsive to what the members indicate are their uh, desires. Um, our bar space at Millbrook right now, the indoor bar, is very popular, and most people want to eat there on the weekends if they possibly can, uh, less so the grill room and even less so the lake view room, which is the very formal room. So the idea is to make more options for our current membership, not to increase our, our membership, and that's what the plan entails. But there's also some internal uh, movement, which I guess I can have Steve go into greater detail, detail about too, which would abandon some areas that now are used for dining and have them used for storage or other purposes. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think but the, an explanation of the whole, oh, oh gosh, I'm sorry, um, uh, of that whole, uh, what is each room? Uh, you know, you have a multi-purpose room, you have all these things, and then to line it up with the existing permit for outdoor space so that we understand how many, the head count. I, I understand the membership's not changing, but the, if there's more, if there's more eating space, there may be more people there at one time. That's that's the concern, and simply also to simply get it pinned down so we know what you've been approved for. Well, again, I think mostly it's looking for dining options for people, and when we have the indoors open, we do not have the patio open. So the patio is only seasonal, and that's closed outside. Um, I'll have Steve get up and talk you through the, the actual uh, rooms in a moment. Um, and the other issue, of course, I think it relates to is the parking issue, and uh, predominantly. Yeah. And our parking works very well, actually, uh, considering the fact that we're non-conforming if we were to come in today uh, for a new clubhouse right. in that area. Um, why it works very well is in part um, because Millbrook's within the Millbrook community, about 40% of our membership is actually uh, yeah. lives within Millbrook. Yeah. And uh, you, you can see people walk into the club quite often, and if you go by, uh, you'll see that the, uh, the area outside the swimming pool where bikes are held, there's often 50, 60 bicycles out in that area, and also by the tennis court too. So people do walk to the club, ride bikes to the club, et cetera, so that's very helpful. In addition, we use valet parking when we have large groups of people, and that works very well as, as well. 
finally, we have the ninth fairway, which is quite large. And if we have um, situations which would most likely be something like a swim meet where you have inner clubs coming in or other clubs coming in for an inner club match, we do use the ninth fairway for parking. Um, it's uh, something that the membership recognizes as a necessity to make the club function properly. So if you're an avid golfer, it can be an inconvenience at times because you don't want to hit a slice uh, if the car is lined up there, but it's something we've gotten used to and that we use very well. That particular area of the club does not uh, flood. It's the fourth and fifth fairways that do, so we don't really have any drainage problems there either, and therefore we're able to use that area pretty much year-round. Um, but we use it fairly rarely, uh, but it is a great overflow situation for us that's able to accommodate whenever we have large groups or events that are going on at the club. Generally speaking, though, the parking works very, very well. And, um, and therefore, as it relates to the dining experience, we don't anticipate having any problems with that overflow. And again, the membership will stay con constant. Um, so the idea really is just create options for our membership as to the dining experience and try to you know, stay up to date, really, with what is available to uh, the members of the club, um, akin to what other clubs offer as well. So that's the idea. But I'll have Steve get up and explain the, the floor plan. Steve? Good evening. My name is Steve McMahon, M-C-M-A-H-O-N. Um, as uh, Chip had mentioned, I uh, am with Jefferson Group Architects, uh, the architect that's involved in the project. Uh, we uh, specialize in the country club market, and um, as uh, also that Chip mentioned, uh, it is a trend in the industry for more casual dining, and right now the club is very uh, low in the, in the casual dining uh, abilities at the club and very um, have a, a, a large a number of more formal dining that uh, is available at the at the club, and when they came to us, they talked about the need to uh, be able to provide more casual dining. So, what we did is we reorganized uh, some of the interior of the club. And uh, we actually, this is an existing dining room that occurs uh, in this area here and over in here. We reorganized that so that there's now more circulation for food service flow uh, out of the kitchen and into the dining areas. We created a small private dining room that's part of the uh, layout. And uh, one of the existing dining rooms that provides about 16 seats has been taken away and created uh, for storage uh, purposes and food service purposes. This addition, which is shown hatched right here, is about 2,700 square feet on each level. Um, and it's, uh, it, we're, we're proposing casual dining in this area here, this, the same casual dining that now occurs uh, within this space and over in here is moved over into here. The capacity is slightly larger. Um, and then we increased the lounge, which the existing lounge is here. Uh, we've taken that away, made that into circulation. And we have uh, created a new lounge in the adi proposed addition to the north in this location. Uh, the net increase in seating <coughs> is, uh, is about uh, 38 to 40 seats. Some of these booths, most booths are uh, generally uh, not filled with all the seats. Uh, so these booths here would be uh, available for up to six people in the, the width that they've, they're set to be. And uh, the smaller booths are for four. Uh, but that's... Uh, uh, that basically is a, a review of the seating capacities and the, the seating changes that we're proposing. And the rest of the seats on that drawing are outdoor? Uh, these seats here are, are outdoor. The existing patio exists right here. We're proposing to extend that. Uh, about 50% of that extended patio is really for circulation for um, egress. This is the, these are exits that are required for egress out of the existing dining room. So emergency egress would come around the building and down the stair here uh, to, to provide that uh, uh, emergency egress uh, out of the dining room. So uh, could you just say, uh, for the record, what the um, existing indoor dining is? I, I've, I've got the 38 to 40 additional, but what is the existing? Yesterday. 
Okay. The uh, the existing grill room is uh, 54 seats. The new grill room is 68. Uh, the existing bar is 20 seats, and uh, will be increased to 50. The existing dining room that's now converted to a storage room is 16 seats. And the new going to be a zero. private dining room, that will be zero. Mm -hmm. And then the new private dining room that we are creating will be 12 seats. New. Okay. And the number of seats outside on that terrace or patio uh, is presently how many and what will it be? Well, the, in discussions with the committee at the club, the purpose of that dining room, uh, that uh, that patio is, is changing, and we're actually proposing to make that more of a casual um, cocktail lounge uh, seating arrangement. So uh, not that, you know, it's not possible that there would be dining uh, at that location, but the type of furniture that's being specified and designed for that is more for casual dining. And it's so it's a much reduced capacity as compared to how it's used today. What we're showing there is... Uh, Uh, 32 seats at that and if if we were to take the existing patio uh, in its current layout with dining tables there would be about the same number of seats. Oh I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? Any comments from the public? Okay. Well s since this is before IWWA, yeah. we can't make a decision on it until we have their decision. Yes, we're going to in the wetlands on the 22nd of February. This is one of the f few occasions I actually had where we got to you folks before we got to Inland Wetlands, right, which sort right. of surprised me. But um, it is preliminary, so I think you could probably act with the preliminary, but I know you won't, so we'll go no, to Inland Wetlands no, and we won't, keep we it can. open and we'll come back. We can't. We, we looked it up. Thing, yeah. We're apparently, apparently <laughs> we pretty good in our regs. We looked it up. But you got a, yep. good, you got a good feeling. Thank you for uh, your response. Okay. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And okay. Wellens and come back. Thank you. Okay. Next item is Holly Hill. Kept open. Final site plan and special permit. We don't have IWW. Uh, so just for the purpose of the record, then, the transcript that was just taken on number 10 will also be the transcript that is used for number 11. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, I think, I mean, I, I had a, a number of other questions. They can wait till the next time, but I just don't want the applicant to think I don't have them. <laughs> so, well, we kept it open. So yeah, I'm just. Do you, I, want, do you want to ask no them now problem. so that they can be prepared okay. for the next meeting? Um, I mean, I think that's a fair thing to do with them, frankly. Yeah. Um, these are not important things, but they are things that need. Make for a more complete application next yeah. time around also. Yeah. Um, the um, some of these things came from our, um, uh, our staff report on the paddle. Um, no, we haven't done paddle tennis yet. K Katie just consolidated them. We but uh, we'll even both. I was open. asking if that was what is happening because yeah, Mr. Heller was moving on to Holly Hill, so what? I was saying. Well, oh, what's I, didn't I hear just that. went into Holly Hill. Right, so oh, that's why no. I was saying: is the transcript for ten also going to be okay. used for eleven? Is no. I yeah. want. So, Richard, do you have questions what, what, on eleven? Do, do you want to do? So, do you want oh, yeah, to I have a few. Yeah. I have a few questions on eleven. I, okay. I just then let's go back. I misunderstood what was going on here. Yeah. Okay, so, that's fine. So then, for the purpose of the record, ten and eleven should be separate. What? For the purpose of the record, 10 and 11 will remain separate. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> we'll keep what them. you do? If just, uh, let, let's just keep them separate. Yep. When you no, said you didn't, did. okay, no, just go in. questions on There's 11, question. that's all, and I just let's don't know what we're doing, then. whether we are combining them. No, we're, we're not anymore. Yes, your question. Okay. All right, they're, just a, uh, they're, not, uh, they're not a lot of things, but the first one is lights. Yes. Uh, you have it, you're going to have lights? We'll have a lumens plan. We'll have to go to ARC for, to have that approved. You're going to have to go to ARC for both of them. So, I mean. Correct. But, um, Same with okay, the so we are going to have lights. Yeah, no, well, and a landscape, yes, landscape plan, plan. Because correct. you're removing the trees. Da, 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 da. Right. Now, the other thing is um, 
the ramp system to get handicapped access to, to the uh, platforms comes off of the uh, uh, Eastern Park. Uh, Correct. Uh, lot. It does now. I don't see any s specific parking space there for handicap. So I think that that needs to be identified on the plans because they're not going to go from the, right. the handicapped spaces over at the clubhouse and, and get all the way over to the. To the we back talked of about that, Tony and I, already, and we there's a spot for it. It's a logical spot. Buy it, we'll consider that. Yeah. That was it. Um, on the on that application as well, the parking is going to move closer to uh, non-association residences. So, <clears throat> and I noticed um, that the. Uh, no, that's on another application. So um, they haven't consented, obviously, because they're not part of the association. Uh, that you have an, a, a consent. Well, actually, um, the Do, longest you, property line is to the east, yep. and that's the Downs family, and that runs pretty much from the golf shop yep. to the corner where the uh, gate is. Look, yep. Mr. Downs and his family are members of Millbrook, and we actually have been working with them because they wanted to create a planting bed on their side of the property with yes. a, a wall, yes. and we were actually working with them jointly okay. to create that so that they will have a pleasant screening area, uh, okay. but they wanted it on their side, which we were happy to agree to. Sure. I, I think we've had that at other times at clubs, that uh, they seem to prefer to have it on their own land. Yeah. We have a written agreement where, okay. whereby we will agree to, they don't maintain the wall, we have a right to go in and maintain the wall and plantings, et cetera, too. So. But that will all be in a package on the landscape We can submit that, we that yeah. to you as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. The, there's, um, there were, on, my apologies for this going back to 10, but there were um, on uh, Alexandra Mock's uh, comments, there's a, a ledge removal. Um, I suppose some of that, is any of that coming, going to be taken up with wetlands? That ledge yes. removal is? Yes. Um, I'm not, we have to go to wetlands on the 22nd, yeah. and that is adjacent to that water course. Yeah. I'm not sure how much of a concern that's going to be with, uh, for yeah. wetlands because it's I located see. up on the hill, but we'll see on the 22nd. Okay. And the tree removal, um, 10 trees are being removed. Um, She's looking for some replacement. I think it's a two to one on that area or one to one. I can't you know, just, which area it was, just, but yep. we've gone through the conservation notes. I think we can work with them and uh, be responsive to her concerns okay. and her recommendations. I, I just really prefer not to surprise. I mean, I just no, I appreciate seem very pleasant Attorney to no, I appreciate that. <laughs> the um, three variances. Um, could you uh, just articulate where those uh, are needed? Well, there's a, a kiosk proposed, which is yes. relatively small for the lifeguards yep. out by the street. Yep. And the idea is to have a, a more, um, uh, an area with uh, children coming in, families, make sure that managed. they're safe, managed, oh, yeah. exactly. Oh, That's the that. idea behind that. I understood that. the under idea. Yep. So that very, there's, there are. Uh, setback variants setback. for that. Okay, and the other two? Um, would be the paddle uh, courts yes. in relationship to the street. Again, um, the street. And th they are right now very non-conforming yep. too. And uh, the paddle hut itself would be coming further back to so be made less non-conforming. And yep. uh, it's okay. it's just it's the relationship to the street. Okay. And the um, I think that on-street parking uh, is being you're you're changing that. Slightly, it's. I mean, it exists. There's. Uh, yes, I know that. I, I think seven yeah. spaces. They're right. currently the routine and a six, right. but um, so that currently exists. It works yeah. well. We don't have any problem with it. Uh, it changing the angle of it or something. Something. Is I don't think Tony did. No, we, no that's straight out still. Okay, must. Yeah. Okay, sorry. That's everything. Thank you. Good. Anything, anything else? from the public? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Holly Hill. Final site plan and special permit. Um, members of the commission, John Tessie representing the applicant. We also have a client representative here. He's familiar with the building and how it operates in the site and our uh, landscape architect and our engineer. Um, given the hour, I'm gonna move it right along and keep up with my new <coughs> policy of saying as little as possible. Before the trap door opens. Won't have to open. Um, 
I mean, at its essence, this is a relatively simple application. It involves the uh, site work to create a, a new parking area at grade level on the western portion of the property. Uh, I'm pointing to the new oh, parking you. areas. And um, uh, that did not require any wetlands approvals. There are no wetlands, as noted in the staff report. Um, some grading, as shown on the engineering plans. Um, but it, again, at its, es <coughs> at its essence, we're adding 30, uh, a total of 30, uh, I believe it's seven parking spaces, 35 of which are regular and two are handicapped. The other aspect of this application is to take currently vacant, actually space that's been vacant quite quite a while in the building uh, that uh, was originally approved for general office and converted to uh, medical offices, which you've seen a lot of recently in Western Greenwich, but that basically is the market right now and has been for the last few years. Our clients have uh, tried to, to market the property since They've owned it now, I think, for three or four years. Uh, but it's uh, it's a market there that really doesn't exist currently, except for medical uses. And that's proven to be something that uh, the town of Greenwich wants and needs, um, like perhaps because of people my age <laughs> needing more medical attention. I'm not exactly sure, um, although I don't. The the um, Sorry, about what? Said about your age. <laughs> said people my age tend to need more medical attention. I see, I didn't hear you correctly. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. Not your age. You're perfect. I, it's just a softball thing you flopped up there. I'm just not even going to go there. <laughs> no, we're not going to go, go with that. <laughs> we are not allowed to address those I, matters. Um, the, we, we did receive the engineering division comments. You probably have them, and they're we think essentially boilerplate, and we think a lot of the, actually the points Scott raised are included in the uh, in the report submitted. Uh, Dave Ginder, our engineer, is here uh, if you needed to speak to him. Um, but bottom line with Scott is he noted that he has no problem um, allowing this to proceed to a building <laughs> permit, and then at that point it, the issue would be addressed. Uh, the building uh, is unique, as you know, because of the way parking is treated. I know this came up at the staff report, uh, not staff report, staff briefing yesterday, in that we, we, we actually have four distinct parking areas. Now, currently, there are medical uses in the building, and they are within with level C. Uh, level the level uh, C is how best to show. The roadway is not shown. Um, the driveway. That's <clears throat> what you get from uh, landscape architects. They, they like that. Like they like green. Um, uh, I'll get one of the better better plans up to show that. But maybe this is it. So I want to just take no. you through it a bit. That's low. I want to get to see here. How come we have drawings that are more descriptive than what you're showing? Well, oh, we have plenty of them. We, I have another set way over there. So I just wanted to get to, to the level C for you and then take you through A and B and kind of quickly describe. Do you have so, a drawing SE1? You find SE1? SE1 shows your site plan. Yeah. We, It'll get we have it and we have more over there. Okay. Well, let's see one does a better job of showing. Okay. Well, this it's is kind of underneath, but you, well, can, you can at least see the roadway coming in right, off of Holly. This is the roadway. Th this happens one, to be the level yeah, C, that's C location. Right. And there is signage there. Uh, both the Greenwich Hospital and Greenwich Medical Group are located in level C. This is what I was trying to show here. <clears throat> you know, I never saw that when I was. And. Um, here, so as as well, you literally can see in, in level C, we have parking coming in, and what we have, which comes in here off Holly Hill, and there are uh, offices at that location. It shows a garage door. 
right there. But is that open during? Yes, yes, So it just absolutely. closed at night kind of thing? Um, I'm not even sure if it's closed at night, but but it that that is the entrance, and that's been used by the, <coughs> by the uh, medical tenants for their uh, for their for their patients. It really has not not never been a problem. I'm told in terms of people understanding that. Now the idea uh, for for the new use was to dedicate um, entirely level B. And level level B enters on Muscat on Muscrat Pond. <laughs> Juggling things here. Muscrat Pond Road and Muscrat Pond Drive, excuse me. <clears throat> Actually right across from the entrance area that uh, is used by the patients for Greenwich Hospital at 55. Um, and again, I, I, well, I don't know anything about how they operate, but through signage at the corner, uh, and the signage we have, we currently have at, uh, up at the entrance to the formal entrance for the office portion, general office portion of the building, um, the, the ownership fails that uh, there, there's really not gonna be an issue, that 120 spaces would be more than sufficient to serve the needs of the medical uh, patients. The idea as employees, because as we indicated, there's 138 spaces dedicated technically to the use based upon the number of doctors, would be allowed to park in the unallocated spaces on, uh, on, the, uh, on the surface, uh, or perhaps li literally on level A also. Um, I would. Uh, so, it's I can understand, especially at this late hour. It's there's a lot of parking in locations. Um, the the question at is, you, but it all comes who together. Parks down there now. The, well, it's a, take a not way. many people because right. the buildings. They, you know, so, in other words, that's got, empty because. The, yeah, you got a third of the building empty. Can you take that drawing down? Um, Which I, one? I, I want to just keep the parking plans up there for a minute. Yeah. Okay. When when I was oh. there today, the. Okay. The, the level up by the front door mm -hmm. is pretty full. Right, the surface parking. The next level down that's still on Holly Hill is less full, and the emptiest is the muskrat. Right, well, there's that two. would make sense. Right, but because we muskrat don't, is emptiest. Yes, that would make well, sense. Well, there's two because levels coming up. There are, the but they're probably like both pretty empty. Pretty empty. The building yeah. is pretty empty. You don't really have, and we've seen it in the office buildings, and I think you're seeing it more and more. It's just the fact that in a general <laughs> office space, um, you're not really seeing that the, yeah. the kind of parking demand we've seen in the past because you're not seeing those seeing those trading floors. And you are. Well, and you've got the you're vacant, right? Or vacant for that thirty eight thousand. So you would expect to see a lot of spaces. Yeah, we're, we're for the 30, what is it, the 38 uh, yeah. parking space, 38,000 square feet, so that's 40% right. so of so the building. You, yeah, you'd expect yeah. to see, it was fuller than I expected, actually. I expected to see about a third of Mercedes-Benz, I think, is renting out oh. store cars there. There you go. As opposed to, <laughs> uh, as opposed to every other office building. It's, yeah. I, I'm, I just can't believe how, how many, that's another whole story, how many cars these manufacturers make these dealerships yeah. buy it's, to, it's to incredible this, to this project um, I, I think somehow the internals of the garage will work themselves out what I'm what I'm interested in is as a patient mm -hmm. coming here where do I park mm -hmm. you're going to park at that I'm outside in the surface no no you're going to park at that lower level uh, that I indicated C? Level, level no no C not C as I C just the said existing B. medical the existing, the existing Can't be as too many cars. medical parks at level C yeah. where the offices actually are. So they don't even get in an elevator. Those offices are right there. But the fact is it looks like, could you flip C back? It looks like there's more parking than it would be required. Well, there may be more than they need. I'm just telling you where uh, they park. Okay. I'm just... Because the addition, the, the, all right, let me ask another question. The, 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 the empty space being taken over by Stanford, yeah. where will the patients park for that? Level B. Oh, I can't hear you, Level B. I think they might have ran out of battery. 
I don't know what we can. B. Do we have another one? Can you hear me on the phone? Level, yes, what I was trying to explain earlier was level B, B, which is at the end of Muskrat Pond Road and is across, as uh, we discussed earlier, from 55 Holly Hill entrance for Greenwich Hospital offices. Who down. Who's going to park in all the surface parking outside? Uh, the idea was um, the general offices and also employees, because we only have 120, have a lot, parking spaces down there. So the thought of management was those would be dedicated to patients mm -hmm. and the employees of the, um, of the new tenant, <coughs> medical tenant, would park on the surface spaces. That's part of the reason that they're expanding the parking, the, the surface spaces. Like by the, the employees Sorry? would park on the yeah. surface? Right. Because this lot... Because what they want to do, just, just to follow up on that thought, and they're, and they're right on this, they, which is also based upon the experience of having the level C medical offices um, require their patients to park at level C. Is to, they got used to it. So what they didn't want to have here, which is something I don't think you want to have, is a situation where there was a choice for the medical tenants for Stanford Hospital to uh, park either up on the surface or down at level B because there's no connection. Then you'd have a situation people could be circling around, going out in the public street, <clears throat> coming back. So it's neat and clean to do it this way. Okay. So that is a requirement, I believe, in their lease also. And they understand it, that their patients will only know one location to go to. So, um, all right. But just to take Richard's line of questioning, the surface lot is full right now, which means that some of those medical patients today must be parking up there. That I can't and I think tell you. I don't, I'm don't. i told that they're very religious in, in, in doing that, and there's no reason for the patients to want to park up there yeah. because they'd have to park up there, get on an elevator, right. and then go down. Yeah. But that surface lot was full. Well, we do have, we do have other tenants in the building. Yeah, okay. We do, we do have office tenants in the building. Okay. And people generally tend, as we all know, it, uh, unless it, there's inclement weather, to not the want to park distance. in underground parking spaces. Yeah, you know, it's just, and it's the shortest distance. Uh, but we're going to have the 38 additional, 35 additional parking spaces, so if you, we could probably even consider dedicating that area itself. Because when you add that number, the 120, you can take some of those parking spaces as you can see, and you're going to get past the 130, easily get to the 138. We think, actually, w this is all going to work out, and they're going to be more than okay. sufficient spaces. Um, so that all really comes together. I know there, there was some, well, I'll just let you ask if you have additional questions. There was some question about the, the floor area of the, of the, uh, of the building. Um, in terms of did it grow or not grow, I, I, I think it only grew because every seems to me in that world, when when landlords are measuring buildings, they seem to get larger by the years, while human beings shrink. Office buildings get larger, but if we look at the the, the basic numbers, even if we start with the original approval in '77, um, the number of parking spaces that we are adding always more then cover the differential between the parking spaces required for the specific space under general office well, the, and you, the 138 that we need for the doctors. Yeah, but you're, you're short right now. Uh, uh, your parking analysis was based on uh, using it as less nonconforming. Well, I'm just right. pointing it out. Kate, Katie had questions. I'm saying if you use, if you, the original approval indicated that the air, the floor area of the building was uh, a little under 100,000 square feet. The mm -hmm. the um, over. a oh, little the over 101,000. 101,000. Um, I think when we provided the 105,000 dollar number, we were actually doing on the basis of 
not the way of the way the landlord rents the space rentable. It's gross geofix. So, it, as a which is really measured to the exterior G of the GFX. exterior walls. And I'm just saying, if we use the one, uh, if we use the 101, we're actually closer, if not at a non-non-conforming situation. But no matter what, whether we're non-conforming to a meaningful degree or a very slight degree. All I'm saying is that we clearly needed more parking spaces to be able to take that yeah. block of office space yes. and convert it to medical use for 22. And, and I'm that. saying the addition of the 35 under any calculation takes us beyond that, covers that difference, covers that dis di difference, met met yeah, not medically, still mathematically. Leaves us with a non um, Even though what you're saying is correct. Yes. It still leaves us with a nonconformity. It, it is less. It's 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 meaningfully less. Yes, it, but it is less, and that was the whole idea here to make sure we made it. You know, we had, we had to qualify it. We need the 22 doctors because that's that's the business deal, if you will, and my client will lose the tenant. So we wanted to be able to come up here and say what you just said, that yes, you may still be nonconforming, but we're uh, under anybody's math, we're less nonconforming. <clears throat> Level B is going to have, the B parking is going to have 120 in total? There, I think there are 120 on both A, A and B, but, but A is where we're, we are, uh, um, I'm sorry, B. B. B is 120. I counted them up, and then after I finished counting them on my hands, the building manager said, there's 120 there, so... I can count. Uh, Mr. Tessie. Yes, sir. Did, um, did you uh, take a look at uh, what kind of uh, impact this, uh, this new uh, use is going to have on the surrounding streets? Um, you've got 27 exam rooms, 22 doctors, plus staff. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I'm just yeah. off of this one. Right. Um, you're having everybody park in one garage on a road that's actually the exit for the dump and actually works for Greenwich Hospital at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think my concern here is that because of the nature of this use, you're going to have a lot of transient traffic in and out, in and out all day long, as opposed to an office which may be a little bit more stagnant. And I think specifically Holly Hill Lane, uh, in back of CVS, you've got a lot of transient traffic going into their garage as well, plus the uses down the street. Um, I would be concerned that uh, we're not setting ourselves up for actually uh, compounding what uh, kind of works at the moment, but uh, maybe making this the Trevis situation in this area uh, worse. Um, it's actually good to know that actually you're, you're going to try to get everybody to that garage down below as opposed to the driveway in the front, mm -hmm. which is shared. Um, but I think you're actually all adding an awful lot of people going in and out uh, on a small street um, that has uh, two, two similar uses. Mm -hmm. um, would it be possible to see, take a look and see what kind of traffic impact we're going to have on these two streets? Above Scratton and well, well, I, I can, can tell you this. I mean, we, we've internally talked about it. Um, putting aside the issue, I, I think really the medical use in and of itself is, is a permitted use. Um, most of the time when, when there's a conversion like this, it's done administratively. It's, you don't come to the commission. Um, that's, that's been the case for many, many buildings. For a change of use? Because um, it's not really a change of use. It's, it's, it's an approved, if you look at your regulations, an office building is an office building. Oh. There's no, let me make the point, there's no distinction. Now that said, to me, but then we all have their own life's experiences. Gotta remember when you, we, <clears throat> it's interesting when the traffic engineers look at the, uh, look at this issue, they're always looking at peak hours. You know, usually morning, peak, evening, peak, and Saturday morning. Um, I would say one of the, lack of a better word, beauties of, of, a, of a medical building, medical use, is that you don't get that concentration in the morning and the evening. What you do, however, is get a steady flow during the day. 
and it's a steady flow during the day. But it isn't everybody rushing in at once and everybody rush, you know, ru rushing in at once and everybody rushing out at once at those peak times. Those are always where you're gonna see the spikes. When you have the medical use, you're gonna have the flow during the day. It'd be highly coincidental if it just turned out that you know, there were 22 people leaving all at once and coming back. That's not the way it really is, it flows. Um, so I think overall with the light at the intersection, of uh, Holly Hill and West Putnam Avenue, which which is a great, you know, facilitator. Um, that that old that this substitution of general office for medical uh, really should be relatively benign during those spike times, and the flow during the day is just a natural flow. You're not going to see a spike. That that's my view of it. We do have actually. It's interesting flow. that your engineer, um, your engineering division made no made no comments. We didn't get anything to indicate that there was a professional concern about this use. But to bring up the, the point of the light, I think actually uh, that may be uh, uh, a point of the detriment where you're going to have actually people, a lot more people now queuing at that light coming off the post road get, yeah, from because you have this flow, constant flow all day, you're going to have more people sitting at that light. I think you have uh, with the uh, recycling center, you also have the same kind of thing. You have a constant flow yeah, all right. day, inclusive of, of large trucks. Right. Uh, I, I, my biggest concern is is you have people coming in and out, like you said, all day, um, on basically a, a kind of a very narrow, or half of it's actually even one way street, um, and I would be concerned and about that traffic flow, and if we're setting ourselves up here to compound uh, some kind of a issue down there with, the, with this. Well, I. This, I, I I, a steady flow of people yeah. going in and out mm -hmm. to right. a specific garage, to one, to one access point. Right. Um, yeah. And people saying, well, I don't want to park in a garage. And like you said before, they're going around to the front, they're going into the thing, they're going to get lost. Well, if you, you know, I mean, you could look at an average, we, we really like to move this, this forward, but, you know, it, 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 if you take a look, I mean, just plug a number. Let's suppose there are, uh, you know, the 22 in and out, uh, or maybe it's 30 or maybe it's 40 in and out during a, during a particular hour. That's still not going to produce. That's over a one-hour period. And if you're saying you're going to add two or three in, it, in every cycle of a light, which cycles of the light are usually like five minutes, so that's not, I, you I just can't know. possibly be adding that much traffic. And, no, that's, assuming, that's, excuse me, and that's assuming everybody's going left to that light. Some people are gonna go right up. Some people love avoiding lights like I do. <laughs> I'll do anything to avoid a light. So there are people that are gonna take the right hand turn and head up and maybe stop at Citarella, I don't know. Or what some people do, cut through 500. That's the question, but, I actually don't know which, which way they're gonna well, go. Well, some are gonna go. You know it's on the western end of town, right? So obviously you're gonna get a fair number of people who are going to be heading east as opposed to west. I don't know what the mix is. But I'm pointing out that's one of the beauties of this location that you have, you have an, a left and a right to make. So when you start to break it down, do it logically in your head, you're gonna say, well, maybe they'll add a 20, maybe they're gonna add as many as 20 or so during a peak, mm -hmm. during an hour. But th that 20, then break it up. You have a five minute cycles on your light. So, that's six times, and then you look at it, you're talking about adding maybe three cars. It does, it's not a lot of traffic when you break it down. But Mr. Mr. Tessie, that Holly Hill. Yes. I mean, it moves fast, yeah. it moves constantly. Yeah. There are so many things coming in big and out Big vehicles, of there. that was the point Donald was there, making the yeah. other day, that there were really big vehicles too. And, well, and the, it's the recycling center. I would I would understand that. The difference between somebody who goes to an office and stays for seven hours or eight hours, and and this, I mean, you know, Mr. Tessie, this looks more like a mini hospital. This, this, I just don't see this as fitting in a, the definition of doctor's office. This is every capacity that a hospital has: cardiology, dermatology, neurology. Cardiac it's testing and gynecology—it's—it's it's an all, one place fits all sizes. This is not 
Yes, 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 I, I would, when, yes, we, when we did the yes, yes. Um, approvals for other buildings in the neighborhood that had similar uses, you did require traffic reports yeah. for, for those oh, yeah. uses. And, and I would just note, too, that we've had sim, um, situations in town where there's um, buildings with three doctors that have, that have wrecked havoc in neighborhoods yeah, because absolutely. of the, the amount of in and out. And you, you have here 22, so I, I appreciate your representations, but I think it may give the commission some comfort to have a, to have a traffic Well, report. if you're requiring it, we, we, we understand it. I was just saying we take a step back and look at it. But in terms of what you were describing, you know, interestingly, I was in uh, West Med offices, and um, in, um, they happen to be in the Rye, but, but obviously they've come here and they're, they're at uh, uh, 644 now. But that's you know that that's what they do. Uh, it, it, you call it one. Well, I forget what the phrase you use, but yeah, you're going to see these different departments. That's the way they operate. But that said, if you're if you're stating that you you're requiring a traffic analysis, then then you're requiring a traffic analysis. No, advise the, my uh, client. The, the other the, the other what's happening there is that a lot of doctors are moving one their own offices, so it, it's a uh, it's a visitors. Place. That's what it is. A visit to the doctor at his office, in, as opposed to going to the hospital. That's the function there. I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, but I do agree. And and Margarita, thank you for reminding me. I think you do. I think we do need a traffic work study. Okay. There. Then we'll 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 get hopping on it. We'll What's leave it happening? open and uh, let us address that issue. It's becoming very very. Uh, complicated. Hmm. It's a shortcut out of town for many drivers, for example. Yeah. This one example, Holly Hill, believe it or not. You should go by there at 4 o'clock. But I think we... Well, 4 o'clock is when I notice these office buildings start. 4 o'clock's become the new 5 o'clock, apparently, should, I, for I today's should, workers. I think we should have a traffic <laughs> Nobody works till 5. I think we should have one. No, because the trade Are you back to your age again? Are you talking about your age again? <laughs> Five o'clock. No, I was talking about hours. The parking um, aspect of it, the count, is also, I think, uh, concerning. The way this has been, right now, this building has is half empty, and there are pieces that are not really occupied. I know that the fire chief is first. up there on the third floor in a in a space he's not fully occupying at all, and he's uh, so he's. What one, two, three people in a space sixty two hundred net mm -hmm. square feet. So um, that doesn't reflect a normal parking situation at all. So we, I, I would agree with that. I wasn't meaning not to agree with that. Yeah, I was I mean, just I, pointing out that the lower level C plus the available parking um, in what you see. You look, I don't know if you, were, you you may have been there, but obviously. Uh, Margarita said she was there. Um, it gets you to the point where there's 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 plenty of space, and you do wonder, okay, when the new medical tenant is in there, what will that mean to parking? But as I pointed out, if you look at the available space there now, and knowing we're going to dedicate level C for that use, is just 120. Um, we're not. We're, we're covering it. I, I, but the, I'm just saying the, we're covering it based upon the had, math and based upon what you, you said you saw. But, Mr. Tessie, we've had lots of these difficult to rent and, mm -hmm. and incrementally occupied buildings with you before. And the, yeah. the way this has been, uh, par you know, the parking so far has been worked. There are now three medical uses in there. And I, I don't see any look at the total building occupancy and... Uh, you know, when that when those three um, administrative site plans were done, so the, there was an analysis of of a count, but the relationship to the total building and who's going to park where and is there enough parking um, is is always a, 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 you know the bigger picture of this building yep. has to concern us too. Is yeah. are we going to get to a place where there are going to be tenants with no parking? That's Kind of I think you've seen bottom. that. I know we had we had a vibrant discussion to a few years. I can't remember. A few years time, ago. On, uh, on uh, 100 West Putnam. And I don't, to my knowledge, we never had to go to a managed parking plan there, and there's, there's plenty of spaces. 
So, at, and I know at Pickwick Plaza, the same thing. I happen to be familiar with it. Yep. And I think the same at 55. And I think that's that's what I'm saying, that that's just the way society is today, or what do, the, what the building offices do? are today, that parking has not been an issue when it comes to general office. But why don't you have them include the parking analysis yeah. with the traffic study and be done with it? Well, that's, that's, right. that's easy. Yeah, that's just yeah, plugging okay. numbers in. So we yeah. can have okay, them do that. Do yeah. That way you get it from him and not yeah. from the lawyer. Mr. Tessie. Or her. This traffic Tessie. and parking analysis. Yes. Excuse okay. me. When what? you do that, could you do, sorry, I've got Richard Scrawley here, but I'd like to see the, the uses that you're going to send to each level. Like mm -hmm. Level B has 120. 20. And this is the use, this is the use that we're going to assign to it. Yeah, we already said that. C is the medical. A, A I know, but you C said is the medical. It, but that's B is the medical. The table is done. Could you? In A, I know exactly what you want. Right. Wait, exactly in A, what you it's going to be general office. In a table. In the in the in the, in the outside is going to is, go, is going table. to be general office in mixed in mixed. So Precisely we'll put that on a table. table. Mr. Heller, okay. what, excuse I'll, me. I'll one, on one more quick point on the on the traffic. Sorry. Um, if you recall back in 2011 with the Holly Hill transfer station, one of the conditions of that. Um, of, of that decision was that, that the town explores safety issues as described in the traffic report and beta group's comments associated with the widening of Muskrat Pond Road. The commission feels the best approach is to not widen the road until monitoring, monitoring can be done in this area to see if the projections actually ne necessitate this improvement. So if there's now going to be added movement on that road, that should be part of your analysis. Exactly. Okay. Excellent. You mean the, the analysis of whether the road should be improved? Uh, well, that may have. I think you should talk to Amy Siebert, the Commissioner of Public Works, and, and alert her to this. And we'll have the traffic have consultant the talk. That's good, Katie. Okay. Any comments from the public? How do we get him to lay out? Okay, uh, Mr. Heller, Before we, uh, the, the, um, just want to put my ARC hat on again one more time. Um, just a su suggestion to the applicant. Uh, because you've got people, or you want people to park in specific areas. Yes. Uh, as part of your uh, presentation, if you can put together maybe a comprehensive signage and directional plan uh, for their review. Yeah, we're going to supplement what we have already. Yes, this. because you want to make sure everybody sure we, gets to the sure garage. We don't have any problems. Be. Just that's the I, we agree. Proposal is done. Let, let, yeah. Okay. Mr. Tessie, we agree with that. When you do the traffic analysis, there was another thing that we keep trying to figure out on the use on the medical use. Mm -hmm. is if you could make sure that we get sort of how many patients per day each medical professional is generally anticipated to see because it just to give us a sense for the volume of traffic because it doesn't change the parking demand but it would ch necessarily but it would what it changes is the flow. Well, that's going to be good, and that's good part of the, your whole point of your traffic analysis, because you need to you want the projections of the flow during the day. That, yeah. That but that you're not looking for a peak is, hour. Yeah. Okay. Because it's not just when they see them; it's how long they see them and how they exactly. flow out. Exactly. So I have to rely on the traffic professional to anything do that. Else? Making sure we get. You're not approving it tonight, are you? No. So no. Okay. We'll close this, okay? We'll keep no, it you're not closing. You're leaving it open. Open, open, open. Open, open, okay. open, open. We're finished now. No, uh, oh, I think we're, we're finished gonna, now. Yeah, we got to keep the public hearing open, though, because we you, you had said it when we when we finished with Neighbor to Neighbor earlier that you were going to be discussing it further as to what to do with it. So that's still part of the public hearing process. So the public okay. hearing has to then stay Then let's open. do that now okay. and save the discussion item for later because mm -hmm. we've got a lot of people waiting. Yeah. So uh, for the... For the public now, we're going to dis we're going. We're going to discuss neighbor to neighbor. And I think the question is whether you wanted to close the application or whether you wanted to have the applicant extend. They well, said let's have they, it. Let's have a discussion they they now. Give the extension. Uh, uh, I'll open up with the discussion because I heard from some of my uh, colleagues here that w one of the things we failed to do when we were discussing this is that is that some one mentioned I don't know which of my colleagues mentioned it to if you turn the building around 
sideways, you might be able, as an architectural problem, to solve the main problem of distance because you'd eliminate that back parking lot. I think that's the way, did you, am I, you want to reword it or say it any other way? I don't know who came up with the thought. Um, Mr. Levy. Go ahead, Peter. Um, uh, not it taking into consideration other issues on the site, if, you, if, if the orientation of the parking was changed because the building orientation has changed, so that it's, it's um, uh, accessed from, uh, uh, what is it, from the east side? Yeah. It's uh, so it's access, a accessed from the east side and the parking is on that east side, then you would limit the amount of space that you'd need on the south side. Is that clear? Do you, Andy, you, with, you heard that. Did you want to add anything to that? I think that we heard loud and clear that the neighbors um, still feel a strong impact, and I think whatever the applicant can do to widen that space between uh, the rear property line and the building would be great. And especially if you could move the parking from between the building and the property line and distribute it further towards Putnam Avenue. And so um, it might not be an efficient building but um, it would act as a, a better buffer to the neighbors. Um, one Margarita. of the things uh, on that suggestion you made, Peter, is um, we were kind of looking at it. We need to, to consider that there, there could be loss of some major trees. That was one of the issues with, because we were playing with it before if we moved the parking, if the parking got yeah. moved out of the back into in between the two buildings and then you would lose those big trees and that and and that was one of the trade-offs and maybe they wouldn't have to do that but I think we'd have to if we were going to ask for that we'd have to caution that we how we felt about the well there, you have to lose some trees anyway so yeah, maybe so these are change. incremental loss though maybe yeah. and they might be yeah. so that would be uh, rich do you want to say anything about that no okay. <coughs> um, I I think that the um, oh, I can't hear you. third time. Sorry. Um, I think that the um, special permit uh, section, um, the 94 that was raised um, in opposition, has to be looked at before we close on this. I think we need to yes. examine that carefully and understand uh, whether this is um, the applicant is a charity. The applicant is not a church, so I think um, that that 100-foot um, setback requirement may very well apply. I think we need to get to the bottom of that before we um, move forward. And I think uh, one of the most striking things I heard tonight was, um, um, <coughs> pardon me, one of the residents in the, um, I don't know which of the uh, co-ops, but uh, the neighbor, um, an analogize this building to a various food places you can buy food. Um, and it comes in, um, if she's correct, um, above a great many grocery stores. And it um, makes you stop and think about uh, the necessity of that in relation to its impact on those neighbors. And whether this building um, might not um, be more proportionate in size if it was smaller. And I understand that there are things um, like a conference room, there are things that are there. Um, they are not a core piece of what they do. But um, I guess I would encourage the applicant to see if they can't shrink uh, the visual of this building uh, for the neighbors. It's, it is very close. Yeah, and the, the size itself. The, the size itself, exactly. And um, 
given uh, the population being served by this uh, charity and the very large number of people who live right behind this building, um, you've got two very important groups, and we need to look out for both of them. So that's good. Nick, you want to say anything? I, I agree with Nancy. I think this, that, that uh, Section 694, the B, and I think it starts out with hospitals, it defines uh, what can happen here. Um, and I think that issue needs to be resol resolved first <coughs> because in one way, as the applicant's proposing it, we're okay and everything fits. If we get a, a different interpretation and it's not the primary use, then that 100-foot setback is gonna take this whole design and completely change it. Um, and what we have in front of us is, is, is a moot point, but uh, I think that's the first and paramount thing that really should be uh, addressed immediately. Um, I think you could do a couple of different ideas with the design moving the buildings around, um, regardless of the trees and trying to save that, but uh, understanding you have a um, uh, you know front of house area where you have your clients, if you would come to the front door, but you have deliveries to the back door, and understanding how that works, you really need to separate those and still keep one on one side and one on the other. Um, uh, rotating the building could do a lot of d different things, but still it's, it's that separation front and back. Um, but uh, I, I really think that uh, that 694 issue has to be resolved first. I think the matter of the 100 foot setback, I, I, I don't think that we should lose, uh, I mean we do have the ability to make a finding that that's not required. We do, but I okay, well, just it has a yes. significant if the test of but, that but, is a but significant let's just I understand that. I understand. Yep. But if you if you if you take the apartment houses in the in the uh, Putnam Park, those are the most affected because of that property line. The property line to the east, while there is the the superintendent's building there, that's it. It's a cemetery and a large open space on Putnam Hill. 120 feet, I think, to the nearest building on Putnam Hill. I think that would be an incorrect measurement. Unless you, if you, if you discount the, uh, the superintendent's house, which is, is right up against the property line, the first occupied building, depending on where you want to measure it from, but it's quite a ways away because we know that this dimension from here to here is 90 feet. So if you take 90 feet, uh, I mean, the building right now is, is pretty close to that lot line. It's 91 feet. So that's pretty close to 100, and I think you could make a finding in that area. I think the most objectionable thing back here is not necessarily the 100-foot setback. It's, I think it's the, in, it, the parking, parking, which is in that area. Okay. To the east, I, I, my feeling would be that we could make a finding that the 100 foot would not disrupt the, uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, adjacent neighbors because that's. But they've, 20 people testified that, or 40 people, that, and, and a significant number of letters, that it is disturbing to them and it will impact. Yes, but they have. The, the <laughs> They're disturbed whether the building's uh, uh, 100 feet away or 150 feet away. They're disturbed by the size of the building. There's two things. The drainage, I think, will work its way out one way or the other. We, we have engineers and professionals dealing with that, so that will work its way out. Right. The other, there, there were two things left over. One, I believe, my analysis of it was the parking in the, in the, uh, in the southern part and the size of the building. That's it. I agree. I agree. The, the hundred foot. I, d I don't think we should get hung up on that because it, if it is discretionary, and if they could, if they come back and make a, a reasonable uh, uh, presentation, I think it's something that that we could consider. It's within our purview to consider it. So I don't think it. Because if you start the hundred, I mean, then you're making uh, you're just reorienting lot lines and setbacks without that discretion. Of, so that's. My only I think, Richard, I, but I think well, those two well, things are the things that are, are causing the problems. If anybody else disagrees with what the two things are causing the problems, that's fine. Do you see but this? Uh, I think sorry. that is the charge. And I think if they could solve those two things, I think I believe from what I've heard tonight and read, 
that would solve most of the problems of the uh, of the neighbors. And do you see I this think. as a special exception use or not? You know, the, it, it, can, can the, I just this, speak to that quickly? Because yes. I, I, um, I did find the um, Tom's Higgins house uh, oh, decision letter. They've always been special exceptions. Yeah. Sorry? They've always been special exceptions. Right, and and they they had an approval from the Zoning Board of Appeals, but the proposed use there in both buildings was for four residences for staff of Christ Church, and then three parlor rooms will be used by Christ Church for its own meetings and church-sponsored sponsor, functions only. Point being that those two buildings have specifically stated church functions in them, whereas I'm not sure I heard that in this application. So I, I just mentioned that as no, but it clearly is a the church is sponsoring this, and and the, the fact that they're allowing this to be built on their property but seems to me that they they are. I mean, they said it to us this evening. But to Andy's point, they're leasing it to them, right? Isn't well, they may be, that? but you, oh, I thought you said that. Sorry. Well, it, it, it may be something that they could address, and they could they could give. But their, they could address their whether it is it. But I just, the I only, church use or right. not. I mean, I just I do bring it up also because they they have filed their zoning board of appeals application right. as an amendment to this original yes. approval. Yes, so that is a special exception. Right. It, well, if if that's I think that's what you need to decide when they provide more information to you. In, uh, well, uh, go ahead. I think we might. Uh, I mean, I think we really need to understand this better. This is probably not something that comes up often, but um, it, you know, it, it seems very. The applicant here is a charity, not a church. Um, the functions it's going to have are a charitable function, not a church function. There's no suggestion that this is a church function, and. Um, I think, the, uh, Katie, the information you just gave us that um, the Tomes property is, you know, those buildings are, uh, were applied for as a church use, um, and this is not. Um, and can you put these two uses on the same lot? Query. I, I, I think we need to actually probably get some legal advice on that. Well, and, uh, and the other thing is that we do have in town, there's precedent, and Christ Church has it as well because of the nursery school. I don't think that's part of the church. And several other religious institutions do have other activities. Um, and it would probably be very good for us to know how we have acted on those and how we have viewed the uses, whether they're accessory or principal. Well, I think this, uh, there's so much involvement that I, I, I'm trying to reach for for a direction and a more simple solution. It seems to me that if you got, let's use the 100 foot as a, an example. I think the two comments that Dick made, one is uh, let's say 100 feet and let's say a a a, 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 a redesigned building, redesigned in the sense that it frees up parking, because that's how you get to the 110 feet, uh, and whatever size building it becomes, uh, I think it it's good directional and solves the problem. One of the things I regretted is we had an architect here today, I forgot his name. <coughs> he's, um, Granoff. he's with the, um, and we, not, we never got, never thought of it until later about simply, uh, you know, figuring out how to, re how to redesign so that you free up parking area in the back, which gives you 100 feet. That seems to me, uh, I wouldn't, if I got to the 100 feet, I don't have to worry about church versus charity and, uh, and or, or what's inside the building. Uh, it, it takes a, what could be complicated in simple form, and that's the direction I would recommend that we give them. But I think the suggestion to um, consider making the building smaller could also help resolve some of this, and uh, not trying to pack too much into the building. Okay. That would help and, and relieve the parking problem in the yes. back, too. Exactly. Um, they are scheduled to go before ZBA before our next meeting, right? 
or after the day after our next well, meeting. Well, I think we, I think that needs to be put on hold until this right. until this. Uh, well, can, yeah. sorted can out. we agree? Can we agree on those two principles to give them direction? I think I am. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, definitely. Okay. The applicant's giving an extension, and so that's the decision. We keep it open. Okay, that's the direction. Thank you. You guys can go, but we can't go. <laughs> we got another case. Well, Mr. Chair, this this next one's actually a little funny, also because it's it's listed as a discussion item, but I've asked the the court reporter to continue with the transcript because the as you know we have a pending preliminary site plan and special permit and as you so eloquently explained in the beginning of the evening a preliminary doesn't have legal standing but nonetheless we do have a pending application so the reason that we're reviewing this as a discussion item was there was confusion at the end of the last meeting about exactly what direction we had given the applicant which is why i had asked to have this discussion with the commission about how to proceed so that's Very that's good. why we have it in this now this we're, fashion. we're finished with you now no i um, you I, Mr. Heller, I, I asked him to continue with the transcript just so that we can put it onto the record since it, it does have the special Fine, permit. Fine, hallelujah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's do uh, 88 South Water Street. <laughs> Is this the same one that we had the other day? I added just a little. No, you have that one plus just a couple extras that you asked. What? Well, okay. Uh, what I think makes sense is for me just to introduce Mr. Ridberg, take you through what um, he just handed out. I know you had some discussion at your your briefing session. The purpose of, of this discussion, if you will, is to uh, okay. follow on to what you wanted us to look at at the uh, at your last meeting regarding uh, an alternative to the plan we submitted. So with that, uh, Rudy, why don't you take over? For the record, Rudy Ridberg, um, what I've handed out tonight is just a little addendum to the one that we issued yesterday. Um, and it basically was a reference to balconies, uh, just a few minor things in that we've added the balconies in. Um, and um, we've added a, um, uh, I've given you a letter that I, or an email I sent to Katie that broke down some of the FAR. I'm not sure if that was passed along, so I included that highlighted in yellow. So if you look at the cover, the small cover sheet there, uh, the email, um, we basically have gone from the 24 uh, unit, uh, 26 units from before to 20, uh, six being in the existing building, and then the, uh, the new building we're calling it is a 14 unit of which there would be 10 um, two bedrooms and four three bedroom units seven per floor total units um, five two bedrooms and two uh, three bedrooms on each floor so the uh, original application had an FAR of 43,317 uh, I did finally get a set of, uh, of the documents of the drawings of the original application back in 05 uh, against an allowable of 45,185. That's what was on the architect's drawings. I don't have a copy of the final P&Z approval at that time, but for, for intents and purposes, we should use those numbers. So if you look at what we've proposed in this building, um, is that uh, the ground floor, being that we would maintain it at 50% open minimum, probably it'll be more than that, uh, I included the, the lobby stairs, so if you go to 2.0 in either, or I think in maybe the first packet, you know, I'll just open up on this, on this large drawing as well. You didn't give us 2.0. Oh, well, you want us to find things? So there's a large drawing here. You should have had that. You should have this set uh, from yesterday. The emails that I, PDFs that I sent out. Uh, so in the ground floor, so in the ground floor, uh, at the front of the building, we would have uh, the the dual entrance. We would have recycling and garbage, and we would have some service rooms. I don't know what they are just yet, but there would, we've allowed for some service rooms and the stairs. So we've included this entire area as FAR. 
From here back, which is tenant parking, other than lobby, these are basically open walls, even though it doesn't read that way, but there'll be open walls two-sided. So that we didn't count any FAR. We did count the lobby, the stairs, the, the uh, elevator, and a small elevator machine room. May not need the machine room if we go machine room less, but we, can, we included it anyway. And then in the back, we included this uh, area back here for the, um, ut for the uh, 14 tenant um, uh, storage units. So we've included that FAR in the first floor. That we had to have the machine Pardon room me? in the flood zone. Pardon me? We had to have the machine room in the flood no. zone. No. <clears throat> The machine room, the, the flood, we're at that elevation 12, so we would oh, raise any machine that we would have would be up high enough. The elevator, unfortunately, will flood, but it's allowed to flood. Any, any equipment, electrical, mechanical, will be above the, the base flood by one foot. So the first floor then was 4602. When you go to the, each of the units on the, on the first and second floor above that are the same. Third, a three bedroom, a three bedroom, and then five two bedroom units. Plus, we have shown a common area. Don't know what it is yet. Could be meeting rooms, it could be uh, exercise rooms, so on and so forth. So, we've included all that, and we have an elevator and three stairs into this building. And that floor area worked out to be 12,614. And then the same number on the second floor, it's an identical layout, which I added to you today. You can see here we've added our, our balconies. That was part of the a little drawing we just gave you. And then on the second floor, the only real difference is on, the, on there we would, add, um, we would add skylights into the hallway to give us light. This will probably be mostly glass anyway to bring daylight in. We, wanna, we don't want to just have a hotel hallway that's uh, uh, dark. And then the other drawing we gave you tonight was the, uh, a rooftop plan. So if you add those areas together, you'll get an FAR of about 30,325. So you're uh, a third less than what was approved originally. I don't know. I do not see any volume calculation for the existing building. Let I know me just that. Let me ask you a question. Yeah, what sure. you said was approved earlier. The that was for the whole 20. Units. That was for no, no. When I say that was for the original application, yes, the original application. All 20 units. All, for all three buildings. Okay. Yes. So you're you're telling us now this this new building is going to be approximately 29,600. 30,325. 30, okay, 30,000. Yeah, 30,000. So 30,000. What's in the existing buildings? In the ex when you say the existing. Uh, those like six units. Oh, in the six units? Yeah. Um, well, the total was 45, so I would say a third of that, so about 15,000. No, because the, two of the buildings had seven. The, seven, the two six buildings units. that got eliminated had the 14 units, so that, those two buildings were bigger than that building. And, and that eliminated. So I, I think it was something like fifteen thousand, something, something in that in that area. So well, it may if be. If you're you know, saying the total was well, let's try to do it quickly. You said the total was how much? Forty. They said it was forty-three thousand three one seven. Divided by twenty. Divided by twenty is twenty-one hundred a piece. 20, so you're saying it'd be twelve thousand maybe. Well, so say we're under. We're under. The, we're under. I know when we checked it, we're under what they had before. Okay. Um, so we, you know, the limit was 45. I know that we're. Well, the you limit's know. 45. You divide it by 20. That's uh, tw yeah. 2,300. So it's 2,200 and yeah. change. So, okay. 2,250. So 2,300. Then take the 2,300 times six. Six. Right. So you end up with like 16, 15, 14 something. So I'm saying if you add it to our number, we're we should still, still under. be under the FAR. Correct. Permitted or that was in in the um, settlement. I don't know. I don't know the settlement off the top of my head. Maybe Mr. Tessie or Mr. Bristol. Probably it would be the that. 43 317. If, if it said the existing application for 205 was project was 43 317. Yeah, my I, as guess I say, would be that's probably what the settlement. Yeah. If that's if that's what the settlement number is, then we'll live with that number. As I said, we can adjust this. This is you know a fairly quick decision to come back with a 14 unit plan in two yeah. weeks. So we've come up I with know. something. I feel very comfortable that we can make work. Um, All right. And then I also added in the area on the rooftop. So on the rooftop we did, we included the area of the stairs and the an elevator going up. We don't need three stairs off the rooftop. So we just show this again diag diagrammatically at the level we're at. We do want to have some solar up there, which I think we discussed in our previous application or in the earlier meetings. And then a roof deck area that would be inboard from the perimeter walls. I think, was that ever uh, enacted, the, uh, no. Katie, the thing? Well, okay, <laughs> we'd be your first guinea pig then. So we would, we would, be good we would bring some things in to have. Uh, no uh, music. Huh? No music? 
Oh, I didn't hear about that. That was in there? Okay. One other thing that we talked about is providing a pedestrian access along the south property line. Okay. Got a problem with that? I need to have the owner answer that. They're asking about south property, uh, an additional, is it access to the south to the public? So you create a U-shaped pedestrian access. In other words, the, the north access is there, the access along the water is there, mm -hmm. and now close it. And yeah. bring it down. Yeah. Because the access to the north is really not very nice because you're walking against the, the building of the Hasco. Okay. And I know we've got it, but it would be nicer if it came off the south too and then people could walk. I don't know. You want me to address that? Well, I'm asking him, but you're the yeah. owner, I guess. Yeah, the so. Right. So. Um. And I think it would First be off, like an eight the foot Haskell wide. building is not going to stay up forever. Well, then so, it'll be nicer. And that, well, and it will be much nicer entrance. Part of the problem with this site is that it's being remediated. The piece on the south, there's, it's not very good. Uh, there was a lot of cribbing in there. You know what that is? When they took yeah. what was river and they made it land. So it's not particularly a good spot, we don't believe, for any kind of compaction, driving piles of building a building there. So I don't want a building, I just want a sidewalk. Walkway. Yeah, but walkway's gotta rest on something and has to have well, certain. If you're gonna, I, I can't believe so, that you So let me, just, let me just cut yeah. to the chase. We, Make it we gravel. talked about, what's that? Make it gravel. Can't. Of course you can. No, you can't. Uh, I, I don't wanna argue with you guys, it's late. You guys have been here for a really right. long time. <clears throat> This property is subject to what Connecticut DEP says I can put there, yep. and it's not gravel. It's got to be a impervious surface, so it's totally encapsulated. Gravel doesn't do that. I see. But we keep coming back to. But what are you putting? I'm, well, let me just let's find out. What what are you putting there now? Is it going to be grass? Uh, it's going to be graded, yeah. It's grass. Mm -hmm. That's not going to have access. So we first, I think, uh, Deep is strongly interested, um, as I recall, in having the public access to these waterfront properties. Also, historically, uh, Mr. Tessie, you know this, um, Mr. Crawl uh, at his water club has a U-shaped um, access, and what it means is that a person can walk down there and across and back the ups and continue on a walk and have a waterfront experience. Um, and that's, it's. Well, actually, I, 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 for, for the river, for the. Uh, boat club, water club. For the boat club, mm -hmm. the, the access is on the south side and you go through another, but on its marina property, mm -hmm. it doesn't have a U shape. But then it connects to another property well, it sort of does because you've got that and walkway then, coming in from the north. Yeah, it's a no, walkway. No, you walkway, you come in from the north, and then when you get, go to the south, you go past the marina property to the office building. And I think then those office buildings, and then it comes out. So it's this continuum, which was the whole spirit of things, to create the continuum. The problem you had was in that salt when we were talking about, well, what's now, whatever that club is called that took over the, the Peters property. Um, you can't get there, be, you couldn't connect those two because it had small well, office it, building. No, we couldn't connect those two, but we do have that access that along the north property line. Oh, absolutely, yeah. But I'm saying there's no access on the, on the marina property on the south side. There's a continuum to the office, uh, through the office building. I mean, I guess, uh, Mr. Tessier, the, through the, no, through, through the office buildings. listening to us, we want a walkway down both sides. That's what we would like to see. So well, maybe you'd like to discuss that some more with your client. Well, I, I think my client has issue, issues with a, that, so we'll have to look at it. Okay. Uh, but overall, it, as he explained, that, that, that is an issue for him. But a, so, a minute ago, I thought this site was remediated. No, the site, that's completely, well, you know, the site's, re, where, where is he? Right here. Yeah, the, the site, uh, it's, site has had some remediation. Oh, sorry, I have to come here. Yeah, because we have this on the record. I know it's The site has had some remediation, but what completes the remediation is when the building is built and encapsulates the site. 
So the foundation is a big part of what DEP is looking for when they, in fact, um, sign off on this project. That's a, a big part of and it. And you're but, but, saying, but I, okay, go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm just saying what I don't understand is that if you're, if you're permitted to have walk, uh, grass out there where people can walk around and, and be on it, why would no. you be no, permitted? No, he said no access. No. That's There's what no I was access. about to ask. <coughs> There's no access. So they're oh. capping what I hadn't understood before, because we asked this the first time it came before us. We asked about the remediation, and we were just told it was being remediated. But you're saying that what's being required is that you're going to cap that area to the south, and there will be no human access to it. You're going to completely close it off? That's correct. That's the way it's, it's planned for right now. <clears throat> this whole part of the site is all fully remediated and encapsulated. There is but walkway, pavement, or concrete. Okay. But to the south. Right. There'll be something very similar. Oh, well, okay. Is it going to be similar that people can walk on it or similar that down similar to the south? Similar in that it'll have an encapsulation underneath it. Oh, so people will be able to use the lawn. That's what we're, okay, no, all the way over. No. You're going to not fully remediate that, that area. No, no, no. It will be remediated, but it's not some place where um, people will be gathering or should be gathering. So you're going to not let people walk on that lawn area at all? I mean, I don't see how I can really do that if you live there, but it's not something that we would or that we would like to see the public have access to. We don't Some want security. to, I mean, you can certainly put in a So a if we're going to change how this was approved, okay, yeah. and I'm doing the 20 units now, so why can't we go back to the 26 units if I'm going to put in an access way that wasn't part of the original plan? Because we're changing the original plan from two units and townhouses to a single unit that's a single building that's got multiple floors in it, right. elevators and so forth. That's a change. Okay. What we're asking. So if you we to went do, back to the three buildings, it's up to you. Mm. It's your it's your project. You can do that, and um, it's fine. I mean, I, I would say that there there. But I can you tell you the other the other the other well, project it didn't have a walkway out there, but it was certainly assumed that people would have access out there. No, they would. The other. Plan, you're, to, you're talking about the general. No, that wasn't. Right. Perfect. You're talking about the general public have access along that south side? Yes. That, that was never part of the previous. No, it right? wasn't part of the, I understand that, but we are now in a, in a situation I, I, where, you, where we are, we are seeing if, if we can modify this agreement. I, we, are, right? we, we appreciate so that on the one hand. If you want to go back to the original one, then the original one had people coming out of, just like those six units have patios and everything on the outside. Right. Flip it over. The, the unit along the south had mm -hmm. the same thing, right? Private patios. Yeah, yeah. They but what's the difference with a private patio, patio or, or a, a public patio? You know, I, I guess I, I don't. I, maybe, maybe I don't see the difference. I mean, Tessie, I don't see the difference. But that's chat about this further. I'm not sure we're making headway now. I think we're butting up against heads, and it, it, it's probably not going to be a productive result all the way around in terms of this project. I think we're making very nice headway on this project, and we ought to leave it there. Just let you discuss that with we, 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 we will discuss it. Thank you. The only point I wanted to make was that it probably was a subject of discussion. I wasn't part of it at the time. Use the, the microphone, would you? said it was probably a part of the discussion at the time of the settlement. But I also had always understood that the whole goal there, the whole Byron plan, was to have a, a continuum of that walkway at some point over the years along the water. And the idea of providing interim connections, such as the one we're providing on the north, was seen as more than adequate. It seems to me that uh, you have an applicant coming in no neighborhood opposition uh, with a plan that lessens materially the floor area being built and the bulk on the site being built. And he's being asked in exchange for coming up with a better plan and being uh, in units that are more fitting for the community to go an even f further extra mile in terms of not building. 
and, and also give more public um, public use of this the site, which does have a factor, at least in my opinion, uh, in detracting from the the overall and basically environment or living environment for the residents. So, I, you know, I, to me. There are times when you're you, you, you're negotiating because you're getting something. I don't see where we're getting getting anything out of this other than a better plan for the community. That said, that uh, speech me, that is something, isn't it? That's what we're giving the community. This is the WB zone, right? Right. Right. And this is the waterfront zone, and, right. and the, the, the marina is a waterfront use. Correct. And the boardwalk is a part of the Byron plan. Correct. And the we Byron plan, with all of that. if you look at the Byron plan, it sought access from from uh, South Water Street in a number of places. As, as I just said that. Uh, I said that two minutes ago. I agree with that. And we are providing it. Just what I said, at different locations, you would be providing access. This site now, it, it, what you're turning around and saying to us, we want you to have two points of access within whatever it is, about 300, 400 feet on your site, when we have other sites that could provide that during the years, and you got a situation where it's a win-win for everyone, but there's a little bit of an extra pound of flesh being being sought here uh, in a context, as I said earlier, where he's giving a lot, and it's not an easy site to develop because of the environmental issues. So you'd like to have it. We would like You'd to. like to have a plan. We would like to have a plan that's doable in all senses. Um, he just has to determine whether or not that's an issue that you're really standing on as a deal breaker and whether or not that warrants just going back to the original plan, which I don't think anybody wins with, but he'll have to make the decision. It's his business decision. Uh, Mr. Tessie, <clears throat> yesterday we talked about um, whether and whether or not it was um, a better idea to have that building back further from the street or, uh, or have the, direct, the angle of it uh, match the side, you know, the streetscape. We're just thinking streetscape, and um, I, don't, I don't know if Mr. Ridberg really? was aware of that, but just, you know, your we, pros and cons of that, if you. That's really more of a Rudy's discipline. I know he's looked at it, and we also looked at the existing uh, plan in terms of where those buildings the, the were. The other buildings further back, that's kind of what we were. Well, uh, it, if you, you could rotate the building, you'll gain maybe five feet. If you take this dimension here and you rotate the building parallel to this, you'd pick up about five feet. I think, I, I think maybe Katie may have sent that email to me, so I checked it. Okay. That's about what you would gain. Um, what, what's nice about this is that we do have an opportunity to be able to put the um, uh, balconies on these units here where the living area is inside here. If we turn the sideways, we'll be over our setbacks. Same thing over here. I'm able to get my balcony within the setback. If I turn it, yeah. I have five feet. I don't really have a balcony. We're looking at a consideration of actually taking this building and, and maybe sliding this six or eight feet this wing. Um, and, and I really haven't gone in any great detail to this with the owner yet, but one consideration was to take this wing from the end of this, this our, this is our two bedroom and our uh, our, our um, great room, let's call it, slide this wing back, which takes everything here back and kicks this back, allows us to, to keep this in here. It helps break up the facade, which we're working on, as I say now, with whether we do some brick and whether we do some uh, siding yeah. and we do a mix. Yeah. So we're, we're gonna work through that. I, I, don't feel com I don't feel strongly about going the other way. I kinda like where it's at. If you look at the aerial, yeah. um, I don't know if there's any real benefit. Right now you have about a, today in, in the previous application you had two 56 foot wide buildings, 112 feet. We're at 71 right now. So we have a much narrower width of building if we now turn it. And then again, it depends where are you standing to take these view corridors. I, I, it, you know. it is, but I, I think what we should be looking for is to maximize the view corridors. If you get the yeah. maximum with it the way it is now, I I, I don't it, think you get you it. Turn it. I don't know if you get it the other way, honestly. Well, because again, it's depending on where you're standing. Of course. If you take this and you could see where the building is now, right now it, it, we're going parallel to these buildings. If we turn this and go this way, well, we're blocking it here. Yes, you're opening it here, but you're only going to still see this from this point. Yeah. I, I, I kind of like the fact that the building 
actually pulls away from the entrance. To me, the, the building parallel to the street actually feels more on the street than it does at an angle. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my personal opinion. And, and to um, move it back in the sense of um, uh, reducing the um, uh, waterfront distance to less than the 30 feet, um, uh, what, what's your reaction to that? I mean, these I mean, if we, don't, if we didn't have the setback, I'm sorry, yeah. if, yeah. You, if you were able to let us push this over the setback? Yeah. If you want more, I mean, or the other thing is maybe we want you to move it back from the 10 foot. That's the question. It doesn't look quite right. How, what's your setback drawn? It doesn't, it looks like more than 10 feet in the front. Um, is it more than 10 feet in the WB zone? I, I think I'd have to look at it again to see what it is. Let me just, let me just grab this one drawing there that I think that, let's see where it is. It should be up here. We come on. I think it must be more than 10 feet. As I said, I think earlier on the previous drawing, there's what you there's what you originally well, approved. Well, no, the, I think the new drawing gives us more of a view corridor. I think it's, I think it's good. This 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 point of the building here is actually further forward than where it was before. Okay, so this this is 15 feet. I think 15. That's what you're saying. Okay, so that's 15 feet. Okay. So what we were just trying to say is that if we jog this building here a little bit, it just breaks up this facade a little bit, and we're 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 further back from what the water was from where we were before. So, again, and and I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the floor plans, but I think the floor plans work very comfortably. The room sizes are good. Uh, the mix of two and three bedrooms seems to fit this neighborhood better. This is Byron. It's got kids. One bedrooms really don't work here, in our opinion. So we could take a look at it and, and, and study that scheme as turning it and see what helps. It kind of, it, it, it works with the circulation possibly differently. You'd end up keeping maybe the parking at this angle because you want to for simplicity. Well, and then you end up with that. a little bit more of, a, of, a, <laughs> yeah. of an area for green area there. But you'll, you'll lose it over here. So... We have some work to do, but I think what I think where I was trying to go here is that I think we've got a, a nice 14-unit plan, yes. and I think if we can work the architecture to, to soften it a little bit, uh, we utilize the roofs, okay, for a, for access for Positive. solar. Uh, whether we put some goats up there with some green grass, I don't Positive. know. We'll see where that goes. Um, <laughs> um, Mr. Mr. Rudy, you're right. That idea of splitting the spine and, and shifting it, I think you're you're going to set up. A, I think a, a massing that's going to be hard to uh, to clad in the brick that you're being proposed. I think actually, the People's Bank in in uh, Costco, yeah. uh, yep. I think is very very well done. And yeah. those no, deep, that Cheryl in my office already discussed that with us, saying that's that was a, when we did that building. That was a nice way to have it not all brick. And and we've already looked at a couple right, of the, options. The here. detailing in there, and I think actually yeah. the detailing on this you know, uh, rise to that level would be great because yeah. then you really get some kind of sense of, uh, of character on the building. Yeah, we, uh, we've, already, we've already started looking into it. Um, in, in, in reference to the, to the, the view corridors, I, um, to me it's, it's about the streetscape and that relationship and the ratio between the height of the building and its relationship to the sidewalk and the street. We talk about a view corridor. I'm just wondering what's what's the view? The parking lot across the, the water? But that makes you know, and who sees who sees that view and how does that work? So light and air. But the light and air, I think we still get it. Even if you do turn it. Uh, you know, the light, oh, light I think and air is gonna be there. So I, I wanted to use an analogy which probably isn't doesn't sound very appropriate, but it's late we can probably say nobody's really listening. This these two buildings here, you're you're thirty feet opposite the building. I mean this is Go on US-1 right next to an American Cyanamid. I don't know who the architect was, and I'm not trying to be overly critical, but you're just staring 30 feet opposite another person. Now we have an open view, one oh, yeah. building. And that's why I've, I've been pushing this one building idea, because these weren't just far enough apart to really create anything. Yeah, you're going to have some works. shadow on the I'll give you. I'll give you the one building. I understand that. And so actually, I think, you I think that more works. On both sides. And I think, I think bec when we originally started the Hammerhead, we didn't... We, we didn't have a, 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 as a big a program. We didn't start with 26 units. It kind of grew into 26. So we were sketching as we came through, but knowing what our delineation points were with setback. So I think where we're at is, is, a, is a good sized building. The FAR will be pretty close to what was there, but I think the proportions would be better. Plus we also are not building two other buildings on these 10 foot uh, plinths that are dirt. 10 feet in the air, and then having a two and a half story building. I think, I think my elevations that we showed here, you know, you, you can see here. There's there's your delineation of what those patios and walls were, and then your building sat on top. So, I, I think it's just.
pretty evident with the red what where, what we have there. And I, I think, think we can, I think you're preaching to the choir. That, that elevation, we, I think, I, is actually what I'm trying to say. Uniform, two churches it, here, a church and a synagogue tonight. So now we're preaching to the choir. You can flip that choir. back up again real quick. That's, that's what I'm talking about in terms of the, the think, size of that right. front elevation on the street. You can see the, the Haskell building, um, and it's, it's basically right on the street at that height. And now we get to the elevation of the building here. It's going to be on the street, but slightly higher. Yep. I think it's going to have a looming factor on the street itself, and if it could be pushed back well, I think, somehow, well, I think we can get look it off at that, that and so. see if we can get some relief. But you know, in, in the same vein, when we did talk to John Goucher, was out there. He was ref referencing that we still want to maintain a presence for the public to enjoy, but not having a looming building, and and being back. And then that's where we were planning on putting some softness and landscaping at the back. Plus, we we have the storage units there, which don't need to be open. So you wouldn't be there would be a private you know, separation there between the public and the and the private. So I think we can look at that. And I think if we introduce some some softer materials together, we'll we'll, we'll get it. Okay. I think if okay. The Which, are, are, we are we all set, guys? Are we all set? Timing wise, is there is there an issue with we have to keep something open? Well, I'm just when is the next meeting? It's February 23rd, but we need stuff by the 9th. The ninth next Tuesday. Yeah, might be a bit tough. I can start in about twenty but, minutes. Yeah, we, I just we need can to get we'll, a cup we'll, of chat, we'll chat tomorrow. Yeah. No. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Are we all set? I think so. Are we all set? Thank you, Rudy. Hey guys. Oh. Uh, guys. You scared me. We have we have one close tonight. Dear Park. No, you don't want him. They, get out, get out there, Park. We're closed. Oh, yeah, you're you're done. <laughs> yeah, you can go home. We're closed for business. Let's right. let's. Okay. Do you want to do the Greenwich Deer uh, burning tree? Yeah, let's get that done quick. We have to do a burning tree decision. We we left it. Good we left party. it open for a decision from ZBA. Yeah. Okay. Where's burning okay. tree? Keep going. Oh that yeah. One. Okay. We promised that who's, we voted tonight. Who's on burning? Is everybody voting on burning tree here? Uh, me. <laughs> Mr. Macri is, is seated for Mr. Nick, Heller. Vote on this. Burning tree. It's for the bubble. Yeah. Okay. I would move the approval of the final site plan and special permit for burning tree. Second. Up, doop, 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 doop. <laughs> with, with a few conditions. Number one, obviously, to meet the uh, ZBA conditions of uh, ceasing the operations at um, 10 p.m. Number two, the ZEO had wanted an overall, more of an overall site plan showing the um, where these tennis courts are in relationship to uh, property lines. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Fox, you're seated on this. Yes. Thank you. Um, the um, the mechanical equipment shall be tested after it's been installed just to make sure that we don't have any noise problems at the property line. And the uh, material for the bubble, we had talked about that, and it's, it's, it is a material which wasn't the color we had hoped for, but because you bought it on a fire sale or something. Um, that, I guess we accept that, uh, but uh, it, it is, uh, there's no light leakage, it is totally... Um, zero, totally opaque, zero light yes, transmission. Yes, opaque, that's the word I want. Opaque, zero light transmission was what they said, and it's white. That's it. No, no it's not white. It is white, it's your cream or something, but it's not the darker. Yeah. I, I, I wrote it down. I, I was listening to you. That's my motion. If somebody um, wants to second it. Second. Plan. Second. All in favor say and, um, aye. Aye. And the storage okay. of the dome. Somebody wanted details no, what of we, the storage. No, we got to do. Uh, I think you. they said they would find it, so I didn't get it into the motion. So. I got, we we got to do. Uh, okay. All right. Levy. Levy seconded it. No, I think Nick, Nick did. Nick seconded it. Nick seconded it. Deer Park. All right, I'm listening, okay? De Deer Park. I would move <coughs> the approval of the um, final site plan and special permit with the following uh, conditions. Number one, all staff and departmental comments to be met. Secondly, the sewer easements shall have a width of 10 feet and the difference between the 30-foot uh, 
and the 10 foot is the 10 foot shall, the 20 foot difference shall be a no build zone on the west side of the property that will preserve and maintain the existing stone walls and the existing tree roots as much as possible and where the tree roots are in the, um, uh, in the excavated area for the uh, uh, pipe, those that are there, the, the uh, uh, air, spading. air spading shall be used to um, uh, preserve the trees. I'm sorry, I'm it confused. You, you said it was you said it was a 10 foot easement, but then why? A 10 foot it? sewer easement, but the, on the drawing now it shows a 30 foot easement. Yeah, it does. Right. So we're going to split it into a 10 foot sewer easement. Okay. Five feet either side of the center line of the sewer, and the remaining 20 feet will be left as a no build zone to preserve the four trees. Uh, on the uh, and I don't know the the the, the, the west. Whether they are on this property or just on the owner's or the adjacent property owner's property, okay. but there are those four trees to be preserved. Okay. Now, if those when those trees die down the road, does that does that vacate that easement? When the trees die down the road, f ten no. years, fifty no. years. No, because years. The, the easement on that one is still protecting the stone wall. Okay. So so it's in perpetuity. Yeah. So it's well, not just yeah. for the four trees. It's, it's no because the stone wall has got to be preserved. Okay. Now they they said that the stone wall then. Uh, was acknowledged that it might need some repair work, but that's it. There's but no okay. replacement. No replacement. So, so the no build area is for no build, but the the land no. area underneath can be used for FAR Planting. purposes. Oh yeah. Okay. Because oh, yeah. Yeah, this I'm is an for easement. The, for the record. Okay. Yeah. But the sewer can't be built. No planting on top. But that 20 feet from the edge of the sewer easement to the property line can be planted. Further landscaping. Yeah. 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 And then on the south side, they have shown a 20 foot easement on their plan, reduce the easement to 10 feet and leaving the other 20 feet for planting. The other 10, 10. 10 feet. Yeah. Yeah, 10 feet. <laughs> I'm making it more. But anyway, he also identified on the planting plan there were three or four trees. Two on the western side that had been committed No, which, which he, oh, no, I'm no, sorry, no, Richard. No, 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 no. Let me, the, 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 bear with me a second. Okay, I, I got to get to the landscape plan. There were these three trees right down here at the, along the southern property line at the east property line, where it hits whatever that road is. Woodside. Woodside, Those yeah. three trees. Those three trees were identified by the association as, as must preserve. And there are four trees along here that are a must preserve. And, and the rest of them, obviously, they show them being preserved, but then the rest of the landscape and plan. And these two that they omitted on the previous landscaping plan that they put on, and those are on the western side. I know, but I, those the, are the four trees on the western right. side. And the yeah. no build that's on the southern side, is that also in perpetuity? Yes. yes. So it's, so it's, it's, it's not just about the trees. it's line there. Okay, so that one also is because of a wall? In addition well, there's to the no trees. wall. That's why I'm asking because once well, these, these trees, trees die, die yes. 20 years, 100 years They're down the road, somebody else's property. Okay, so you want you want it there for the screening, yes. and right now there is screening, and but they're on somebody else's property, so right. we can't maintain. Well, how could we ever maintain any tree in perpetuity? Right. Well, that's why Thank I'm asking God. because Lord knows someone's you know the the trees will be gone, and someone will say, well, geez, do I still need the easement? So I'm 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 well, covering. Would, yes, because we, covering yes. for future planners. Yeah, yeah. we we'll still need the easement. Yeah, I'll find okay, uh, good. Because I don't know any other way to do it if we put the. If they do come in. <laughs> right. No, I, I I'm with you. I okay. just want to make it's it clear. Kind of yeah. Um, no man's land anyway, because you can raise the land. So okay. Right. So right. it's on. better if. It just is declared as a landscaping buffer right. easement. Got it. Yep. Got okay. it. That's a good way to put it. It's a, lands it's a landscaping buffer. Good enough. Yeah. And well, uh, landscaping and stone wall preservation. Landscaping south, stone wall of the, the landscaping. Uh, now, I, w I think it would want to go on the record that the, uh, the sewer location is acceptable to the, uh, to the whatever. To the association. Well, yeah, I'll get to that in a second. But I, want, I wanted to get the uh, Feminella is is accepting of this location of the sewer as shown on by, by D'Andrea. Mm -hmm. uh, now we get to the um, matter of the um, uh, the owner will provide a yearly inspection of the sewer line. Yearly? He agreed to yearly. Okay. The association will take care of the uh, the south leg of the sewer. And, and access it from um, Woodside. 
Woodside. Woodside. So the association will take care of that one down to the um, manhole. The owner will take care of it from the manhole up to... Um, On the western side. Along the western side. Along the western side. And will be, and will assume financial responsibility should any jetting of that sewer line be necessary. On the side, on the yeah. No, I, I think, I, I'm sorry, I, my note says the association will take care of the south line. Correct. Right. So they would be cleaning the south line. But the owner assumes, finance, the applicant assumes yeah. financial responsibility for any jetting on the western side. Oh, yeah. No, that's, that's what, I thought that's what I said. But. No, you hadn't said it yet. Okay. Um, all right. Um, <laughs> That's all I got. Adequate tree protection, narrow the easement, the air spade. Um, yeah. Do we, do you think we should require that an arborist be on the site for the air spading of these trees and things or not? I, I mean, just to make. I think that's a great idea. Damn good idea. Okay. Yeah. Let's, do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Considering the Let's put, yeah. not only that, but there's quite a lot of interest in those trees. So let's right. just make sure that we get that. I don't have anything else. That's my motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion to adjourn. Oh. We don't do that. We just okay. walk out in, in, a, <laughs> in a daze. <laughs> I've never seen it. Only one vote, the only one uh, closing. Amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing what you can get done with two people if you say, "Well, we'll bring it back later on," or yeah. something like that. Yeah. We didn't want to. Yeah. <laughs>